Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, a corpse to fit every pocketbook. Rick? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Uh, let me sit down. Oh. Rick, what's the matter? <sighs> you sounded like your arch is just broke. You got the right idea, baby. Oh, but your geography is cockeyed. Are you really hurt, Rick? Oh, believe it or not, I was trampled by a herd of horses. Oh, Rick, you idiot. Now, tell me what did happen. Okay, one horse. He ruined me for life. You went horseback riding? Oh, I don't believe it. Yeah, I want to see my bull legs. You actually did. Uh-oh. Took a girl to get you to ride a horse. But it was some slinky blonde. No, baby, it was a Palomino. And look, let's get off horses. I- I've had enough to last me. What's with the early call? Early? Rick, did you just get in? It's after 11. I was dreaming of you, baby. You wouldn't have wanted me to stop just to get into the office. It's probably a whole harem. Uh, Helen, you got to stop that peeking. You read the morning papers? They come out in the morning? Now, you stop that. Did you read them? Well, didn't have a bet down. Why? You on the society page again? Oh, oh, much more exciting than that. The police commissioner's house was robbed of $50,000 worth of diamonds last night, and his gardener was murdered. What? I thought that would fetch you. Better get a paper. The commissioner's statement's written in blood. Yeah. And if things don't wind up fast, tomorrow's statement will be in Walt Levinson's blood. It'll be his case. Now, you stay out of it, Rick. This thief cuts throats. Oh, yeah, I'm scared. Are you, Rick? Well, I'll come over tonight and I'll frighten you at close range. Say eight. I'll practice my knee knocking so I'll be in good form. And stay in. No nightclubs. At the sound of the castanets, Francis can open the door. It'll be me and my knees. See you tonight, baby. Bye. Is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Just like it says on the door. Come in and close it gently. My Japanese beetle's still asleep. Asleep? He's got a better union. Sit down, Mr... Uh, Burton, Phineas Burton. Uh, what can I do for you, Mr. Burton? Well, I want to hire you if it's agreeable. Well, for a hundred a day in expenses, I'm pretty agreeable. Well, that's fine. I have a package I want you to deliver to a party in Philadelphia. Hmm. You can get a messenger for five bucks, or if you're hard up, a carrier pigeon for a handful of popcorn. Why a detective? Well, I'm perfectly capable of judging for myself what I need, Mr. Diamond. Now, here's $300. There will be 200 more for you after you make safe delivery of the package. Why? Why? Three-letter word meaning why you want to pay me for five days when the trip to Philly and back can be done in a few hours. Well, Mr. Diamond, I simply want you to drop everything else and take this job immediately. And that is my reason for the added payment. Oh, all right, I'll take your money. Just as soon as you tell me what's in the package, who it goes to, and why it's so important that I take it personally. Uh, well, I, I can't tell you that. Okay, it's your problem. Now, where did I leave my soap chips? Uh, do you have to know? Of course. How can I do any washing without soap? I mean about this package. Oh, no, no. I can recommend another agency who will do it for 25 bucks and no questions. Oh, very well. A Mr. Elliott will meet you at the Philadelphia Station Information Desk at 2 o'clock today. Oh. I will wire him your description and he will make the contact. As for the package, it contains some very valuable papers, which Mr. Elliott is afraid his wife will try to intercept. I see. Uh, he commissioned me to find the best man I could to bring the package to him. Oh, you must have read my ad. You'll have to leave immediately. Mr. Elliott is very anxious to get the package. Now, you call me at the Astor when you return and I'll send over the rest of the money. Uh, good day. It may be at that. What? Forget it. <laughs> Burton left the package on my desk with the money. He was a thin guy, had a funny pot that made him look as if he'd swallowed a basketball. He pushed it out the door and waddled after it. When a guy insists on throwing money in my lap, I get suspicious. And when I remembered the robbery of the night before, I got that lousy feeling again. Now, paragraph four, section B, rule A of the detective's code of ethics says, quote... Upon receiving money to deliver package, detective must never open same. It is unethical. Yeah, who's ethical? Well, surprise. No wonder basketball had been nervous. At the bottom of the box were five pretty little diamonds. About ten grand worth of a guess. Of course, it may have been that Burton thought diamonds should belong to diamond, but my bet was on a frame-up. A frame that cost the real heisters ten grand out of fifty. But was aimed to get him a nice picture to fit the frame. Me. Yeah? Is this Mr. Diamond? Oh, hello, Burton. Something on your mind? Oh, I happened to be in a store across the street and I noticed you hadn't left yet. 
Uh, you will leave right away, won't you? Just as soon as I arrange things, Phineas. Well, remember, it takes an hour and a half to get to Philadelphia. I, I don't want you to be late. I'll bet you don't. Well, it was just to make sure uh, you understand. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I understand. You can dribble your basketball home now. I beg your pardon, Skipper. Bye. <laughs> Burden's call ended nearly all doubts. I was being framed all right, and the trap required my leaving for Penn Station right away. I dropped the diamonds into what was left of a quart of milk I had for lunch the day before, put the bottle on the floor by the wastebasket. Then I took the package, rewrapped it, and went out to hail a cab. I made one stop at a toy shop, and then headed for Penn Station. As I entered, I saw a pair of familiar figures. Rick! Okay, what's the gag? I got the tip, but even you wouldn't joke about this case. Now, Walt, I might joke about mass murder, but never about the commissioner being robbed. Is he making speeches yet? Yeah, that's okay, Shamus. This is one time when you're one diamond too many. Why, Otis, you're becoming a wit. Eh, why not? You're halfway there. Oh, Lieutenant, he's picking on me again. You deserve it, Otis. Now, shut up. Rick, I know the tip was phony, but the commissioner was there when it came in. I had to act on it. Tip? Well, don't be smug. I've got one, too. Fifth at Hialeah. Now, don't start that. It was a tip that you were taking the commissioner's diamonds out of town. Oh, now, Walt. And don't, oh, now, Walt me. I said I knew the tip was phony, but with the commissioner taking scouts all down the line, I didn't want No, 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 no. Don't apologize, Walt. I know. Come on, Sergeant. Show me a good frisk, and I'll recommend you to all my criminal friends. Yeah. Yeah, he's clean, Lieutenant. Now, Rick, let's see that package, and then you can go. This? Oh, no, no, I can't. It's secret. Don't play games, Rick, please. Oh, all right, but it's going to spoil my surprise. Well, okay. Give me your word it's got nothing to do with this case, and I won't bother to open it. No, 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 I'm hurt. I absolutely insist that you open the package right now. But, Rick, you know I trust Lieutenant you. Lieutenant Levinson, do your duty. My purity must not be suspicioned. Oh, anything to get this over with. You were, uh, hmm... What? It's only a pair of dolls. Uh, you were expecting maybe my gallstones? Oh, dolls. <laughs> the Shamus place with dolls. <laughs> Better read the tag, Gordis, before your ears get any longer and they draft you for a mule team. Tag? Sure. But what? The, to my beloved Otis from his Ricky. Oh. Rick. Now, don't be a grouch, Walt. The other one's for you. For me? Oh, no. I'm sorry, Walt. I couldn't resist it. Anyhow, you spoiled my surprise to Otis. It was our anniversary. What? Our anniversary? We ain't even related. Oh, you don't remember? Oh, Otis. Well, Tennant, can I go back to traffic? I can't stand much more. Oh, shut up, Otis. Rick, if we weren't such good friends, I'd... I'd... Walt, hey, now you're upset. Upset? Why should I be upset? Just because two hoods lift 50 grand in ice from the commissioner? Or because it's dumped in my lap with the murder of the gardener? Or that I'm given 24 hours to break the case and then get a tip that leads me to a friend who decides to play games and wreck my side to be on repair? Now, why should I be upset? Oh, this uh, Here you are, Lieutenant. But take it easy. That's a second bottle of bike cob today. Walt, you rate an apology and I make it. I'll do better than that. I'll help you if you'll let me. Well, I can sure use your help, Rick. I haven't got a single lead. You want to look at the corpse first? May as well. Has he got a record? No. And the commissioner swears he was honest. Probably stumbled onto the thieves and they had to put him away. How about the rest of the servants? They were all out. The commissioner and his wife were at a party. They'd given the entire staff the night off. But I guess perhaps the gardener returned a little early. Yeah. Well, let's go down and take a look at him. I've got a personal interest that makes me want to crack this case. Uh, client? Call him an ex-client. I'll explain him later. Come on. <laughs> Rick. Ah, nasty cut. How was it made? Well, it could have been a sharp knife, but it's a safer bet that it was a razor. Mm. Remind me not to go to his barber. What safe cracker's got enough nerve to pull his job, Walt? Well, I got three guys that could fit the job, but not one of them has ever been known to carry a weapon of any sort, much less a razor. Correction. One dealer, that gardener's playing a lousy joke on us. I suppose this could have been the first time one of them carried a razor. I don't buy that, neither do you. Give me the names. I want to talk to them. Maybe I can get a lead of some sort. Sure. Here they are. And please, Rick, call me if you get anything. If I can find the nickel. Bye. (laughs) 
As far as I could see, I had three things to match up. One, the careless barber. Two, the safe cracker with nerve enough to rob the police commissioner. And three, the reason why I was picked as the pigeon. I gave up the idea of hunting for Burton, the guy who came into my office. He was probably a flunky and not worth running down. So I checked the names I got from Walt, grabbed a cab, and headed for the Bronx. The first turned out to be an ex-con trying to go straight by working in a Bronx hash house. The second was likely, but he'd kissed his wife with a beer bottle and spent last night in jail. At the third address, down in Greenwich Village, I met a landlady with gin-loaded tonsils and a cute mustache. She tipped me that my third prospect, Vincent Mayer, might be playing pinochle at Pietro's, which turned out to be a cafe with a 30-foot bar, three tables, and a back room. Hey, uh, barkeep. Yeah, what'd it be, Freddy? Milk, no chaser. Milk? Who makes it? Oh, you mean like from cows, never carried the stuff. Where can I find Vince Mayer? Why don't you ask me, handsome? Wow, well, hello, baby. Now, do I look like a baby? Uh, no. My name's Jean. What do they call you? Take your pick. Call me Rick. Hey, you dog funny. But you're awful nice. Too nice to be hunting for Vince Mayer. He's a bad boy, Rick. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to be a hero. Where is he? In the back room. There. The guy with the light hair. But be careful. Thanks, baby. I'll buy you a palace. Uh, you can think of me for 80 mil, Joe, 20 clubs, 20 spades, and 40 pinochle. What? No diamonds? Hey. Uh, well, 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 look who's here. What do you want, Shamus? Vince the Iceman, isn't it? Well, now, let's see. Sing Sing, class of 38. Where's your school tie, Vince? The name is Mr. Mayor to you, Diamond, and privates are not welcome here. It's a closed game. Yeah, Move on. Give me a reason. You want to play dead? Oh, come on, Vance. You're not going to get upset just because I think you robbed the commissioner? You did, didn't you? I told my story to the cops. I'll bet. But you didn't answer my question. And here's another. Who's your barber? You're asking for it, Diamond. I was brought up right. Now, let's get off this cat and mouse kick. I want some answers, Vince. Do you? That's right, Junior. I do. All right. Call him, Joe. Hey, hey what? what? Oh. 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 All right, Joe. Stop it. Stop it. That's enough, Joe. All right, now drag him out in the alley. Uh, Vince, uh, can I, uh... Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe it'll teach him not to get so nosy. But keep that razor in your pocket. I will, honest. This is gonna be real fun. Come on, Shamus. Here's where I do some road work on your liver. <laughs> Here, Mr. Diamond. I only wish my brother could see you. When I came to, I was curled up around a round metal object I couldn't see, and I felt as if I was smothered in a mountain of cotton, and getting out of it was like trying to shovel sand with a pitchfork. I finally managed to move and wished I hadn't, for a company of Bengal lancers began target practice on my side. So I quit trying and lay still for a long moment. Then a voice came fizzing through the cotton at me. Hey. Hey, mister, are you alive? Not if I'm not. You're an angel, and this is a harp. Well, I'm sure no angel. And that's the garbage can. So I guess you're not dead. Matter for debate, Jeannie. Oh, help me up, will you? Sure. Here. <sighs> can, can you stand? Practically anything after this. Ooh. Hey, you hurt pretty bad. Come on, lean on me. My place isn't far. I'll take you there so you can lie down. Best offer I've had today. Lead on, Angel. There. Now, how do you feel? Uh, I never use language like that in front of a lady. Oh, I'm no lady. I'm a waitress at Pietro's. I heard the noise in the back room. When you didn't come out, I took a look. Ooh. Gee, does your head hurt, baby? Like all my relatives are inside digging for gold. With luck, I can open my eyes and they won't fall out. You know, we might have had a lot of fun together if you weren't all banged up like this. I'll take that remark up with you later, honey. I'm not usually the kind of guy who runs out on pretty girls, but I only wanted to get my hands on the gun if who tried to kick my brains out. So I took Jean's number, filed it under, uh, uh, for later investigation, and stumbled out into the street. My head was clearing, but it was as slow about it as a dummy doing a strip tease. 
Maybe that's why I didn't notice when I came out of the house that I had two guys for company. Hello, Diamond. Huh? Huh? When Pietro told me Jane had run out, I thought I might find you here. She always goes for guys like you. Well, she has taste. But I'm glad you came around. I have a few things I want to discuss with you and Joe here. Uh, hold it, Chamas. Or I'll show you how easy it is to get rid of your troubles. Now, now, that's a pretty little gun. Aren't you stepping out of character, Vince? You're supposed to be a smart one. You're getting on my nerves. Yeah? Well, put the gun away and I'll quiet you down a little. You want me to mess him up again, Vince? And what's with you? Come to do your job over again? I may at that. Yeah? Well, you got 32 teeth, Sonny. Want to try for none? Why, you... I got some questions I'd still like to have answered. Why was I picked as pigeon? Why me? You're getting a little too smart, Diamond. Now, listen. I know you got wise to Burton, so it figures that you still got the package. Now, I got no reasons to give you $10,000 worth of diamonds. I want them back. Oh, dandy. I've got big news for you, Buster. You're not going to get them. Don't make any mistakes, Diamond. I'll use this gun if I have to. Ah, go eat a tombstone, Joe. Yeah, how's your stomach ache? Oh. Wait a minute, Joe. Oh. Now, Diamond, look, you can have a choice. You bring the rocks to me at Pietro's in an hour and we'll forget the whole thing. Or don't. And I'll send Joe with a few friends to call on you. And for the last time... <laughs> For a few sick minutes, I leaned against the wall, wondering if I wanted to live. One thing I was certain of was that Vince Mayer was never going to get those diamonds back. Or was he? An idea began to percolate in my head to the tune of an old rhyme about a goose and a gander. And I got inspired enough to sit up and forget my aching ribs. When it simmered into a full-scale boil, I grabbed a cab, went back to my office, and got the diamonds out of the milk bottle where I'd hidden them. Then I headed for the village fast. I was soon banging on a door there like a drummer playing Bob. So I owe you money. Hold your horses. Well, if it ain't my cripple. I got the bruises to prove it. Come on in. Are you really recovered? What? Oh, no, not that much, Angel. Then? I need some answers. What do you know about Vince and Joe? Not too much. Enough to dislike him plenty. That Vince got me canned for leaving Pietro's to take care of you. That's why I'm back home. I know he's a smoothie, and he, I think he's a big-time jewel thief. Now that much I know. How about Joe, the dog-faced boy? Ah, uh, him, he's just a punk. I, I think his real name is Fancy or, uh, Fanchetti. Franchetti or some such thing. Franchetti? Yeah. I don't know why, but they call him Joe the Barber. Oh, Joe the Barber. Yeah. Isn't that silly? Mm. If he cuts hair, he doesn't. But I'll lay eight to one. This guy works on throats. Thanks, Angel. You've tied up my three points. What are you talking about? Your friend Vince Mayer lifted 50 grand in ice from the police commissioner last night, and his accomplice, Joe, gave the gardener a shave. You, you mean murder? On the button. The gardener's throat was sliced from life to death. And now, baby, look. How would you like to earn $100? Sure. Is it legal? Well, uh, no. I'll take it. <laughs> Now, where is he? Will you tell me where's Rick? I know where I'd like him to be. I'm worried, Otis. Seriously. Rick is in this thing up to his ears. You mean he was in on that job? Don't be stupid, Otis. Of course not. Rick's no crook. But he's mixed up in this case some way, and I'm worried. He should have called me by now. Gee. Hope he hasn't tangled with that razor guy. I thought you hated Rick. Oh, you know I was just talking. I know, I know. What a mess. Rick in danger and I can't find him. The commissioner's spouting lava all over the city hall. Why the devil did it have to be the commissioner's house? You know, it's kind of funny at that. The commissioner himself. <laughs> you knucklehead. Uh, For two cents, I'd... Maybe that's him. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick. Rick, I was... Where the devil have you been? Taking care of some arrangements. Arrangements? Never mind, just listen. I was picked as a pigeon and some of those diamonds were planted on me this morning. What? I've traced your hoods. They're Vince Mayer and Joe the Barber Franchetti. Now, you come to Pietro's in half an hour, and you'll catch him with a pile of the diamonds on him. Rick, what is this? Well, Vince had it figured as a double barrel gag, Walt. First on the cops by raiding the commissioner's house. Second, by dumping a few of the rocks in my lap and tipping the police so I'd take the rap. But why you, Rick? Well, Joe's name, Franchetti. You remember, I sent his brother Tony to Sing Sing a few years back. Oh. I knew he had a brother, but until now, Joe stayed out of Manhattan. I get it. Okay, what's the play? Well, I'm... I'm going to take the package back to Vince. Give it to him in Pietro's. 
The girlfriend will be raising so much fuss and no one will notice me. Then as Vince and Joe leave, you nail him with the diamonds. And no alibi for having him. Right. You said uh, half an hour? In front of Pietro's. <laughs> Take a peek, Angel, through the window. There's my party at the back table. Now, you know what to do. Yeah. I keep yelling until you get back to me. Right? There's rain. I'll make it a good one. I got good lungs. Let's go in. Okay, over to the bar. Lock, Rich. There he is now, Joe. I told you he'd show up. Hello, Diamond. You got something for me? That's right, Vince. Okay, let's have it. Hey, I didn't do nothing. Hey, what's going on over there? Stop, stupid dame. Yeah, do you want the package or not? Oh, yeah, give it to me. Come on, Joe. Let's scram out of here before that dame brings her cops. Yeah. Sure. That's an easy way of getting back the ten grand, ain't it, Vince? Shut up, come on. Take it easy now. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're okay now. Let's split up. Hold it, Vince. What? Let's have a look at the package. The uh, cops! Levinson, what are you doing? The here? package, Vince. Hey, what are we gonna do? Shut up. You, uh, got a warrant, of course. Of course. Otis, take the package. Yeah, Lieutenant. <laughs> you can't arrest me. I don't even know what's in that package. It was given to me by a friend. Now, don't use the term so loosely, Vince. Why, Walt, what are you doing here? Hello, Rick. I've captured a criminal. No. Yes, and he was carrying a package of his loot. Why, I bet it's part of that diamond robbery. Hey, what is all this? Diamond, you just planted that package on me. Me? Why, stranger, you're telling a fib. You just know that's downright immoral to something. Uh, this is ridiculous. Lieutenant, he gave me those diamonds and Pietro's not five minutes ago. I didn't lift them from the commissioner. Didn't you, Vince? Why, then I must have made a mistake. You can prove your story, of course. Sure I can. Bartender saw Diamond slipping the package. Oh, now, Vance, you think that bartender was going to be watching you when a lovely girl is practically tearing up the joint? Boss, the dame yelling. She was a plant. Yeah, but this is a frame-up. Diamond, you can't get away with this. Please, don't talk to me. I never associate with common criminals. A frame? You dirty double-crossing copper. Look out, Rick. He's got a razor. Mm. Oh, my arm. Now, don't cry, Joe. This is for you. Oh. Oh. Wow. What a punch you got, Shamus. Well, that does it. Come on, Vince. Otis, load that killer into the car and pick up that razor. Yellow to. Want a lift, Rick? Yeah, no thanks, Walt. I'm going to go home freshen up. Yeah, you look like you could use it. left Walt and headed for my apartment where I grabbed a stomach full of vitamins and flattered myself under the hot shower. It felt so good I fell asleep. And if Walt hadn't phoned, I'd have probably become the only man in history to drown in the shower. Walt shocked me wide awake with the news that he was holding a thousand dollar reward for me. I gave him my nicest thank you and made a mental note to drop by and give half of it to Jean to make up for her losing her job. Around about 8 o'clock, after I'd taken care of dividing the reward, I steered for 975 Park Avenue, made it with no trouble, and rang the bell to Helen's apartment. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Miss Asher's expecting you, sir. She's in the library. Thank you, Francis. Uh, how's your health? Oh, my, my health, sir. It's very good, thank you. Well, now, this may come as a shock, but, uh... Francis, uh, about the money I owe you. Oh, don't fret about it, sir. It will tell. I'm going to pay you what I owe you. You're going to? Oh, dear. Oh, perhaps I better sit down. Oh, my word. Now, oh, there, there, Francis. Rick, darling, is that you? It ain't Tom Swift, baby. Come on in the library. Well, okay. But it'll do you no good, my dove. I'm a cripple, a battle-torn veteran. I don't want your muscles, Rick. I'm blue, and I want you to sing to me. Oh, Helen, baby, I don't want to sing. I want Rick, to... I'm blue. I need cheering up, not be nice and sing. Well, okay, honey. Uh, how's this, huh? I can see No matter how near you'll be You'll never belong to me but I can dream, can I? Can 
I pretend that I'm locked in the bed of your embrace? For dreams are just like wine, and I am drunk with mine. I'm aware my heart is a sad affair. There's much disillusion there. But I can dream, can't I, can't I adore you, although we are oceans apart, I can't make you open your heart, but I can dream, can't I? Still feeling blue, baby? Oh, Ricky, come here. Uh, here I am. Oh, now I'm contented. You in my arms, my bills paid off, and and my bills... Oh, for Pete's sake, I forgot Francis. Francis? What are you talking uh, about? C- come with me, I'll show you. Now, there he is. Francis, Francis, you all right? Oh, oh yes, sir. I think so, sir. Rick, will you tell me what's going on in my own home? Well, honey, I paid Francis off, and the shock of having to give back my gun and badge undid him. Oh, well, are you feeling better, Francis? Uh, not very much, Miss Asher. It's that badge and license. Will you miss him that much, Francis? Uh, well, sir, to be very honest, there's a waitress in a tea shop down the street with whom I've been, uh, if you'll pardon the expression, having a fling. Francis, uh, you? Oh, that's not the worst, Miss Asher. I'm afraid I've been a bit of a fraud with her as well. In fact, with several of the waitresses there... Now, wait, wait. Uh, Where does my badge and license enter into it? Did you hock them for crumpets? Oh, much worse, Mr. Diamond. You see, to all the waitresses of Miss Tuppingham's tea shop... I am Richard Diamond, oh. private detective. Oh, oh no. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, William Conrad, Tal Avery, and Bob Carroll. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. See the Richard Diamond picture story in the December issue of Movie Stars Parade. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen tonight to NBC for a star lineup of entertainment. Every Saturday on NBC, you can hear such stellar programs as Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, Grand Old Opry, and Songs by Morton Downey. There's always a program of interest on NBC, so keep tuned here. Shortcut to Death with Fred McMurray is next on NBC. As Richard Diamond, private detective. Diamond Detective Agency, the smiling gumshoe. Rick. Sign up for our new contest and win yourself a beautiful all chrome, pre tested, genuine electric chair. Oh, lovely. What do I have to do? Just tear off your scalp and send it along with 25 words or less why you love Richard Diamond. I can do it in two words. What are they? 
you're pretty. Oh, you win, you win. Where do you want the chair sent, madam? 975 Park Avenue, but I think I have AC current. No problem with the Jiffy Toaster chair. It works on any current AC DC. And we have it in three speeds, 45, 78, and long playing. Oh, no. Oh, Rick, that's awful. Hello, baby. Hi. What are you doing? Oh, nothing. What's with you? Oh, I just thought I'd call and find out if I'm still going to see you tonight. Yes, ma'am. We going to stay in? Well, I thought I'd have Francis fix dinner and we could sit around and listen to records or something, but if you'd rather go out, I... No, 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 baby. I think that would be lovely. And so does my bank account. Oh, broke again? Not quite. A little bent. I hope the next client I get has a big, fat trust fund. Well, don't you worry about it. I'll see you around eight. Okay. Bye, baby. Bye. Oh, uh, now, let's see. Six shirts, four pairs of socks, and... Hey, how did that get in there? Well... Okay, okay. Yeah? Well, what's the matter with you? You lost up my laundry. What are you talking about? Today isn't Tuesday. Okay, Walt, so it isn't Tuesday. Nothing's happening around this place. I felt like doing some washing. Why don't you put it away and come on down here? I'll give you something to do. What do you mean? You sound like you're surrounded by Sergeant Otis's relatives. I got a big headache. I think maybe you can help me with it. Trouble? All over the place. You don't have to, but I'd like to, well, sort of kick it around with you. Sure, sure, sure. I'll throw a few more things into soak and I'll be right down. Oh, thanks, Rick. Hey, it's really serious, isn't it? Now, what makes you say that? Look, Father, every time your ulcers hold a rally and you want me to come down and join in, you say, thanks, Rick, just like I'd laid an egg or something for you. Oh, you think you're pretty smart, don't you? Sure. If I listen to everybody who thinks I'm not, I'd wind up playing mumbly peg in a straitjacket. I'll be right over. <laughs> Well, that's the way trouble can get in the way of an otherwise quiet afternoon. Walt doesn't usually call me like that, but when he does, I know things are bound to get pretty rough. I tossed all of my shirts into soak, closed up the office. Twenty minutes later, I was walking into the squad room of the 5th Precinct Police Station. I spotted Sergeant Otis hopping around like a crapshooter on his 10th pass. Well, what's with you, Otis? Oh, don't bother me now, Shamus. I gotta get these reports into Lieutenant. Well, well, get you. What's the matter? Did you suddenly discover you were working for the police department? Uh, now, that's very funny. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, you gotta laugh. Now beat it. The Lieutenant expects you. Well, all right. But for Pete's sakes, Otis, stop acting like that and don't bust into the Lieutenant's office like that. You swear you've been doped and start an investigation. Shama, someday I ain't even going to bother to answer you. Sergeant, the day you don't open your mouth to say something stupid, the whole world will start singing. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And while I think about it, why don't you start combing your hair? What's the matter with it? Looks like a mattress after the lions got through with it. Oh. Hello, Walt. Hello, Rick. Sit down. Oh, maybe I should have worn black. Hmm? That or a propeller on my hat. First, I run into Otis, acting like he was shot out of a cannon. Then I waltz in here, and you give me that big hello like you just discovered a body in your desk. Land Jacoby is back in town. What? What? Yes. Oh, but but we got an indictment on him. Got him deported six years ago. Look, Rick, there's no mistake. One of our stoolies brought us word. Oh, but that's crazy. Jacoby knows the feds will pick him up in a second. How'd he get back in? Who knows? Florida, maybe. Last we heard, he disappeared in Italy. And about six months later, we got a report he was seen in Cuba. Oh, are you just going to take the stoolie's word for it? Uh, what else have you got? I got three bodies to date, and they're all very dead. Jacoby? It's got to be. Why? Well, the first two are the guys that turned state's evidence and helped to put Jacoby away. You remember them, Ross and Kreisel. Jacoby swear he'd get him someday. Who's the third? The stoolie who gave us the tip. Walked out of the station and... Somebody with a Thompson scattered them all over the front steps. Right in front of the station? Yeah, it'll be in the evening paper. The commissioner is very unhappy. How about the feds? Are they working on him? Up to their necks, but nobody can find out how he got in or where he might be hiding out. Oh, here's something else that makes a sure it's Jacoby. In this town, there are at least five of Jacoby's old mob. The minute this thing broke, we started to check. They've all disappeared. You think they're organizing again? Oh, Walt, come on Rick, now. I don't know what to think. That's why I wanted you to come down. You're one of the guys who worked on the Jacoby case. You remember a lot about it. Well, sure, but... Oh, now, you can't tell me Jacoby is going to try to start operating again. 
It's a one-way pass to that little green room up at Sing Sing. I know it, I know it, I know it. But you tell me. I don't know how to figure it. You can't find anybody else who's seen Jacoby. No, just the stoolie. He's going to make a swell witness. Yeah. Uh, Lieutenant. Yeah? Uh, we just got a report on the teletype. Jacoby? Uh, yeah. Florida reports the body of a man found out in the Biscayne Keys. Uh, they check and find out he was a Cuban. Uh, charter boats for fishing trips. And the immigration boys check with the authorities in Cuba, and it turns out that this dead guy took a party of two out for a trip and never now, showed wait a up again. Wait a minute. You said a party of two? Yeah, a dame and a guy. Well, what makes you think the guy with the dame was Jacoby? Because the description fitted Jacoby exactly. And the feds say that Jacoby married a dame in Italy. And the dame that got on the boat fits the wife's description. Mm-hmm. Well, Rick? That's uh, ridiculous. Okay. We now agree on two things. Leon Jacoby is back in the States, and it's ridiculous. Will you give me a hand? I need somebody who really knew Jacoby. Hey, Diamond, did you really know Jacoby? Sure, sure, Otis. We used to go out and shoot dumb police sergeants together. <laughs> oh, hey, Lieutenant, why don't he ever give me a straight answer? Because it wouldn't fit your crooked head. Now go out and dig up some more reports. Oh, okay. All right, Walt. Now let's, let's say Jacoby's going to start operating again. He's made sure of one thing. Nobody who's seen him is alive enough to testify. So? So this. I'll eight to five, Jacoby's going to make a quick haul someplace and do one more killing. You expect the killing? Uh, I expect an attempt. He's gotten two of the guys who put him away. He's just got uh, one more guy to tag. He said he'd do it himself and with a knife. That means he's got to find you. Yeah. The haul must be really important for him to risk coming into the States. He probably needs money to keep going, so he'll pull off the job and then try to get me. And he'll leave the country the same way he came in. Nobody can ever swear they saw him. Except the five guys in his mob. I think he'll kill every one of them, too. That's a lot of doing. Mm, Jacoby's a lot of killer. Now, we've got to find out where at least one of those guys is. We'll find Jacoby and try and stop the slaughter. Yeah, but you've got to watch your step, Rick. There's no telling when he's going to pull off the job and try to go to work on you. Look, I'm not happy about it. I'm really the guy who's responsible for putting Jacoby away, and I know him pretty well. He's got a vendetta, Walt. And guys like Jacoby don't figure they're their brother's keeper. The score is two out of three is one to go. He'll try his best to kill me and even it up. Well, where do you say we start? Ah, uh, I know. Oh, give me a list of the five guys you think are with Jacoby and all the information on them you got. Yeah, it is right here. All right. Put two of your best men on these three guys at the bottom of the list, and you and I will start with these two on top. Okay, but I hope we find Jacoby in time. Walt, so do I. The way he uses that knife, I'll have to have all my clothes made out of bandage. Walt assigned two of his best men to start checking on the three names at the bottom of the list, and we took off for Flatbush. Our first man was a hoodlum named George Vale, and one of his favorite hangouts was a pool hall on Church Avenue. Snooker or straight pool? We want to talk. You want to talk? Go over to the park. Get yourself a box. Oh, look, your wise cracks can only give you a hollow mouth. Show him the badge, Walt. Oh, cops. Well, well, what do you want? You know a man named George Vale? No. Nope. Let's go. Hey, wait a minute. Look, I'm not going to fool around. The answers here will be a lot easier. We know Vale comes here a lot. If you don't want to tell us about him, the boys at the station have got time to help your memory along. You can't haul me in. What's the charge? Withholding police evidence. It can get you a couple of years. Let's go. Hey, wait a minute. Okay. Okay what? Oh, wait a minute. I just want to be sure no one sees me talking to you. Okay. I don't know much. Vale ain't been in here for a couple of days. Where does he live? I don't know. I swear I don't, but I do know it's in the neighborhood. Sometimes I see him coming out of a little delicatessen across the street with a bundle of groceries. Let's go, all. Yeah. Oh, uh, thanks, sporty. It's guys like you who make the police department such a happy little group. So, good afternoon, gentlemen. You own this place? Yes, there's something wrong. Does a man named George Vale come in here much? Oh, something is wrong. I told Mama that George was a no good. Then he does come in here. We're policemen, maybe. Yes, we're policemen. Now, would you mind telling us, please, if uh, whether. Mama! Mamela, oh, she must be out and back. I want to show her. She liked this George Philly. He was always with the flat three. Now I want to show her what happens to that no good. Mamela. Uh, please, please. We haven't got much time. Oh, I'm sorry, gentlemen. You must excuse an old man. There's so little excitement. So, now what can I do for you? Do you know where George Vale lives? Sure, sure. I'm sending him over stuff lots of times. It's up two blocks, but he ain't there. How do you know that? 
because his wife, she's coming in for the last couple of days. Uh, she said he was out of town on business. He's got a wife? Sure, sure. A blunt. Uh, she's not bad looking. Well, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. So what is Bayo's exact address? Uh, here, I'll write for you on a piece of paper. What time you got, Rick? Uh, 2.30. Uh, dear our gentlemen, I hope you catch him for whatever he's done that's no good. Uh, we'll have to ask you not to mention this to anybody. Not even to Mama. Well, okay, to Mama. But you tell Mama to keep it a secret. Oh, oh, a secret. Well, maybe I'm not telling you for a couple of days yet. Come on, Walt. Are we going down to see Vale's wife? No, I got a better idea. Well, don't you think she'd know where Vale is? Maybe, but she's not going to tell us. But if we throw a scare into her, she might tell her husband something. If she knows where he is. Get Otis down here with a recording outfit. We'll wait until we see her leave the apartment and bug the place. No sense in tailing it. If Vale is with Jacoby, he wouldn't give her the address. Maybe he didn't tell her anything. Maybe he just took off. Well, that's a chance we got to take. Maybe uh, he gave her a phone number where he could be reached. On the way down to the Vale address, put in a call at the precinct. All right. KXKB to KQAR. I'm at the corner of Flatbush and Church. Have Sergeant Otis report to me on a code three and tell him to step on it. Walt finished his report. We both went over and talked with the landlady in Vale's building. She told us that Mrs. Vale was still in her room and gave us an accurate description. Also, she agreed to pull down her window shade when Mrs. Vale left the building so that there wouldn't be a chance of missing her. Then we went back to the car to wait. In about 15 minutes... Otis showed up carrying a small portable recorder. Yeah, here you are, Lieutenant. All right, get in the back seat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to wire somebody's apartment? No, I just thought it might be fun to play cops and robbers. Now relax, we might be here for quite a while. Uh, Not so long, Walt. Look, Hmm? there goes the landlady's signal. Yeah. Mrs. Bale should be... There she comes. Yeah, Otis, get set. Hmm? We got to go up there and plant a bug before she comes back. I'm set. I got four cars at the intersections just in case she's got a car. If she walks, I got four men to tailor, depending on her direction. Yeah, she's crossing the street. KXKB to KQAR. Car 79314. Stand by. Rick, you notice, get up there with a the bug. Right. Come on, Otis. Yeah. Right with you. Attention. The suspect is turning into Church Avenue, heading for New Lots. Long, five feet four, wearing checkered coat and carrying a black bag. In here, Otis. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a room. The landlady said she'd unlock it for us as soon as Mrs. Vale left the building. Bingo. Go on in. Okay, okay. Now, plant it just like you knew what you were doing, Sergeant. I'll take the box down in the basement where we can listen. Give me five minutes and then give me a quick test. Ooh, uh, how long have I got to set it up? Who knows? But don't worry about it too much. If Mrs. Vale comes in, just tell her you're, you're selling tape recorders. Oh, she won't believe that. Otis, with your face, you'll have to believe something as stupid as that. I dropped the wire out of the window and went out and down into the basement. It was a slipshod way of wiring a room, but we were in a hurry and it would have to be enough. I set it up and waited for Otis to start croaking. Okay, Diamond, I'll start counting. One, two, three, four, five... Uh, Six. Hey, I think I hear somebody coming. I'm going out the window. I'll see you in the basement. Oh, for Pete's sake. Gee, she nearly caught me. I come down the fire escape. Oh, come on in. Yeah. How's it working? All right. Listen. Hey, she ain't got a bad voice. You probably got me plugged in with Morton Downey. What are we going to do? Just sit here and listen? The lieutenant's going to give Mrs. Vale a scare, Otis. Then we're going to listen. I don't get it. Shh. That's Walt. Who's there? The police, Mrs. Vale. Huh? Oh, well, wait just a minute. Hey, it sounds pretty good, Don. Shut up, Otis. Where's your husband? I told you. Well, we're out of town. He didn't tell me. 
Okay, I'll be back with a warrant. Now we'll see if it works. Stay here and keep this thing going. I got to get back to the lieutenant. Did it work? Yeah, like a dream. She called Evergreen 33349 and talked to George. I'll check the number. You start driving north, so we'll be in the general exchange area. KXKB calling KQAR, code 600 and Evergreen 3. We headed across town while Walt put in the code to the precinct. Less time than it takes Sergeant Otis to say, oh yeah, we had our address. Well, wouldn't you know it? Another pool hall. Yeah, a guy must like the game. Hope he's in. Pretty crowded, I don't see. Oh, yeah. yeah. There he is. He sees us. He's going for the back door. Let's grab him. Right. Hey, let me go. Take your right. hands off me, Joe. You're busting my arm. Just take it easy, Vale. All we want to do is talk to you. Come on, outside. Okay, okay. Go on, Vale. In the car. Quit shoving. I'm going. Walt, I'll wait. Get out, Rick. Where did that shot come from? Got Vale in the chest. Yeah, across the street. Stay down. Yeah, look. Look, Vale, you're not going into place now. We know you're working for Jacoby, and we know he's close. The guy who just shot you is working for Jacoby, too. You're not going to cover up for a louse who just fingered you, are you? Jacoby's looking for you, too, Diamond. He's going to cut you up bad. Where's the hideout, Vale? I'm going to put in an 800 on this, Rick. I want this whole area surrounded. Come on, Vale. Where's Jacoby? All right. Fifty. Uh... Fail. No oh, swell. Repeat, code 800 from Central Park West to 10th, from 59th Street to 64th Street, KXKC, now at Pool Hall, 9th Avenue, 60th Street. Okay, Rick, what's with Vail? Yeah, nothing. Dead? Yeah. Gave me half of Jacoba's address, 455, and then made the trip. 455? Well, come on, there can't be too many 455s within walking distance. What about Vail? Yeah, I'll call him for the wagon. Go ahead, I'll... I'll start checking apartment numbers. Now, you wait a minute. You better take it easy. Jacoby would like nothing better than to have you go knocking on his front door. If I know Jacoby, Walt, he's got the radio on and he knows just what you're doing. Besides, that finger man will tell him about Vail. Somebody's got to find him before he makes a break. He's done enough killing. Well, if you do run into something, you wait for the boys. Walt. Yeah? Bye. <laughs> I took off and started checking addresses that began with 455. The first was cold turkey, nothing but a married couple who looked like they were in training for Madison Square Garden. I moved on. Somewhere in that neighborhood, Leon Jacoby was listening to his radio. Car 3, code 800, 455 to 61st Street. Car 16, 17, and 18. Shut it off, Jane. But Leon, Fifth Avenue, same what's wrong code. in this whole area? Shut it off. All right. All right. I wish the boys would get back. All right, take it easy. Take it easy. Yeah, who is it? Eddie, boss. Okay. Boss, the cops... Come in, come in, come in. Two cops picked up Bill in the pool hall. Oh, so that's what it's all about. That Bill will talk. No, he, he won't. What do you mean? Well, I waited across the street. Got Bill when he came out with the two pigs. Oh, you did, huh? <laughs> Well, well, you did me a favor, Ed. When I figured you didn't want anybody around that would might squeal, you know, fail, wife and everything. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know what else you did, Ed? What? Well, uh, no, what? When you plugged Vail, you brought the whole New York police force right down to my neck. Huh? Yeah. So, I... <laughs> I gotta return the favor. Well, what do you mean? I, I, I just didn't think. No, you didn't. Leon, come on. We gotta get out of here. Will you shut up? Hey, now, wait a minute. What's with you? I got a present for you, Ed. Huh? 
Leon. Oh. No, 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 boss. Put that knife away. Sure. No, no. Oh, Leon. Oh. Oh. oh, Leon. Oh, no. No. What's the matter with you? What did you do that for? I'm in a tough spot. I go faster alone, baby. Alone? Yeah, baby. You mean... Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You'd leave me. Look, I got no choice. You know how it is, kid. One might get through, but two, no chance. Uh, nothing to say, baby? Yeah. Go on, get out. Just like that, huh? Then what would happen to you? You might help the, kipe, uh, the cops find me, huh? Tell me, aren't you a little scared? No. Just sick. I've been sick since we got here. I wish I'd known what you were really like. I'd have laughed at you when you asked me to marry you. Oh? Well, go on, baby. Laugh now. Maybe it'll help. Well, go on. Laugh your head off. You ain't nothing funny. <laughs> You're trying not to act scared. Jacoby don't scare you none, huh? <laughs> now I laugh. You're scared plenty because you think I might kill you. Well, well, say something. Don't just stand there. You're scared. You gotta be scared. Everybody's scared of Jacoby. Yeah. You slapped Jacoby. Okay, baby. Nobody slapped Jacoby. Not you, not the cops, not anybody. Maybe you like to beg me not to kill you, huh? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go on, beg. Oh. Okay. I think about you when I'm back in forensic, baby. <laughs> I'll river there at you. Jacoby, hold it. What? Stop, Jacoby. <laughs> Jacoby had waited six years to get a crack at me, and it looked like he was going to finally get his chance. The alley was a dead end. I stopped and listened. The back of the alley was stacked with boxes, and along the sides, garbage cans. He could have been hiding anywhere along the line. I'm coming in, Jacoby. You want to give it up, or do you want to play? The block's surrounded. Okay, okay, I ain't got a gun. Come on out. All right. All right, only, only, only don't shoot, Diamond. Walk over here. Hey, you see, I ain't got a gun. I don't shoot, please. Shut up, slob, and start walking out. What you got to act like that for, huh, Diamond? Come on, Jacoby, move. So, what do you cops got against me? What'd I do, huh? Nothing, Jacoby. Not a thing. Start moving. Well, why you got to get so tough? Or maybe you're scared. Scared to death. Now, if you don't hurry up and move, I'm going to shoot you full of holes. I'm so scared. All right, Diamond, all right. I ain't got no gun, so you can push me around like that. What are you going to do to me, huh? Why, not a thing. Haven't you heard? The city went out and bought you a yacht. They like the way you kill people, so they're going to give you the yacht and send you back to Italy. Now, walk out of that alley. Okay, okay, okay. Now, you dirt. Rick, Rick. Over here, Walt, over here. He pulled his knife on you, huh? Yeah, I didn't think I'd see it. Well, you're lucky you're dead. Yeah, well, I expected it. There used to be an old saying six years ago. When Leon Jacoby wants you dead, he'll use a knife and you'll lose your head. Now, he should have remembered I keep up on slogans. <laughs> That's an awful story. Well, you wanted me to tell you about it. But it's so terrible, and you're so lucky. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. You'll certainly know better next time. Oh, I'll never make the same mistake again. Well, I should hope not. Imagine being in such a hurry you've forgotten through your socks in with all those lovely white shirts. Mm, plaid now, baby. Did the color run that much? Sweetheart, when I got back to the office, it looked like Picasso had been in my wash basin. My shirts are ruined. Well, don't you fret. 
Mommy's going to buy little old Rick a whole new batch tomorrow. Oh, no, no, no. Really, I couldn't. Uh, it's just against my principles to take anything from a woman. It is, huh? Uh, definitely. What's that song you're playing? 16 neck, 33 sleeve. What? <laughs> oh, you oh. idiot. <laughs> oh, I was bad. I dropped a real old hint. Well, I'll drop a little old hint, too. Very subtly, of course. Sing. Oh, baby, you're the subtlest. Climb aboard a butterfly and take off on the breeze. Let your worries flutter by and do the things you please. In the land where dollar bills are falling off the trees. On a dreamer's holiday. Every day for breakfast there's a dish of scrambled stars. And for luncheon, you'll be munching rainbow candy bars. You'll be living a la mode on Jupiter or Mars on a dreamer's holiday. Make it a long vacation. Time there is plenty of. You need no reservation. Just bring along the one that you love. Help yourself to happiness and sprinkle it with mirth. Close your eyes and concentrate and dream for all your worth. You will feel terrific when you get back down to earth. From a dreamer's holiday. How is that, honey? Huh? Baby, you're the craziest. What? Now, where did you pick up that expression? Oh, I get around now and then. I know a couple of musicians. Oh, I bet they all play lead kazoo. Come here. What do you want? Want to lay one on you. What? Oh. <sighs> what do you think of that, Pops? You want the honest truth? Uh huh. Mm, solid. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, David Ellis, Gene Bates, Edmund MacDonald, and Charles McGraw. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> Sunday evening means stellar listening on NBC. Tomorrow, be sure to hear the American theater's foremost acting couple, Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontan in the whimsical comedy The Great Adventure on the Theater Guild on the Air. And for another great adventure in comedy tomorrow, remember to hear the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show, Great Entertainment Sundays on NBC. Next, it's Death in the Rain with Maureen O'Hara on NBC. As Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, handy hints on homicide. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Just pick a victim. All right. Got it? Yes. Six of spades. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Helen. Hi. Am I going to see you tonight, Rick? Uh, depends on how many lights you leave on in the study. But are you coming over? Wouldn't miss it. I've been puckered up since 8 o'clock this morning. Francis has the night off. 
I'll have dinner for you in by the fire. Well, take it easy. The last time you built a fire, it got so hot I had to keep basting myself for a week. Oh, Rick. Sure. The next day I walked by Linda's and some guy grabbed me and shoved an apple in my mouth. <laughs> Said he'd get fired if I didn't climb back in the window and lie down. Oh, I'll see you tonight. Bye. Bye. Now, let's see. Where did I put the soap? Mr. Diamond? Oh, it depends on what you want him for. If it's the rent, he's being buried over in Jersey this afternoon. My name is Dr. Edward Gerson from Bellevue Hospital. I have nothing to do with the rent. Well, if you're with the Sanity Commission, Diamond's still in Jersey. It is apparent that you are behind in your rent and you wish to remain buried in Jersey for the moment. Well, it's not as bad as it sounds. Are you a potential client? I'm a psychiatrist, Mr. Oh. Uh... Well, pick a good one. How about Apple Knocker? All right. I'm in a rather peculiar position, Mr. Applenocker. Oh, I don't know. I always sit like that. <laughs> for the past four days, I've been treating a young man for an unusual type of shock. What did he do? Run his electric train in the bathtub? <laughs> You're quite an interesting case yourself. Are you always so unconcerned when someone comes to you with a problem? Look, doctor, everybody's got a problem. That's why I'm in business. If you've got a big one, you'll get by uh, my little remarks, and I'll be glad to see what I can do for you. Quite a philosophy. All right, then. Let's both get down to business, Mr... Apple knocker. Oh, now, uh, what's your trouble? This boy I mentioned, he disappeared five days ago. Hmm? You said you'd been treating him for four days. He couldn't have been gone very long. A day and a night. Hmm. He was found the next morning wandering through the Bowery. Unable to speak, unable to understand anything. I see. Someone took him to Bellevue. Luckily, the family's private physician is also on the staff at Bellevue. He saw the boy and called the family immediately. And you've been treating him ever since? Yes. Last night, the boy began to talk, make reasonable sense... Now, this would continue for perhaps a few hours, then he would lapse into a complete state of confusion. Each time he was given a sedative, and each time, as the sedative wore off, he talked for a while, knew who he was, start to tell about the missing night, and then lapse once more into this state of, well, confusion. Hmm. And you think something happened during this missing night, and he doesn't want to remember it? Correct. Did you ever study psychology? Uh, every day, Doctor. I get enough screwy cases in here to make your clientele look like a bunch of Einsteins. And now stop unlocking my mind. There's a draft. <laughs> well, as you said, this boy won't let himself remember something that happened on that missing night. He'll talk about everything up to that point, but the minute he reaches it... Uh, he jumps the tracks. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, what do you want me to do? You uh, know what I want you to do, Mr. Diamond. Okay, okay. Now, here's one that will throw you. You know what I want you to do? <laughs> the boy's family is quite willing to meet any expense that you feel is necessary. Oh, remind me not to take you on a double date. <laughs> if I don't discover what happened to this boy on the night in question, I'm afraid he might lose his mind permanently. These periods of confusion are becoming more frequent, and sooner or later, he won't be able to distinguish between the real and the unreal. I'm going to put him under narcosynthesis this evening, and I'd like you to be present. All right, Doctor. What's the boy's name? William Carter. Be at Bellevue at 8 o'clock and ask for me. The boy's family will be there also, and you can tell them about your fee. Now, uh, just give me a quick answer and leave my motives alone. Is his family wealthy? Quite. And I'll see you at 8 o'clock, Dr. Gerson. You uh, would have anyway. Goodbye, Mr. Applenocker. You know, you can feel pretty silly when a guy like that walks in and answers all your questions before you've got time to think him up. Anyway, I remembered my dinner date with Helen and put in a fast call to the little redhead. She was unhappy, naturally, but she said something about me holding the pucker and to drop around whenever I had the time. At 8 o'clock, I was standing in the long hall at the Bellevue Hospital. Dr. Murray, report to the second floor desk, please. Dr. Murray, to the second floor desk. Good evening, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, hello, Dr. Gerson. What's the matter? Dr. You look a little Hacker, nervous. Well, the hospitals bother me. That's very Dr. interesting. Hacker, the family the is at the end of the hall. Let's go down. Uh, tell me, Doctor, just what exactly happens when you put William Carter under this narcosynthesis? It's an intravenous injection. It unlocks those little doors in the back of his mind. Gets him to talk. You'll see. It's really very amazing. Uh, right here. Good evening, Doctor. Mrs. Carter. How's the boy? Uh, not much change. This is Mr. Diamond, Mr. and Mrs. Carter. How do you do? How do you do? How do, you do? Uh, Mrs. Carter, uh, Dr. Gerson wants me to find out what happened to your son the night he was missing. Have you any idea? He said he had a date. And when I asked him who it was, he wouldn't tell me. That's all we know. I think William will be able to recreate what happened for you, Mr. Diamond. Now, I'll leave you to discuss uh, 
business. And when you are through, stop at the desk. We'll show you where I am. Well, I... <laughs> well, I, I... Yes, Mr. Diamond. What is your fee? Oh, thank you. Believe me. A uh, hundred a day in expenses. And uh, your retainer? One day's work. Mr. Diamond, can you help our boy? Uh, Mrs. Carter, I, I don't really know. No, I'll write you a check. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, Mrs. Carter, uh, whatever it is that's strong enough to make your son jump his, uh, uh, lose his memory, it might you be... You think maybe it's something bad? I know it's something bad. How bad? I, I've got to find out. I hope it's not uh, more serious than I think. Oh, yes, I know. Here you are, Mr. Diamond. Oh, thanks. I'll keep in touch. <laughs> I left the Carters with that lousy feeling in my stomach. I looked at the check. Two hundred bucks. For what? Maybe a down payment on a man's sanity. Maybe not. William Carter could have done a lot of things that missing night. Maybe that two hundred bucks was going to be a mortgage on murder. I went down to the desk and an intern showed me downstairs to a small room with one desk lamp in the corner. I'm glad you didn't take too long. The patient will be down in a minute. Oh, uh, isn't this a little irregular, Doctor? I mean, uh, uh, oh, me listening in on a man's secrets? If he's done something against the law, I want you to find out whether it really happened. Well, if he tells you about it, it must have happened. He might have thought it happened. I can't take the chance. If he's committed some sort of a crime, I don't think I'll be able to do much for him. Now, I want you to sit behind that screen there and be perfectly quiet. Uh, sure. Comfortable? Oh, yes, yes. The needle can't reach this far. Uh, this uh, should be quite interesting for you, Diamond, particularly in your kind of work. Uh, you can find out about uh, anything you want with this stuff, can't you, Doctor? If it's a recent shock, why? Oh, I was just thinking about a little blonde I know. Now, here he is. Uh, Roll him right uh, over here. Uh, oh. Now, lift him over on the bed. Uh, oh. It's all right, William. Uh, Everything's going fine. Oh. All right, thank you, nurse. How do you feel, William? Uh, Can you understand me? Uh, say it again. Say it again. Can you understand me, William? Yes. Yes, yes, but keep talking. Say anything. Just, just make my mind stop jumping around. Sure. Uh, it's nice in this hospital, isn't it? Huh? It's nice in this hospital. Yeah. Oh, what's the matter with me? Just be quiet. Think about lying in a boat under the warm sun. Uh, lying in a boat. Lying in a boat. Lying in a boat. Uh huh. Just lying in the sun, rocking back and forth. What are you going to do? This won't hurt. You're going to have a nice, long sleep. Oh, yeah, please, please. I want to sleep. There. Now start counting. Do what? Do what? Tell me again. Start counting. One. One. Two. Two. You're doing fine. Keep counting. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven, eight, nine. I sat behind the screen and listened to the doctor begin. At the start, Carter seemed almost glad to talk about it. He described the beginning of the evening. He had a date. A girl named Helena on 53 East 51st Street. Did you have a good time with Helena? Wonderful time. We went dancing. Where did you He go kept dancing? talking all about the evening. Uh, they danced and drank. We went to a little the doctor dancing. kept digging, working Village. at him, Village. looking for every little detail. After you got through dancing? We went to her apartment. We uh, had some more drinks. Pretty strong ones. Who made them? What? Who made the drinks? Uh, Helena did. Uh, then he came in. Who came in? He did. Uh, the man. The man? The man just came into Helena's apartment. Who are you? Helena, who is this guy? What are you doing here, William? What are you doing? What do you want? 
Get out. Get out. I don't care who you are. I'm not going to get out, William. I don't believe it. You're not her husband. Stop it. Take your hands off her. He's hurting Helena. Yeah. I'll fix you. Helena needs help. There. You hit him. Yeah. Got to get out of here. Why do you? I got to... I got to get out. He's dead. I killed him. Well, Diamond, did you hear enough? Yeah. It's up to you. Find out if he really did it. Okay. Thank you. For what? Well, according to William Carter, he'd gone to a girl's apartment, the husband had come in, and he'd killed him. Cases like that don't make me a happy gumshoe, but I had a $200 retainer in my pocket, so I had to keep going. My first stop was the 5th Precinct Police Station and Lieutenant Walt Levinson. When I walked into the squad room, I spotted Sergeant Otis tying a square knot in his shoelace. I'll be right with you, gumshoe. Hey, Otis, what happens when you break one of those shoelaces? Oh, what do you think happens? I get a new one. For those shoes? What do you use, a mooring liner for the Queen Mary? Oh, why don't you lay off? I thought we was pals. Is the lieutenant in? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Otis, if your shoes wear out, why don't you do like the Dutch do? Oh, what's that? Wear wooden ones. Just go out and rent yourself a couple of rowboats. Oh. Hello, Walt. Good evening, Mr. Diamond, and thank you for stopping by so late. Well, now, what do you mean? You've got some horrible scheme up your sleeve, but I don't have to play straight, man. I'm off duty in exactly three minutes. It'll take two. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I want a list of DOAs for the night of November 12th. What's the matter? Can't you find a little old corpse all by your lonesome? Oh, shut up. Or does the police department have to furnish you with one? Well, if you just cooperate, sassy, you'll be out of here in two minutes. Here. Now, oh, thanks. Wow. Hmm, three of them, huh? If that's what it says, why, is the one we haven't found? Two women and a man. Yeah. The man's my department, homicide. Mm. Herbert Fisher, found in his wife's apartment on 51st Street, married to Helena Fisher. Hmm. What about Helena, Walt? We're still looking for her. Neighbors say she and her husband hadn't been living together for several months. The old boy must have come home, found her with another guy, and got heated up. Either the wife or the other guy killed him. Huh? How do you know there was another guy? Well, the neighbors say a young guy started seeing her about a week before. Came up with her that night. They haven't a line on him yet, but we're checking. What killed him? Poker from the fireplace, beaten over the head. Oh. No prints? Nope. Clean as a whistle. Say, what's with you? What are you so interested in this killing for? Oh, I just like to hear about crimes. Oh, now stop that. If you know something... I do know something, Walt. Yeah? What? One word. Will it help me solve this case? I don't know. Well, what is it? Bye. I left the precinct and headed back to Bellevue and Dr. Gerson. I had a hunch that was growing roots, and if William Carter's sanity was going to be saved, it would have to be done in a hurry. Up till now, only four people knew who was in that apartment when Fisher was killed. Myself, a missing girl named Helena, the potential killer, William Carter, and the good doctor. The girl hasn't gone to the police? Why, if William Carter did it? Well, that's what I've been asking myself all the way down here, Doctor. Unless she wants to protect him. That's the only one I could come up with. I want to ask you two questions, Doctor. First, do you think William Carter would pick up a poker and beat a man on the head? That's hard to say. He might. Would he then wipe his fingerprints off? According to what he told me, he killed the man and rushed immediately from the apartment. I'd say no to the fingerprints. Mm, That's what I'd say. He suffered the shock immediately after he killed the man. He knew he had to get out, but after that, he can't remember a thing. May I use your phone? Certainly. Doctor, how could Carter be sure that he'd killed the man? Why, I don't know. If you remember, he didn't say. He just said he'd killed him. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. I thought you were going home. I got to sit up with a headache. Oh, well, I want some information. Where did the murdered man live if he wasn't staying with his wife? Oh, now, wait a minute. We know who did it. Hmm? You do? Sure. Some guy named Carter, William Carter. I sent some of the boys over to his house ten minutes ago. How do you know he did it? Because Helena Fisher walked into the station and told us so. You got the girl? Yeah, we're holding her until we pick up the Carter guy. Seems Carter was in her apartment with her. I know the story. You do? You do? I'll be right down. Well, they've got Helena, Doctor. 
She says William Carter killed her husband. Yes, I heard. Well, I'm afraid I can't do much for him now. I think you can. There's one thing that smells too rotten to make sense. Why did William Carter take enough time to wipe off those fingerprints? Because he didn't want to be discovered. Well, if he didn't want anyone to know he did it, why didn't he kill the girl? Oh, good Lord, I never thought of that. I got an idea. And it may mean you bending the law a little, Doctor, but it might save William Carter. What do you want me to do, Mr. Diamond? Is there any way you can find out from Carter exactly what he did after he struck the man? Of course. When he comes out of his sleep, he'll be able to talk about it. Can he be moved? Well, yes, if it's necessary. Then get him out of here. Take him somewhere. Even if his family covers for him, it's just a matter of time until Lieutenant Levinson finds out he was picked up and put in here. Well, this is extremely dangerous. Look, if he believes he killed this guy, the girl's story will hold water. The only way that I can see to make him snap out of it is to prove to him that he really didn't kill anybody. That's right. Uh, don't you think he did kill that man? Uh, maybe, but I doubt it. Can he walk? Yes. Good. Take him down to my office. Here's the key. Stay there until you hear from me. You know, I, I like you, Diamond, and I respect you, but this is... You want to save the boy's life? Of course. And get him down to my office. <laughs> I left the hospital and grabbed a cab back to the 5th Precinct. Sometimes when things don't add up like ABC, you've got to go out into left field for the answer. Everything pointed to William Carter and he believed it himself. But I kept thinking about those fingerprints. I told Walt my idea. Are you crazy? So the guy did wipe off the prints but didn't kill the girl. Whatever. People do crazy things the first time they knock somebody off. Besides, you can't go around posing as a police sergeant. Oh, now stop that, Walt. Admit it. There's a hole someplace. But you told me yourself the Carter guy admits killing the girl's husband. In his condition, he'd admit anything. He says he did it. The girl says he did it. What more do you want? I don't want any doubts at all. Will you just try the idea? If you'll tell me where you've got William Carter. Promise not to have the boys there? Just you? Yes, yes. I get me. He's in my office. Wouldn't you know it? Okay, Walt. Get the girl in here and tell her just what I told you. I don't need any rehearsals. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Send Mrs. Fisher in here. Right. I hope you know what you're doing. You're putting me in an awful spot. Well, if it works, Walt, the state won't burn an innocent man. Yes, but this... Uh, Mrs. Fisher, Lieutenant. Oh, come in, Mrs. Fisher. Thank you, Lieutenant. Sit down. This is Sergeant Diamond. Oh. Uh, how do you do, Sergeant Diamond? Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Fisher? We've checked your story and everything seems to be all right. You can go home, but please don't leave town. Ah. Uh. I'm terribly sorry about this. I, I know I should have told you sooner, but William was... Well, I, I didn't know what to do. You did the right thing. Have you found William yet? No, but we will. Well, didn't you check his house? Isn't he with his family? No, he didn't come home at all. Oh, and that reminds me. You know, you're the only witness who can prove he did kill your husband. Oh, why, yes, I guess I am. Well, I'd be extremely careful. He just might, uh... Lieutenant... You don't think he might try and, and kill me, too? Well, you never know. After a man kills once and he's got time to think about it, he's liable to do anything. Well, then, I, I demand police protection. And you'll get it. Sergeant Diamond here has been assigned to the case. Oh, how nice. I'll do as much as I possibly can. Well, when do you start? Right now. I'll meet you out in the squad room right after I have a few words with the lieutenant. All right, Sergeant. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant. Perfectly all right. This is ridiculous. All right, all right. You get over to my office and pick up William Carter and the doctor. I'll stall Mrs. Fisher. Take her to a bar or something. All right. But if the commission hears about this, Sergeant Otis will be the new head of homicide. Hi, Sergeant Diamond. Do you always guard people like this? Just the pretty ones. Oh, thank you. If you really think William might try to harm me, you'll have to stick pretty close, won't you? Mm-hmm. Do you mind? Not at all. What time is it? Uh, 11.30. Getting tired? Yes, a little. It, it's been a hard day. I'll bet it has. What if William comes to my place in the middle of the night? Where will you be? Watching the front door, baby. He won't get in. Watching the door from... Inside or outside? Outside, baby. Sorry. Uh, yes, so am I. Uh, here's my apartment, Rick. Oh, nice place. 
Oh, I don't like it very much since... Look, couldn't I stay in a hotel? Oh, no. Too many ways for a killer to get in. But do you really think William might try and, and get me? What's he hiding out for? Well, he, he could be scared. All the more reason. Men like that don't hide out for a week if they're going to give themselves up. And if William isn't going to give himself up, he'll probably try to get rid of the one person who knows he did the killing. But William isn't like that. He wouldn't... Uh, wouldn't what? I was just going to say he wouldn't kill anybody. But he did. He knows he did. Yes. Well, I'm going out in front and check the building. I'll, I'll be back. Oh, do you have to go? That's a good idea. You just take it easy. But, but, but William has a key. Oh, well, then you better give me one, too. I'll be right out in front. Oh, all right, here. Uh, don't be too long, Rick. I can't stand this place long if I'm alone. Sure, baby. Here, Rick. Yeah, yeah, I spotted you when you drove up. Hello, Doctor. I hope your plan works, Diamond. Yeah. Well, uh, hello, William. He can't hear you. I put him into a deep sleep. He'll only answer my voice. There's only one way that we can get him into that apartment. Well, let's go. This is Fisher's scared stiff. William? Yes? Get out of the car. Uh, come on, Walter. You've got to be there to hear it. We solved this one. I'll never tell anyone how. Let's go. Come with me, William. Now, William, remember, you are to go up to Helena's apartment and go in. Uh, here's a key, Doctor. Do you understand, William? I am to go up to Helena's apartment and go in. Here's the key. Use the key to let yourself in. The key to let myself in. When you're in, close the door and stand in front of it. And that's all. All right, Mr. Diamond. Here we go. Of us went in through the front door and Dr. Gerson briefed William once more. Then we led him up the stairs and up to Helena Fisher's apartment. I could hear her humming as soon as William tried the key. We all ducked. Who's there? Rick? Answer me, who's there? <gasps> William! What do you want? William, what are you doing here? William, say something. Don't just stand there. Oh, you, you, you've got to get out. The police are looking for you. There's one downstairs right now. Well, say something. Stop staring. William, get away from that door. Please, William, please, please. I, I know what you want, William. I, I won't tell anyone. William, say something. Don't look at me like that. You, you're going to kill me, aren't you? Look, William, you didn't do it. I killed him. I just told you he was dead after you hit him. When you left, I killed him with a poker. William, please! All oh, right, Helena. Greg, Oh, he was going to kill me. Oh, sure. Like he killed your husband. Yes, yes. How's William, Doctor? I'll wake him up when he gets back to the hospital. He'll be all right when he reads Mrs. Fisher's confession. Rick? What's going on here? You better go along with the lieutenant, baby. Why? We heard your whole confession from outside the door. What? Why, I, I, I just said he was going to kill me. Also, we found some of your fingerprints on the poker. You're crazy. I wiped them off. <gasps> uh, she's all yours, Walt. Let's go, Mrs. Fisher. You tricked me. You tricked me into saying that. Come on, lady. I don't want to get rough. I'll kill you, too. I'll... <clears throat> I think you can take her along now, Lieutenant. <laughs> Holy cow. Why, doctor. Well, I've never hit a woman before, but this one made me very unhappy. Well, you're a good doctor, uh, doctor, but you're certainly no gentleman. You should have kicked her. Rick, mm -hmm. what kept you out so late? It's after midnight. Oh, I had to stick around and watch Otis turn into a pumpkin. Now, that's Cinderella. Yeah. Can you imagine Sergeant Otis as Cinderella? The good prince would slip his sacrum trying to haul his slipper around. <laughs> 
Tell me a fairy story, Rick. Well, once upon a time, there were two idiots. Rick. And they lived happily ever after. Sing. Don't like it? Sing. I liked it. Sing. I'll do as I please. Rick. I love those dear hearts and gentle people who live in my hometown. Because those dear hearts and gentle people will never ever let you down. They read the good book from Friday till Monday. That's how the weekend goes. I've got a dream house I'll build there one day with picket fence and rambling rows. I feel so welcome each time that I return that my happy little heart keeps laughing like a clown. I love the dear hearts and gentle people who live and love in my hometown. Well, how was that, honey? Well, Harold Applenocker. Where'd you pick up that there song? From well, my hometown, Mountain View, back up in the hills of Arkansas. Oh, well, that sure was mighty fine. Well, Lula Bell, I'm glad you liked it. Mind if I bust you up with another eight bar? Nope. Bust away. I love the dear heart and gentle people who live and love in my hometown. Da -da 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 -da. Well, well, well. Yeah, I think I did pretty fine, that air song. Oh, yes, sir. You done busted me up right proper. Oh, you ought to come over to Mountain View sometime, little Bell. Got dear hearts and gentle people all over the place. Oh, I'd like to make the trip. Oh, you'd love the people. You'd love to see them, love to greet them. How would you greet them, Lula Bell? How would you greet them? What would you say? Howdy. Oh, they love you, Lula Bell. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Joan Banks, Sam Edwards, and Norman Field. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC Sunday? There's a full evening of great entertainment in store for you tomorrow on NBC. You'll hear rib-tickling comedy on the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. And for mystery, there's Sam Spade's latest caper. Tomorrow, Sam meets a Mr. Tom Turkey... For the very best radio fare, always tune to NBC. Coming up, it's Brian Donlevy and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Evening, Francis. You look like you're going out. Yes, sir. Miss Asher wants me to go down to the delicatessen for some cold cuts. Well, where is Miss Asher? In the study, sir. Well, I'll see you later, Francis. Why don't you bring back some roll mop? Roll mop, sir? Herring with the bends. Very toothy. Uh, yes, sir. Ali, Ali, oxen free. Rick. Hi. Hi. Well, get the silk thing there. Lounging pajamas. Yeah. I guess we're going to stay in, huh? Uh-huh. I just sent Francis out for some food. I uh, met him at the door. Look, I've got to do a few things in the kitchen. Why don't you stretch out on the couch and take it easy until dinner's ready? 
Okay, I'm uh, I'm pretty tired. Might rock out. No, a little sleep might do you some good. Here, read a magazine if you want to stay awake. Hmm? Oh, swell. Gory detective. Who sends you these things? The corpse of the month? Mm-hmm. Pretty bad. I won't be long. Okay. Oh, no. The case of the bloody... Oh. Um, it was going on 11 o'clock, and the fog encircled the old house like a thin, wet blanket. Oh, swell. The figure of a man crept stealthily across the gravel of the garden path. Oh, these riders really dream it up. Psst. Hmm? Psst. Hmm? Mr. Diamond? What? How did you get in here? I followed you from your office. Shh. You left the door unlocked when you came in. Well, now, look. I know I shouldn't have come into someone else's house, but, but this is a matter of life and death. Hey, stop pulling down the blinds. I don't want anyone to see us talking. Well, you're on the eighth floor. Who's chasing you? A herd of monkeys? Please. Please, you must listen. Now, look, if you got troubles, come to my office in the morning. Tomorrow morning may be too late. I'm supposed to die tonight. Try, try breathing. You expand your chest, take a lung full of air. No, no, I... Yeah, it does wonders. Keeps you around for days. You better get out of here. Please, Mr. Diamond, don't give me away. Please. Uh, yeah, baby. Uh, wait a minute. They're ducking at that desk. Oh, bless you, Mr. Diamond. I thought I heard you talking to someone. Talking? Oh, no, no. Must have been reading out loud. This is swell literature. Mm, the case of the grizzly ghost. Oh. I like to keep up on the exploits of a private detective. You don't tell me anything about your cases. Oh, I'm modest. Hey, you got your coat on. Where are you going? Oh, Francis just called. He's had a flat tire. I'm going to pick him up in the other car. Uh, don't you want me to do it? Oh, I'm not going to let you out of this house. I'll be right back. Okay. Read the grizzly ghost. It's not bad. Bye, baby. Bye. Okay, Spider-Man, you can come out now. Oh, thank you. Now, what the devil's going on? I told you my life's in danger. I need help. Tell me about it. I haven't time now. Come to this address in about an hour. My name's Leeds. Leland L. Leeds. Oh, for Pete's sake. I must get back before they miss me. I don't want them to know I got out. Say I called you and told you to come over. Here's the address on this card. Please don't fail me, Mr. Diamond. Now, wait a minute. My fee's a hundred a day in expenses. Of course, of course. I'll have a check for you. Goodbye. He went out like an undertaker stealing a can of embalming fluid. And I poured myself something just about as strong. Helen would scalp me for leaving, but for some reason, nutty little guys like that interest me. I left Helen the note saying I'd be back later and took off to the address Leland L. Leeds had given me. It was out of town about ten miles, but after hunting around for a while and running up a good-sized taxi fare, I finally found the house. Yes? Uh, uh, yes. I, I, uh, I got a call from a Mr. Leeds at this address. He asked me to come over. My brother? I don't know. Well, it couldn't have been. He's very sick. He's upstairs sleeping. Well, he was just coasting off to Dreamland when he called me. I, uh, I think you'd better let me in. Oh, a detective. All right. Just, uh, what did my brother tell you, Mr.? Uh, Diamond. He said his life was in danger. I'm Nina Leeds. I think you'd better come into the living room, Mr. Diamond. Dr. Miller can explain things better than I can. Sure. Roger? Mm hmm? This is Mr. Diamond. He's a detective. Oh? Lee just called him. This is Dr. Miller, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Doctor. How do you do? Are you from the police? No, no. Private stuff. Oh, I see. Oh, well, Mr. Diamond, I'm afraid you made a trip for nothing. Well, here are the drinks. Uh... Oh. George, uh, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective. What? Mr. Diamond, this is George Brodeen. How are you? Well, fine, thank you. Anything wrong? I don't know. Lee phoned Mr. Diamond and told him he was in danger. How did you know that, Doctor? I told Miss Leeds what he said, but not you. I'm Mr. Leeds' doctor. He's having a nervous breakdown and suffers from an extreme persecution complex. If he called a detective, I'm sure he must have said something like that. That's quite correct, Mr. Diamond. What do you do, Mr. Brodeen? Why, I'm with the New York Museum. I'm a friend of the family. I've been watching Lee break up for the past month. Mm Mm-hmm. May I talk to your brother, Miss Lee? I don't think you can. I gave him a very strong sedative. Let me get you a drink, Mr. Diamond. When Lee wakes up, you can talk to him. Sure. We went into the bar and she got out a big bottle and two glasses. I forgot all about Leland L. Leeds for a while and started uh, concentrating on his lovely sister. It was easy. 
Champagne? Uh, sure, but I've run out of slippers. I've got a small foot. Might take you a long time to get a nut. I drink fast. It's the open toes that bother me. I like the patter. Where'd you come from? Same place you did, lover. Experience Alley. What do people call you after they get to know you better? Oh, different things at different times. For now, you can call me Rick. And later? Oh, you'll think of something easier. It's like that when you haven't got much time to talk. Here's to later, Rick. Uh, yeah. What does a doctor specialize in? Roger's a brain specialist. Mental disorders, mostly. <coughs> it's Lee. He's off again. <coughs> Maybe he's been listening to Sam Spade. Come on. You'd better stay down here, Nina. I'll take care of it. I'm going up. Lee needs me. Uh, George, get my baggage in the hall. All right. You'd better not come in, Mr. Diamond. I think I'd better. <coughs> Lena. Lena. Lee, what is it? I saw the blood again. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm glad you came. Now, calm down, Lee. Everything's going to be all right. Get away from me. He thinks I'm insane. You all do. You want my idol and you stop at nothing. Now, there's no sense in this much self-indulgence. Uh, here's not... your bag, Roger. Thanks. What are you going to do? Just give you something to make you sleep. I don't want to sleep. I'll wake up and see the blood again. There's no blood. It's just your imagination. You're overwrought. You think I'm crazy. But I saw it. I tell you, I saw it. Now, this won't hurt. No, I... I, I don't want to sleep. Please, Mr. Diamond, help me. Please, do what Roger tells you for my sake. Come on, come on, come on. The injection should take away. I'll get up. Just a minute. I, I won't go to sleep. Lee, please. Then leave Mr. Diamond with me. I want to talk to him. Well, I guess it'll be all right. Don't stay too long, Mr. Diamond. I want him to rest. Okay, doctor. Remember, he's not at all rational. Come on, Nina. I'll see you downstairs, Mr. Diamond. Hey, what's the idea, Leeds? I, I'm locking the door. I, I don't want anyone coming in. I, I, pardon me for walking around in circles. I've I got to stay awake. Uh-huh. Those people downstairs are, are trying to drive me crazy. They must have been working overtime. And they're after my idol. Your what? My idol. That carved image standing on the night table. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Here. Here, look at it. Look at it. Well, that's dandy. How many box tops did you have to save? Mr. Diamond, at this moment, you are holding $100,000 in your hand. I am? Last month, my grandfather passed on and left his entire estate to my sister and me. Among the effects was that idol. It was left to me. What is it, platinum? Oh, no. No, Mr. Diamond. That is the lost idol of King Tut. I always wondered what happened to it. Oh, oh then you know the legend. Well, uh, I'm a little, little hazy on it. Maybe you'd better bring me up to date. Oh, of course, of course. It was supposed to have been buried with King Tut. However, the story goes that a slave absconded with it before they sealed the tomb. And that makes it worth 100000 I guess so. Uh, you guess. You don't know? I only know what my grandfather told me before he passed on. He told me its value and said there was a curse on it. Uh, what does it say? Crime doesn't pay? Well, Mr. Diamond, it seems that on the first night of the new moon, after one has gained possession of the idol, he will die. Next week, Tom Swift and his electric grandmother. You don't believe me. Oh, sure. No, you don't. You're just like the rest. But it may interest you, Mr. Diamond, to know that one month after the idol was uncovered and my grandfather gained possession, he died. It was a new moon. How old was he? Seventy-four. Oh, well, that couldn't be it. Now relax and tell me why you came to me. What about your fee? Oh, forget it. You can just buy me a broom to ride around on. Good night, Mr. Leeds. Remember, Mr. Diamond, it's a new moon. You don't have much time. Oh, brother... Did you talk to her, Mr. Diamond? Uh, you might call it that. Now do you understand? Your point's well taken, Doctor. What about that hunk of stone? Maybe if you gave him a teddy bear? Oh, the idol he's got is absolutely worthless. His grandfather had the same unusual ideas about it. Is there such an idol? Oh, there's a legend, but no one has ever found even the slightest clue that it's a fact. Now, I've examined Lee's idol, and it's certainly not worth more, oh, any more than the granite it's carved from. Hmm. Well, I'll be saying good night. I hope he gets better. Can't I get you another drink, Mr. Diamond? You certainly deserve something for your trouble. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, goodbye, Doctor, Mr. Rodine. Thanks, Miss Leeds. I wish I could make this up to you. I'll uh, take a rain check. It'll be raining a lot this month. Uh, yeah. Well, good night, Miss Leeds. Good night. I went out and got a cab. As far as I was concerned, the frightened little man in the nightshirt was going to end up modeling straitjackets, and a private detective would only add to the confusion. It was 8 o'clock, and I told the cabbie to take me to 975 Park Avenue. 
Helen would be angry, but it was worth going back to. A couple of hours with her could make a guy as contented as a bear that had just cornered the honey market. We pulled up in front of Helen's apartment, and I paid the cabbie. I was just going in when a small convertible skidded to a stop in front of the building. Mr. Diamond! Mr. Diamond! It was Leland L. Leeds again, and you could still see part of the nightshirt under his top coat. He leaned out of the car window and called. Over here, Mr. Diamond. Please, I must talk with you again. I'd had enough of the jumpy little man with the idol, so I started into the apartment without answering. He called again, climbed out of the car, and started to cross the street toward me. I looked back just in time to see the other car swing in toward me. I ran back into the street and looked after the disappearing car. The lights were off, and I couldn't get the license number. It was too far away. I leaned down with the little man in the nightshirt. He was pretty far away, too. He was dying in a hurry. Mr. Diamond? Yes, Leeds? Take the idol. When you left, I... I found out why it was worth all that money. They... They didn't want me to tell you so. So they... They followed me and... And ran me... Ran me down. It's... It's in my coat pocket. He died lying on his back in the street. Several people were coming out of the building, so I reached into his pocket and pulled out a chamois bag. I guess the idol was inside, so I put it in my coat and went in to call the police. Oh, Mr. Diamond, Miss Asher's been worried. Hello, Francis. Tell her I'm back and let me use the phone. Certainly, sir. She's upstairs. Is something wrong, sir? You look worried. Man got hit by a car. I've got to call the police. Oh, my goodness. Is he hurt badly? Bad enough to get buried. Oh, my goodness. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me talk to the lieutenant. Is this Diamond? No, it's the Beaver Boys. Now put the lieutenant on the phone. What do you do with all those tired jokes? You can't keep using them. I give them away to idiots. Want to start a collection? Ooh. Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, this is Diamond. I got a body for you. I go off duty in 20 minutes. Call back then. Lying out in front of Helen's apartment, 975 Park. Rick, my stomach is bothering me. Why can't you be a good boy and stay out of trouble? Take some soda and get over here. Take some soda? Every time you call, I end up taking enough to give an elephant the hiccups. Well, you're a fine one. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick. I didn't know you were on the phone. Uh, wait a minute, Walt. Hello, baby. I'm talking to the lieutenant. Hmm. Aren't you afraid you'll catch cold in that thing? I'm mad at you. Oh, you're cute. Hey, what's going on? Uh, just Helen. If you could see her, your ulcers would start popping like chestnuts. Uh, say hello. Now, uh, the law sends you his greetings. Hello to the law. Uh, she says... I know. I heard it. Now, what about the stiff? His name's Leland L. Leeds. He got belted by a car. It was too far away to get the number. What makes you think it's a job for homicide? Get over here and Helen will give you the story. I've got some work to do. But uh, wait a minute, Rick. Oh, you're getting lazy. What's the matter? Don't you want to find out things for yourself? Rick, what happened? Francis told me some man got hit by a car. Right on your doorstep. Oh. Let's go into the other room, baby. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> We went into the warm study and Helen poured me a tall drink. I briefed her on what had happened earlier in the evening and she sat down next to me. There's something about red hair that does things to me. It smelled fresh and clean and with her that close, I could have been sitting in the middle of the Arctic and still kept my temperature above 102. Rick, do you have to go back out there? Well, somebody's got to tell his sister and in a way, I feel a little responsible. Are you going to give her the idol? Mm -hmm. The idol. The thing you took from poor Mr. Leeds' coat. You could at least show me what I'm playing second fiddle to. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I nearly forgot about it. Oh, here it is in this chamois bag. Oh, what an ugly little thing. And that's supposed to be worth all that money? Well, that was what leads, uh... Hey, something's missing. Yeah, one of the eyes. Must have come loose when the car hit him. Probably in the bag. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Rick! Yeah. It was painted over. You'd never guess it unless you pried it loose. That's as big as a marble. Is it real? Well, you've got enough of them around, you tell me. It is. Rick, I think it's a pigeon blood. Why, it's worth a fortune. What are you doing? I'm scratching the other one. Well, Mr. Leeds wasn't so squirrely after all. This is ridiculous. 
You only read about things like this. Two pigeon blood rubies. No wonder he thought it was worth $100,000. He said he found out tonight. He must have been scratching at them. Oh, then it wasn't just a hit and run. I don't know. Baby, I don't want to get hung up with a lot of explanation to Walt. Rick, what are you doing? Taking the other eye out. There. Now, now here. Hang on to these and don't let them get out of your little hot hand. When Walt gets up here, tell him what I've told you. Well, will you be back? An hour ago, I laughed at a little guy when he told me he was going to die. He said it was a full moon and he had a curse on him. I'm still a skeptic, but I'm a new boy when it comes to voodoo. I've got to hurry over there before the whole bunch of them turn into bats. <laughs> I went down in the service elevator and out on the street. The wagon was driving off with Leeds, and Walt and Otis were going into the building when I slipped up to the convertible and got in. Leeds had left the keys in the ignition like I figured, so I took off and headed across town. Twenty minutes later, on a lonely stretch of road, I started counting suspects. All three of them could be in on it. Dr. Miller, who said Leeds was insane. George Brodine, a man from the museum who said the idol was worthless. And that lovely sister... I didn't notice the car pulling up behind me until it was too late. It was doing a good 70, and as it swung around to pass me, the guy at the wheel cut in sharp and hit me broadside. Hey, look out! I went through a white fence and over an embankment. The car rolled, and somebody dropped the night on my head. I went to sleep. I don't know how long it was before I started coming around, but when I tried to shake myself back, it was like pulling my head out of a barrel of molasses. It stuck to my eyes and plugged up my ears. I tried to claw the stickiness away, but my hands were like two baseballs. I moved my shoulders and felt the stiffness in my back. It spread out to my hands and down to my feet. I opened my mouth and took in a lot of air. I finally made it. Someone was trying to get me from the highway, so I pulled myself clear of the wreck and started moving in a circle, keeping whoever it was at a good distance. I was too pushed around to put up a fight, so I made it back to the highway and walked along until I found a little gas station on the road. The joint ain't open. And then your lock's busted. No, it ain't. Then I floated through the wall. Where's your phone? It ain't for public use. Try isn't. Okay, wise guy, the joint isn't open. The phone isn't for public use, and you isn't so big you can't get tossed out on your face. And you isn't so wealthy, five bucks won't make a difference. Oh, why didn't you say so? Phone's on the wall. Thanks. You know the Leeds family? Yeah, they get gas here sometimes. Hello, Evergreen 34369 operator. How far is the house from here? I'm a little turned around. About a half a mile. Hello, Francis? Is Lieutenant Levinson still there? No? Well, just tell him to get out to 19319 Jackson Heights Boulevard. I've got a killer for him. Yeah, oh my goodness. Now hurry it up. You a cop? Shamus. What do you take for the use of your car for an hour? My wife would kill me. I'll drive you wherever you want to go. He gave me a lift in his old sedan, and ten minutes later I was ringing the doorbell to the Leeds house. I was glad the girl answered. She made me feel better right away. Oh, Mr. Diamond, come in. Oh, thank you. Where are your friends? Raj and George. They went out to look for my brother. He disappeared right after you left. I'm terribly worried. Oh, uh, have you got that drink? I could use it now. Certainly. I don't know why Lee ran off like that. He shouldn't have been driving in his condition. Were Roger and George together when they left to look for Lee? No, they took separate cars. Why? Has something happened, Mr. Diamond? Have you heard from my brother? I guess I'd better give it to you straight. Your brother's dead, Miss Leeds. I'm sorry. Dead? Oh, no. He was hit by a car. It's all because of that horrible idol. That stupid, horrible idol. If my grandfather hadn't told Lee it was worth that much money, this never would have happened. Did you think it was worth anything? No, of course not. But we couldn't convince Lee. Now he's dead. <laughs> would you please answer that, Mr. Diamond? Sure. You take it easy. <laughs> Nina, I... 
Oh, what are you doing here, Diamond? Did you find Lee? Why, no, no, I didn't. I've gone to every place I thought he could possibly be. I even looked up your address when over there, but the building was closed. You better go in and see Miss Leeds, Doc. She's pretty upset. Upset? Lena, what's wrong? Oh, Raj, it's Lee. He's been killed. What? That's right. But how did it happen? Bingo. I'll tell you as soon as I let Mr. Brodine in. There, there, Nina. Just put yourself on fire. You Come in, Mr. Brodine. Uh, well, Mr. Diamond, what are you doing here? I think I'd better have a sign made. The doctor and Miss Leeds are in the living room. Well, has something happened? Mr. Leeds is dead. What? This is the most surprised household I've ever run into. Roger, is this true? I guess so. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Nina. Is there anything I can do? No. No, thank you. Where did this happen, Mr. Diamond? In front of 975 Park Avenue. Car hit him. I was with him when he died. Oh, this is terrible. I thought at first it was an accident, but I'm not sure. What do you mean? When I left to come out here, someone ran me off the road, nearly killed me. Who would want to kill Lee and then try to kill you? <laughs> probably a coincidence. Certainly, certainly. Probably just a drunk. Could have been. Lee gave me this before he died. A chamois bag. What's in it? The idol. Well, that awful thing... What do you want done with it, Miss Leeds? I don't care. Just get it out of this house. What are you going to do? I don't know. You want the thing, Doctor? Why, what for? That's a good question. How about you, Brodine? You want it? Oh, well, what would I want a worthless piece of stone for? Well, as long as no one wants it, may I use this fire poker, Miss Leeds? What are you going to do with it? The idol is worthless. It's caused a lot of trouble for you and your family. I'm going to break it up. Well, Brodeen, you're sure getting grabby. All right, now all of you stay right where you are. Well, for a museum collector, that's a pretty modern gun. Yes, and I know how to use it. George! This is the hokiest case I've ever been on. Even the dialogue's bad. I suppose you think you're pretty clever making me show my hand like that. I read Gory Detective. I found that the idol was really worth all that money, but I had to make the killer tip himself. You did. Mr. Diamond, do you mean my brother was really right all along? In a way, yes. He believed what his grandfather told him. But it wasn't until tonight when he scratched one of the eyes of the idol that he knew for sure. Scratched one of the eyes? That's right. Pigeon blood rubies, painted over. Well, now I'm leaving you. Well, that's good, but you're minus something. Minus what? A couple of rubies. I took them out of the idol. You're lying. Take a look at the bag. What? They're gone. I'll kill you for this. Give me the gun, George. Look out. He's going to shoot. Give me the gun. All right, everyone. This is the police. He shot Diamond, all right, Lieutenant. Put the bracelets on him, Otis. Sure. Come here, you. Not him. Put him on Diamond for disturbing the peace. Pin the medal on the other guy. No, no, no. Sure no. thing. How do you like that, wise guy? <laughs> oh, Rick. no. Rick? Oh, I'm dying. Ricky? Oh. Rick, wake up. Uh, 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 all right, all right, George, drop the gun. Rick, you've been dreaming. Uh, oh, hell no. Oh, you were having a big, fat nightmare. Oh. I came down from upstairs and you were asleep on the couch with gory detectives. Oh, well, well, I started reading some story and I got mixed up with the Egyptian idols and the rubies. I got shot. That's the case of the ruby eyes. That was the craziest dream. I solved the crime and got shot six times for my trouble. Oh. Oh, Lieutenant Levinson and Otis came in and arrested me for disturbing the peace. After you were shot six times? Yeah. <laughs> Otis loved it. That wasn't in the magazine. I worked out my own ending. Move in. That's pretty. What are the lyrics? Well, uh, an awful lot of them. <laughs> I'll sing them. Okay. I'm sitting high on a hilltop. Oh, I remember that. Tossing all my troubles to the moon. It's from Thanks a Million. Where the breeze seems to say, don't you worry. With Alice Payne. Things are bound to pick up pretty soon. Here neath the sky on the hilltop, seems to me the world is all in tune. I forget all the bustle and hurry. Tossing all my troubles to the moon. I know someone will love me And everything will be just grand 
just so the stars up above me continue doing business at the same old stand. It's mighty sweet in the evening when I've had a busy afternoon sitting high, high, high on a hilltop tossing all my troubles to the moon. Sing it again, Rick. I'm sitting high on the hill. Oh, Rick, the grouch. Yeah, listen to that. Where the breeze seems to say, don't you worry. Hey. <laughs> how you like that, wise guy? Oh, that's really awful. Yeah, well, maybe you know how I feel when you open that big bass of yours. You mean I sound like you do? Look, Diamond, what do you think the rats keep jumping out of my window for? Well, maybe if you had some plastic surgery. <laughs> and your crummy jokes are as bad as your crummy singing. So please, save the world from a horrible fate and cut your throat or something. Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you all oh, about... Oh, I'm sitting high on a hilltop, tossing all my troubles. Hey, you! Shut up! We want to hear Diamond. Yeah, shut your big bazoo! Yeah, shut up! What's that? You heard us. We want to hear Mr. Diamond. Oh, no, no. Rick. Yeah, my dear public. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Peter Leeds, Yvonne Patey, Stephen Dunn, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. (laughs) Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC tomorrow? Detective story fans will want to hear Madeline Carroll and Basil Rathbone in the detective melodrama The Amazing Dr. Clitterhouse tomorrow on Theater Guild on the Air. And for more detecting, listen tomorrow for The Adventures of Sam Spade. He'll present his most humorous caper of the season. Yes, you'll enjoy both Theater Guild and Sam Spade tomorrow on NBC. Next, it's Free Ride to Danger with Dorothy McGuire on NBC. Portions of the following program are transcribed. Here is Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Are you, Mr. Diamond? Creditor or client? I'm a client. I'm a diamond. I'm glad. It's a little informal, but hello, glad. Call me Rick. Oh, oh no. No, no, no. My name is, is Julia Bates. Mrs.? Yes, but you don't have to call me Mrs. Bates. I'm a widow, you see. Oh. In fact, it, it may help our relationship if you call me Julia. Oh, well, here we go again. All right, Julia, you can call me Rick. The fee's 100 a day in expenses. I want you to stay at my house tonight. Uh, I said a hundred a day in expenses. Oh, the, the fee is all right, Mr. Um, Rick. Money means nothing. Yeah, well, you think your way and I'll think mine. I'll make out a check right now. No hurry. Any time in the next ten seconds. Hmm. Oh, there. Uh, thanks. Now, about this assignment. Well, it, it may sound silly, but I'm afraid of the house I live in. Oh, dandy. 
Well, I said it might sound silly, mm-hmm. but it's deadly serious, I assure you. No, I'm sure it is. You see, my husband, Warner Bates, died three months ago. Mm-hmm. He was a very strange man and believed devoutly in many forms of mysticism. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he built this house as a monument to his beliefs and, and filled it with secret passages and rooms and steps that lead nowhere. Why not move out? Well, I'll be perfectly honest. It's because of the money. Oh, oh. In his will, Warner stipulated I was to live in the house for a period of three months following his death. Three months is up tomorrow. And it doesn't help that Warner is buried in the basement vault. What's he doing? Watching Benny's money? Well, he he had a crypt built in the cellar, and a a key, the only key to it, was placed in his coffin. Mm. What's supposed to happen tonight? Well, let let, let me tell you the whole story. Uh, A month ago, I began to hear the strangest things in the house at night, and I found food half-eaten on the kitchen table. Ever try setting traps? Well, the worst shot came when I went to the cellar a few days ago. I found footprints in the dust, naked footprints, leading to and from the crypt. Maybe you had to take a shower. Oh, please, please let me finish. On his deathbed, Warner swore he'd visit me at the end of the third month, and if he could, take me with him back to the spirit world. Oh. And tonight is the night. Yes. Mm. Oh, at first, I, I didn't think it would get me, but... Oh, I'm scared. Really scared. Yeah, well, uh, now, look, baby. Let's get off this mystic kick. Who inherits if you don't live up to your requirements? Well, that's just it. No one. That is, no person. That The money goes to charities and schools. Mm-hmm. Mr. Anderson, the executor of the estate, says the will is foolproof, legal, and binding. Either I live in the house until noon tomorrow, or forfeit the inheritance. So what you wanted me to do is hang around tonight and see that hubby doesn't go death walking. Yes, that's right. Uh, you don't have to be there till dark, but oh, don't be any later than that. Say, six o'clock? Uh, excuse me. Diamond Detective Agency, freewheeling corpses, ask the man who kills one. <laughs> Rick, when are you going to stop those awful slogans? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Got to call you back, got a client. Oh, all right. Is she pretty? I don't know. I'm parked behind a curve. What? Oh, forget it. I'll call you back. Bye. Now, uh, uh, Julia, uh, you better go on home. Where's your broom? Broom? Do you think I look like a witch? Mm, You don't look like one. More like the good fairy after she'd heard about men. Now, you fly on home, sweetheart, and I'll see you at six. Uh, uh, Don't be late. I'll be there with bones on. I tried to uncurl my toes and get my mind on business. Thinking of my spook client didn't seem to help, but it was, uh, business. It was getting pretty late in the afternoon, so I put the office to bed for the night, picked up a bite to eat, and went over to the 5th Precinct to keep a coffee date with Lieutenant Levinson. When I walked into the squad room, I spotted Sergeant Otis with his nose in a book. Oh, hello, Otis. What's with the book? Don't tell me you're learning to read. Hey, hey, hey. hello, Shamus. Uh, how's tricks? The book, Sergeant. What's the book? A book? Oh, what book? Oh, uh, uh, Lieutenant's inside. He said for you to go right in when you came. Otis, uh, tell Uncle Richard about the book. Oh, it's just a book. Here, I was trying to improve myself. Well, don't feel ashamed, Otis. You've got reason to do that. Yeah, very funny. I see. Hmm. The art of graceful dancing. Otis. Well, what's wrong with me dancing, Shamus? I... I don't want to be no social outcast. Dancing? Well, maybe. But graceful? Otis, you couldn't be graceful even if your feet did match. Tell you what, though. I'll give you a hand. Now, just open your arms and pretend you have a dame. Go on. I'll start you on a waltz. Well, okay. Da, da, dee, dee, dum. Tweet, 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 tweet. Da, da. Oh, no, 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 Otis. You look like an elephant with sprained ankles. Now, try again and close your eyes. Yadadum dee 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 dee. Otis, where's the button? Uh, Otis, put me down. Well, oh, oh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I, I thought you was a dame. You what? Oh. I, I mean, I had my eyes closed. I, I, I was dancing. Oh, Lieutenant, the, the shamus talked me into it. Rick, would you mind telling me what you were doing? Saving Arthur Murray ulcers. Yeah, well, come on in and get some coffee. And Otis. Yeah? Shut up. Shall I pour? Uh, please do. You know how I like mine, Walt. Yeah, no cream, 12 lumps. Uh, better change that. I would think so. Okay, how many? Make it 14. Your coffee's stronger than mine. It's not so strong, Rick. Here. Mm, thanks. You better wipe that spot off the desk. The varnish is beginning to smoke. Your jokes aren't any better. 
Going to stick around for the heart game tonight? I uh, can't, Walt. I've got a client with a house full of spirits. What? The dead kind. With you on the job, there'll be corpses jumping out of every window. Uh, yeah. Well, if they start, I'll give you a call. I know, I know. Why don't you give up being a detective, Rick? Play postman or something. Walt, you just don't seem to appreciate my favors. Uh, uh-oh, I'm getting late. It's nearly six. It's a peaceful night, Rick. See if you can't keep it that way. Oh, sure, Walt, sure. This is one night you can take it easy. Uh, give me two more lumps, please. <laughs> Leaving Walt and heading to the Bates house, I was feeling as happy as a bird in a hat full of worms. I had a hundred bucks to stall off the landlord, a lovely red-headed girlfriend with curves, and a spook client with, uh, trouble. Everything great. Then the storm began to blow up. It had started to rain when I saw the Bates house on Temple Street. A big, ugly house straight out of a horror story with gables and shuttered windows. And as if that wasn't enough, I was met at the door by a butler who was a tiny thing, about seven feet tall and 300 pounds, with a face like the devil with a hangover. Come in. Oh, uh, yeah, I wanted to see uh, Mrs. Bates, of course. You are Mr. Diamond. She left word with you? I need no word. I am the seventh son. Of a what? The seventh son. Of a... Oh, no, this could go on forever. Okay, lead on. The name is Kane. Yeah? How's your brother? Well, forget it. Where's your, uh, Mrs. Bates? In the drawing room. This way, sir. Cozy little mausoleum. What time do the ghosts come out? Usually right after the vampires, sir. Oh, dandy. I hope they have an early show. Oh, it will be soon enough, sir. The dead are restless. Tonight. Maybe if I rocked them to sleep, I... Got a rock? Mrs. Bates. Oh, yes. Mr. Diamond. Oh, thank you, Kate. Uh, hello, Rick. How, how do you like my house? Oh, it's, uh, it's lovely. What do you use for doorknobs? Heads? And what's with the big zombie? You didn't mention him. Kate? Oh, he's a fixture around here, but... Mm. I get frightened more when he's around than when he's gone. Oh, well, now you take it easy, baby. Come on over and sit down and... Let me chase those fears away. Oh, that is an idea. Name me a better. Uh, can I fix you a drink? Oh, I, I think I'll take a glass of milk, sir. Here you are. Oh, now, hey, look, Crusher, put a bell around your neck or something. One more surprise like that, and you'll be best man at a funeral. My apologies. Your milk, sir. Yeah, thanks, sir. Come on, Julia, let's get back to where we were. And you, Kane, you... Hey, where'd he go? Rick. Rick, there it is. Huh? Yeah. But, but, but that's the way it starts. Listen. It's the stairs to the cellar. Someone's climbing them. What? Oh, it's probably Kane. Right? You wanted me, the Kane. Then who... You wait in here, Julia. I'll go out and get our nosy friend. Uh, the, the cellar door is at the end of the hall. I left Julia looking as nervous as a one-legged man walking a tightrope and took off down the long hall. There was only one door, the one to the cellar, so I opened it and flipped on the switch. I was moving my ankles down the creaking steps when I heard trouble. <laughs> what the devil? Julia! Julia! Are you hurt? What is it? Rick! Rick, over there in the closet, a, a dead man! A de Oh, no. There's no dead man in here. But I saw him, Rick. I swear there, there was a man in there. He was all bloody, and there was a big knife in his chest. Oh, but you must have been mistaken. About a corpse, Rick. He was there. Well, I don't see it. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, You're on the floor. Blood stains. You see, there was a man in there. Hmm, this is blood, all right. So where'd the body go? He couldn't have been moved that fast. Unless... Where's Kane? Right here, Mr. Diamond. But I did not move the dead one. No? Where were you just now when Julia screamed? Having tea with a vampire? No, I was in the kitchen, sir. Do not be mystified, Mr. Diamond. Accept the fact that you are in a house 
controlled by the other world. There's been a murder, Kane, and that brings it into this world. Who are you calling? A real-life cop who likes to know about dead bodies kicking around. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick. Oh, no. I know that tone. Where's the body? I wish I knew. Come on over to 209 East Temple Street. Wait. What do you mean, you wish you knew? Is there a body there? Well, it's here someplace. Now, don't argue. Get over here. Wait, wait. And wait. hurry. Now, Kane... You can go back to the kitchen, but stay there. Don't roam around. As you wish, sir. And now, Julia, baby, we're going to do some investigating. I- investigating? That's right. I got a big yen to see what's in that vault downstairs. And this time, I'm taking you with me. But, Rick, it's locked. I hope so, but I'm not making book. You, you mean you think it may actually have been Warner come back from the dead? And then kill that man, I mean? Right now, I don't know what to think. I wouldn't be surprised to run into Dracula sitting on top of the wolf man. Here's the basement. Hey, who turned out the light? I know I turned it on before. Yeah, that's better. Come on. Oh, Rick, it, it's cold down here. Oh, hurry, Rick. I'm getting scared. No, yeah, I don't like the feel of it myself, but I want to check this vault. See? See the footprints there in the dust? I see them, but I don't believe them. Not yet. Yeah, I'll try the door of the vault. Why, it's unlocked. Yeah, and look what's inside. The coffin is empty. It's empty, all right, and it's open. Well, are you going inside? Uh, no, no, I... I think I'll stay out here. <gasps> the light! Rick, who put out the light? It wasn't Edison, baby. We got company. <laughs> I'd come back for you. Warner? Hey, what is this? I am dead. Oh. You know who I am, don't you, Julia? Yes. Hmm? Yes, I, I know it's you, Warner. I'm coming for you tonight, Julia. I will appear at nine o'clock. I'd better set my watch. Be prepared to meet me, Julia, at nine o'clock. No, no, Warner, no, no. Hey, take it no. easy, baby. <laughs> Rick, you down there? Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, Walt, well, turn on the lights. Sure. There, they're on. Rick, what are you doing? To... Oh, a block. I should have known. Well, do come upstairs and join us. We're coming off. Now, what is this all about, Rick? Where... Uh, in a minute, Walt. Otis, help Mrs. Bates into the living room. She's pretty shaken up. Sure, Shamus. Come on, lady. Now, what is this all this about, Rick? Now, come on back downstairs with me, Walt, and get your gun out. Somewhere in this cellar is a dead man with a lousy sense of humor. Well, we searched the long cellar, but good, while I briefed Walt on the events of the evening. Neither was much of a success. Walt didn't believe me, and our ghost remained a ghost. As we went back up into the living room, I was at a point where I didn't believe the things myself. They couldn't have happened, but they had. Hey, uh, Otis, where did Mrs. Bates go? She went upstairs to pack Sharma, said she was going to leave. Leave? And give up her dough? Oh, for Pete's sake, she can't... Not just because of this ghost house. Ghost house? Oh, this is the wackiest yet. Rick, if I didn't know you were so... Walt, do I look like I'm happy about these things? I'm at a point where I'm believing in spooks and spirit worlds and dead men who talk from out of nowhere. Yeah, so that Sharma is afraid of spooks. This I'm loving. Otis. Uh, I know, Lieutenant. Shut up. Did I say that, Otis? Well, no, Lieutenant. What do you want me to do? Shut up. Oh, oh. Gee, I wish I had a glass of water. A glass of water, Sergeant. <laughs> oh, come out from behind that chair, Otis. It's only Kane. Who's he? Well, didn't he let you in? No, we found the door open. When we rang and no one answered, we came in. Oh, did you? Hey, Kane, where were you? Didn't you hear the doorbell? I knew the door was open, Mr. Diamond. And I was busy. Like maybe playing ghost? No, sir. Baking a cake. Cake? Oh, swell. Rick, I'm all packed. Will, will you take me to a hotel? Now, but Julia, look, you can't leave. Think of the money. Money or no money, I'm getting out of here, Rick. That was Warner's voice, and I, I, I just don't have the nerve to stay. Oh, but look, baby, you know there aren't any such things as ghosts. Do I? You were in the cellar with me. You heard him. 
And did you find anybody down there afterwards? Well, no, but... Just a minute, Mrs. Bates. You saw a murdered man earlier this evening, didn't you? You know I did in that closet. Yeah, well, until I find out who he is and who killed him, you don't leave this house. But, 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 Warner... I'm sorry, Julia. We'll protect you, but you can't leave. Otis, take Mrs. Bates into the library and make her comfortable. Hey, Yellowton, come on, Mrs. Bates. Well, Now, Rick, enough is enough. How could there have been a body in that closet one minute and not the next? Where did it go and why? Well, how the devil should I know? She saw it, screamed, I ran back, opened the closet, and it was gone. Oh, great. Now, come on. I want a better look at that closet. Well, it looks all right. Wonder how it sounds. Use your gun butt on the walls. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, but where's the latch? There must be some way to open this section. Oh, try those hooks. Yeah. No, no, not them. Hmm. Maybe this rack. Look. Secret room, just like in the movies. Oh, oh, there he is. Yeah, we found the corpse, Walt. And how he disappeared so fast. Oh, some mess. Blood all over him. Walt, hey, this is no corpse. What? Oh, now, don't start that. No? Well, look at it closer, Walt. It's a dummy. Well, I'm... It is. A wax dummy with blood smeared on it. No wonder I wasn't meant to see it. Oh. This is it. I'm getting out of this crazy house. Corpses that talk, corpses that aren't corpses. I've had enough. This is just plain ridiculous. Now, wait, Walt. Someone planted this dummy, and someone is trying to scare Mrs. Bates out of this house. That same someone is in this house right now, and if he isn't stopped, it may mean her murder. How are you feeling, Julia? I'm exhausted, Rick, but I... I... We found the body, Julia. It was a dummy. A dummy? Well, then... Then there wasn't any murdered man? No, this whole thing is a bluff, even that voice in the cellar. Oh, no, that couldn't be. That was Warner's voice, Rick. I know it was. And he's not in his coffin. I know, baby, and I think that's all phony, too. Now, tell me, who knew that only key in the coffin business? Well, just myself. And, and Mr. Anderson. Anderson? Oh, that's right. You remember, he was Warner's lawyer. Oh, yeah. How about Kane? Did he know of the key? Well, I don't know, Rick. He may have Warner confided in him a great deal. Rick, this isn't getting us any place. Come with me. Otis, you stay with Mrs. Bates. Yellowton. All right, Walt. What are we going to do? Grill the dummy? Go ahead. Be funny. But I want to search this whole house. Oh, Walt, this place is a nut house full of secret rooms and hocus pocus. It'll take two maps and a Ouija board to get around in it. Well, I'm going to get around in it. And up these stairs is as good a place as any to start. Hello, Walt. Oh, stairs that lead to a blank wall. Rick, that's too much. Now, would you stop playing games? Playing games, he says. Oh, where is my bicarbonate? Here you are, Lieutenant. Ah. Sorry to be late. Where's the thunder, Kane? You're Mr. Q. Will there be anything else, sir? I don't see how, sir. Not unless Frankenstein drops in for a game of jacks. I doubt if he will. Tonight it's at his house, so... I'll be on hand if you need anything. We won't. Go on back to your embalming. Come on, Walt. You feeling okay? Oh, I'll never feel okay again. Rick, I've stood for your getting me mixed up in some crazy cases, but this night I'll never forget. Oh, don't quit on me now, Walt. We still have to find that spook and keep Julia from being killed. How? Please, tell me how. Look, he said he was going to appear at 9 o'clock tonight to take her to the spirit world with him. Yeah, well, I'll get a squad down here to see that he doesn't. No, no, Walt, wait. He'll never show up if we're all hanging around, right? Well, yeah. Uh, the only way we can catch the ghost is for him to show up, right? Yeah, go on. So what do we do? So we pretend to leave, make a big fuss about giving the whole thing up. Then we sneak back in and hide. We wait and see if he shows up, and when he said he would, and if he does, we nab him. Case closed. Well, it sounds screwy, but to wind this case up, I'll buy anything. Where do we hide? We'll get Julia to wait in the living room. We'll sneak back and hide in that secret room behind the closet. If the ghost shows, we can grab him as soon as he gives himself away. And I think he'll show. After getting Julia to agree to the idea, Walt Otis and I made a big thing about leaving the house. Then we sneaked back in and hid in the secret room back of the living room closet. The closet door was open enough so we could see Julia pretending to read on the couch. And for the next few centuries, we waited. Waited for a dead man to keep a date. What time is it, Rick? It's two minutes to nine. If he's going to show, it won't be long. Hey, 
You think a dead man really can come back to life? If you don't shut up, Otis, I'll give you a personal chance to try. I wish he'd hurry. Yeah. Well, it's just time now. I hope Julia plays her part okay. She looks pretty nervous. No, why would she be nervous? She's only waiting for a dead man. A phony dead man, Walt, I hope. Now, don't you start believing in ghosts. You know there aren't any such things. <laughs> Rick, the lights went out. Shh, listen. I told you I would come for you, Julia. It is nine o'clock. Oh, Warner, please, please don't take me out. I don't want to die. Rick, that's to... him. Shh, wait a minute, Walt. I am of the dead, Julia. I am your husband. Yes, yes, I know you, Walter. You must leave this house, Julia. No. Come on, Walt. Right. And notice, be quiet. Oh, I will. Well. I know enough not to make any noise. But... <laughs> what, what was that? Rick! Rick, hurry! Come on, let's grab him. We all took off after the ghost. It led us on the screwiest chase yet, in and out of the secret passages, upstairs, and then back downstairs again. Trying to lay hands on him was like trying to swat a fly with a piece of string. He finally made a break for the outside door. Then, not to be outdone, I made like a big athlete. Hey, that was a pretty nifty tackle, Tyler. Rick, Rick, you okay? Yeah, as soon as I get this hood off, I'm going to have a few words with this spook. There. He's out cold. Oh, just bring Mrs. Bates in here. Oh, okay. Come on, you. Wake oh. up. Who is he? I don't know. Come on, wake up. Oh. Before I make a real ghost out of you. Okay. Okay, don't hit me anymore, please. Yes, yeah. yeah, she is, Lieutenant. Mrs. Bates, do you know who this man is? What? Why, it, it's Warner's lawyer, Mr. Anderson, the executor of the estate. Sure, baby, had to be. All right, Buster, what's the story? Oh, all right, all right. It was the money. If I could get Julia to break the will, I, I had a dummy charity set up so I could get the estate. He's all yours, Walt. Wrap him up. It'll be a pleasure. Otis, put the cuffs on him. Take him out of here. Yeah, Lieutenant. Come on, Spooky. Well, that takes care of that. Hey, what about Kane? He must have known about all this. Of course I knew, Lieutenant. But I did not wish to intrude. Those who interfere with the dead... Pay their own penalty. Lose their haunting license? <laughs> Nothing. Oh, sir, my cake is done. Would you like some? It's devil's food. No, thanks. I'll skip it. With nuts? Uh, Julia, walk me to the door. Well, of course, Rick. I'll leave you with Kane, Wall. Tell him a ghost story. Feeling all right, baby? Oh, yes, much better. I'm fine now that I know there's nothing to be afraid of. Tomorrow I'll be moving into an apartment. Uh, will you come and see me? We have things to talk over. Like what, honey? Like sharing a mood. You know, just the two of us. With that, she reached up and showed me what she meant with a big smoochie. Oh, I'd have probably stuck around, but I was afraid the house would be too disturbing. I wouldn't have minded having to get up to chase the bats out of the room, but with Kane showing up every time I wanted something, well, that could have led to complications. So I left Walt and Otis to clean things up, bid a not-too-fond farewell to Kane, and went from the house of horror to the one that was full of redhead and a piano. The redhead was wearing a red dress with a new... Uh, uh, you know what I mean. Well, didn't think you were going to make it. Uh, I had a tough case tonight, honey. Thought I might not get away at all. Mm -hmm. I bet you did. Why, Helen, baby, all of a sudden you sound suspicious. Without any effort, darling. Especially when it comes to blonde. Uh, blonde? You mean girls? Girls. Blonde girls with hair like this on your lapel. Oh. And the lipstick on your cheek and the look in your eyes. Oh, you know how it is, honey? Brilliant detective saves clients' life and fortune. She had to be grateful. <laughs> Brilliant detective. You keep on making me so jealous of you, and one of these days the world is going to lose a brilliant detective. No. Someone going to rub out Sam Spade? Oh, what's the use? Oh, now, baby, don't be mad. Come on, let's next. No. I'm upset and I'm unhappy. And if I sing, will you be happy again? No, no. Well, I'll try. 
I'll sing my red old head off. I need your love so badly. I love you oh so madly. But I don't stand a ghost of a chance with you. I thought at last I'd found you. But other love surround you. And I don't stand a ghost of a chance with you. If you'll surrender just for a tender kiss or two, you might discover that I'm the lover meant for you, and I'd be true. But what's the good of scheming? I know I must be dreaming. But I don't stand a ghost of a chance with you. Happy? Yes, I am. You'll be neck? No. No, it's still early enough to catch a late show. Well, if I take it to the show? Uh, yes. Okay. What's the show you want to see? Oh, it's a wonderful horror picture full of spooks. The ghost talk. Oh, no, no, no. You have just heard Richard Diamond, private detective starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Joan Banks, Paul Fries, and Robert Clark. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Portions were transcribed. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. <laughs> now, this is Tal Avery inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC tomorrow? There's great comedy in store for you on the Phil Harris, Alice Faye show when Phil and Frankie go shopping for Alice's Christmas present. And there's excellent drama on Theater Guild on the air. Tomorrow, Richard Conti, Diana Lynn, and Shirley Booth will be starred in the Pulitzer Prize-winning play, Street Scene, on Theater Guild on the air. Portions of the following are transcribed. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Yeah. Down, up, round, and down. Mr. Diamond, I presume? Yes, and maybe no. Down, up, round, and round. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand you. Uh, yes, I'm Diamond, and you're not presuming on me, not if you're a client. Well, no, that's not what I mean. What is that object you're playing with? Uh, this? This is a yo-yo. You make it go down, up, round, and down. See? Uh, yes, yes. But, but I came in on business, Mr. Diamond. I want to hire you. Just drop it like this. Down, up, as a detective. Oh. Well, a hundred a day in expenses, and I throw in the yo-yo lessons free. Give me the Mr. Diamond. Are you in business? Do you have the hundred a day? I do. I am. That's fine. Your name? Oh, I, I can't tell you that. Goodbye. <laughs> Will you kindly put that thing away? 
I have a terrible head. Oh, I don't know. It's not so bad. Carve it yourself. Why, you insufferable... Now, wait a minute. Until we've had a formal introduction, the word insufferable is your ticket for a new set of dentures. Now, why don't we get formal and save your gums that lonely feeling? I told you my name is not important. That I believe, but let's kick it around anyway. Is that necessary? Look, look, you said you wanted to hire me. So either tell me your name or what you wanted me to do, or let me get back to my practicing. Uh, I, I should find another detective, but you came highly recommended, so... All right. Uh, you can call me, uh, Johns. Other wife? What? Forget it. The initials on your briefcase read J.B. Oh, oh, that, uh, it's one I borrowed. So, now that I've conquered your coyness, what's the Pitch? Pitch? Oh, oh, you mean my assignment. Oh, it's very simple, but first, I must insist that no word of this conversation leaves your office. So far, no one would believe it anyhow. But my ethics are in good order, Mr. Johns. Good, good. This must be kept very secret. Shall I pull down the blinds and stuff the keyhole? Oh, that shan't be necessary, thank you. Your secret is... Uh, murder, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I just knew you were going to say that. Where's the corpse? Uh, the corpse? Oh, that's what I came to you for. I want to have professional advice on every angle before I kill. Now, you've had police experience. Uh, I... Unless my hearing aid's on the blink, you're saying you want to commit a murder. Oh, not want. I'm going to. This evening. Oh. What do you want me for? The victim? Oh, I have the victim, the opportunity, method, uh, and the man to handle the uh, details. However, I want to be sure that I'm not tripped up by my lack of foresight to police procedures. Uh, sure, 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 yeah. Uh, whom are you calling? The police, but you'll probably get sent to Bellevue. Mr. Diamond, your ethics. Ethics about concealing or helping a murder are free passage to Sing Sing. The phone. Put it down quickly. Oh, my. Isn't that shiny? A real gun. Those things are illegal, you know. Must you shake it so much? Uh, oh, uh, sorry. I, I'm a little nervous. Oh, swell. You're nervous. Hey, quiet, quiet. I'm thinking. This visit has obviously been an error. Perhaps not a fatal one. Let's see. I have it. Into the closet. What? With my bicycle? It'll be too crowded. Your bicycle? Oh, my exercise bicycle. That's my... There's my rowing board and oh, my... Oh, be weight. quiet. Stop walking. Oh, this is ridiculous. Now open that door. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, now that bicycle. It has a seat? Well, yes. Sit on it. So the Diamond Detective Agency sat in the stuffy closet listening to the sound of the desk being pulled over and jammed against the door. Not having anything better to do except call myself names, I rode. On my fifth lap around the world, I gave birth to a brainchild and began applying the art of leverage against the blockaded door using both legs and the flat of my back. Result? A charley horse. On the third lap following, I came up with something more substantial. A heavy barbell. Four smashes and three torn ligaments later, the thin door collapsed over the desk, blocking it. I picked my way over the debris, trying to focus my eyes to the light. By instinct, more than sight, I found the phone. But as I reached to pick it up, I suddenly realized I was shaking hands with someone. Back up, Diamond. Oh, this is getting ridiculous. All my clients waving guns at me. I'm no client, Diamond. Mr. Johns wants I should keep you company for a while. Oh, well, you're a small one. This gun makes me a big one, Diamond. Real big. That's why my nickname is Big Man, even though I'm only four feet tall. Oh, maybe I could help you. I've got a lot of exercise things. Be funny or shut up. How about a few yo-yo lessons? <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. Shut up. Big Man, what would happen if I took that gun away from you? You want to try? Uh, I was giving it a thought. But on second thought, uh, no. Yeah, smart Shamus. I can empty this magazine in your stomach before you make two steps. It... Rick, I... Oh, I didn't know you had a client. Take it easy, Diamond. I got a gun in my pocket. Uh, the, uh, H Helen, Helen, baby, come in. Uh, uh, meet Big Man McCarthy, an old, old pal from PS69. Big Man, this is, uh, Miss Asher. Oh, yes, delighted, Mr. McCarthy. Hey, same here, chick. Say, pal, you got good taste. Some built. Oh, <laughs> such a flatterer. Rick, what happened to your closet? Uh, the termites broke my non-aggression pact. Uh, what's on your mind, baby? Well, I came to see if you were ready for the benefit tonight. You are, aren't you? Oh, well, am I? Just watch this new yo-yo trick. They call it round the world. Oh, wonderful. Oh, Rick, you know so many things. Where'd you learn that? A PS-69, of course. Where else? Mr. McCarthy. Do it again, Rick. I want to see how you do it. Sure, baby, just watch. You take it in your hand like this and throw it out like this. <laughs> oh, Rick, you struck that poor little man. No. 
Well, that poor little man had a big nasty gun in his pocket, and it was pointed right at my breakfast. Why, that horrible... Why didn't you hit him harder? He might have hurt you. Oh, darling, are you sure you're all right? I'm sure, baby. Well, you send for the police. He should be behind... Now, look, Helen, this is my department. You'll go along with your errands. Rick, he's dangerous. Helen, will you go away? I have a few questions I want to ask this little hood, and you'll be of no help, believe me. Well, all right, but you be careful. Oh, and uh, about tonight. It's not at my apartment, but the park is penthouse, up above in the same building. Now, come early and help Francis and me get things ready. Stop pushing. I'll see you tonight, baby. Oh, Rick. Are you sure I can't stay? Go, scat. Now, for you, Mr. Big Man. Come here. Wake up. Wake up. The mule train went that way. Come on, come out of it. Ah, ah, that's you, huh? Yeah, me. Now, what's the real name of your boss? Who's he going to kill? You can stop the questions, Diamond. I'm not going to talk. You want me to wring it out of you like a wet wash? Who is Mr. Johns? You know, there's a big advantage in being Little Diamond. Yeah, you can hide under smaller rocks. <laughs> Who's your boss? There's another advantage, too. A man my size can be awfully hard to catch. What? Hey, come back here. Shaman. <laughs> he never looked so good. Shut up, Otis. He's really been worked over. Wonder what gang did this to him. Rick. Rick, snap out of it. Oh, oh. Rick, what happened? Oh, just came through the door. Oh. What? Coming through the door couldn't wreck you like that. Oh, without opening it? You mean. Oh, no. You got that shiner by running into the door? <laughs> Shut up, Otis. Okay, Rick, where's the body? Uh, beside you. Now, that's Otis. I mean, where's the corpse? Uh, the corpse isn't a corpse yet. Otis, get my bicarbonate. Hey, Yellowton. Go on, Rick. The corpse isn't a corpse. Tell me, what is it? A ghost? Exactly. Otis? Hey, hey Yellowton. Mm. Now, Rick, do me a favor. Please tell me what you're talking about. Oh, you aren't trying, Walt. All I said was that the corpse isn't a corpse yet and that it's a ghost because I don't know who's going to be the corpse. Rick, before I go stark raving mad, will you tell me what you're talking about? Well, a man came into my office this morning, said he was going to commit a murder. Threw a gun on me when I started to call you. Locked me in a closet. I broke out only to find he left this little man, big man, the midget who just ran out of here. Stop, please. So Helen came in. I turned the tables on big man. She left. I asked questions, drew a blank. Big man started to run. Why didn't you nab him? He ran through the door. I ran into it. You're up to date. <laughs> I'm up to date. Get him. I'm up to my ears in confusion. So we've got a man who's going to murder someone. All right, what's his name? He said Johns, but it's a phony. Initials on his briefcase read J.B. Uh, say, Shamus, what do you look like? Uh, Otis, do you have a son? Oh, you know I don't. Well, that's what he looked like. Rick, are you sure this J.B. is planning to kill someone tonight? Well, if he isn't, he sure took a lot of pains for nothing. Let's get down to headquarters. I want to check the files. Well, okay, but we don't keep files on ghosts. Oh, by the way, why did you come up here? Helen called. Said you were holding a pigeon for us. Oh, lovely girl. I'll say... Can I have a dance with her at the benefit tonight? Uh, no, Otis. I think I better fix you up with Francis. Swell. Otis, you gravelhead. Francis is a butler. Oh, it's all right, Lieutenant. I like them foreign dames. Well, that's all the pictures, Walt. I've looked them all. Johns doesn't have a record, and neither does a big man. Well, they wouldn't. The one time we get a chance to stop a murder before it's committed, and we've even got a good description of the potential killer. Well, this this J.B. was no bum. Not even an ordinary working man. His clothes are expensive, and the briefcase he carried probably cost more than your weekly salary. Now, it's an even bet he belongs to the social upper crust. That or close to it. Well, that would narrow the field a lot, but still... How I... about the newspapers, Walt? They have society reporters who know anyone who is anyone... It's a long shot, but name, name me a better. You can go through the newspaper logs. They might have a picture of Oh, something. no, no, Walt, no pictures. I'm nearly blind from looking at pictures now. Thanks, but I'll try the reporters with a description. It sounds like you're going to search for a needle in a haystack. Oh, Otis, please, your cliché is showing. Ah, uh, that's screwy. You can't kid me. Only dames wear clichés. How could mine be showing? Sergeant, when you die, will your brain to a clinic, maybe they'll discover a cure for it. Ah, lay off. Besides, I got a good idea for your investigation. I wouldn't miss hearing this for my next two issues of Batman. 
Yeah, I was thinking you could maybe save a lot of time if you got an artist to draw a picture from your description. They do it in all the movies and catch crooks easy. Otis, how would you like a transfer hey, to Walt. Staten? Wait a minute, wait a minute. He may have an idea. I know where there's an artist who could sketch J.B. from a description. It's crazy, but you may as well try it, Rick. Otis, you can drive him there. Uh, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, tell him yes, Walt. I can't stand to see him cry. All right, Otis, you can use the siren. <laughs> Come on, Otis, it's right at the head of the stairs. Who is this guy? Her uh, name's Vladimir, and be careful, he's temperamental. Oh, that's okay, I've been vaccinated. What, what, what? Open up, Vladimir. Runga dress, go away. My name Patrick O'Brien. It's Diamond, not the landlord. Comrade, come in. <gasps> Stalin. No, Vladimir, that's Sergeant Otis. Oh. What a startle he gave me. Uh, Vladimir, can you sketch a man's face from a description? Can I sketch a man's face from a description? Can I sketch? Did I not once sketch the whole Russian army? And with one pencil? Okay, Vladimir, but can you do it? Comrade, you doubt it? I am the greatest artist that's impossible. I can draw... Uh, Comrade, you are paying cash money. Cash money? Oh, for that I can draw you Siberia and never miss a salt mine. I'm such a genius, I can't stand myself. Another man, Vladimir. Can you sketch the man's face? I think so. Okay, but make it fast. I'll give you the general idea and correct you as you go. Corrections you can make. One criticism, I go back to my shave cream signs. Come with me to my hizzle. <laughs> Well, almost, Vladimir, but the nose still isn't quite right. Make it look a little more like a pickle. Sweet? Dill. Off that side, just a pinch. Oh, like this? Yeah, yeah, you've done it. That's him. Ah, how much do I owe you? For you, comrade, hundred dollars. What? Fifty dollars. A buck. S sell my genius for a buck? I die first. A buck and a quarter. Comrade, please, I'm a capitalist now. A buck and a half, last price. I wouldn't get... Last, pr last price, I take it. But I may die. If you do, give me a call. It's a good job, Vladimir. Of course. Was I not the artist to sketch the Tsar himself? Of course, it didn't pay so well, but it was great honor. Looks pretty fuzzy to me. Comrade Diamond, your patronage I appreciate. But if you must bring along this peasant, don't. Even his face makes me sick with the repulse. Uh, Otis, come on. You have to pardon him, Vladimir. Whenever his shoelaces come untied, his brains slip out. See you later. Oh, comrade. Uh, when we left Vladimir, I sent Otis back to Walt and took off for the newspapers. I showed the sketch to one society reporter after another and watched so many heads shake, my eyes began to cross. It was 6.30 when I finished playing Quizmaster, and there was no use kidding myself. I had struck out. I had to tell Walt, so I started for the 5th Precinct. I was at a point where I'd have hocked my social security for 30 seconds with a little big man. Then as I walked down the street, I suddenly felt the nerves in my spine jump down into the pit of my stomach, and goose pimples skidded up my back like scared rice. It was a feeling I'd had before. So without turning, I headed for the steps of a basement apartment. <laughs> Well, I got my meeting with Big Man all right. It came within inches of being a vamp into a Gabriel solo. Big Man apparently thought his shots hit pay dirt. But when I peeked over the top of the stairs, he was in his car and going. I took in the torn knees of my pants, said a few messages to the spirit world that would have barred me from any seance, and hauled what was left of the Diamond Detective Agency to see Walt Levinson. Well, you can have it, Walt. This is getting ridiculous. Beating my brains out, getting shot at, and for what? Shot at? That's right. I said shot at. You can have the whole stupid mess. I like to get fees for playing post office with slugs. And if a guy gets killed, call me. I'll help with the embalming. But, but... Oh, but nothing. 
It's 7 o'clock, and I'm not sticking around to split a three-way crying job over a killing that may already have happened. I'm going to Helen's and get a drink. Oh, all right. Go ahead, Rick. There's nothing more you can do anyhow. I'll see you later. All right. And you stop looking like a panda with a bellyache, Otis. No, what did I do? Oh, shut up. Uh, hey, where you going? I'm going out and punch the first little guy I can find right in the nose, just on general principles. I left the precinct and headed for Helen's party. I remembered that the benefit was being held in the penthouse and went on up. I was surprised to find Helen's butler, Francis, opening the door. Good evening, Mr. Depp. Oh, my, did you have an accident? This day has been an accident, Francis, but if you mean my clothes, I was playing spin the bottle with a bulldozer. You do look a little battered, if I may say so, sir. You ought to see the bulldozer. What are you doing opening the door up here? Oh, the Parker's butler was taken ill, sir. As I was helping Miss Asher with the decorations anyway, I remain to take his place for this evening. Is she here? Yes, yeah, yeah, she's in the living room, sir. Thanks, I'll go on in. Rick, over here. Hello, baby. What? Hit you a bus? Just a door and a sidewalk. The bus I get later. Oh, Rick. And just look at your suit. It's ruined. Now, what's with the concern over my suit? You lobbying for my tailor? I wanted you to look your very best tonight. Here, let me see those knees. Come on, sit over here. That's it. Now... Oh, well, they're not as bad as I thought. Oh, cheer up. Maybe they'll get infected. That'll help. Who did this to you, Rick? Our sweet little friend of this morning, Big Man, or I should say his boss, J.B. He's the one who sent Big Man after me. J.B.? A specter sent to haunt me for my past sins. He hired the little killer you saw me sock with my yo-yo. Your yo-yo? Oh, you haven't lost your yo-yo, have you? Oh, Helen, baby, your Ricky's nearly been killed. Must you worry about my yo-yo? I'm sorry, but it is all right. In my pocket, here. See? Good as new. Oh, that's fine. Now, what about this J.B. person? Why did he send Big Man to kill you, Rick? Because I know he's going to commit a murder tonight. Maybe doing it right now. Wait a minute. You said Big Man. Did you let him go this morning? Uh, yeah, yeah, I let him go. And I've worn my feet off up to my eyebrows trying to find out who his boss is and who's on the spot to get knocked off. Oh, poor Ricky. I wish I could help you. It's not me that needs help now. I quit. It's the guy J.B. is after. J.B., uh... Are those his real initials? Yeah. No, we've had lots of things to go on. Initials, descriptions, even a sketch of him. Here, I've got it in my pocket for all the good it did. No, wait, don't tear it up. Let me look at it. Oh, Rick, silly. This is no murderer. That's a sketch of Johnny Blackwell. It's a... Helen, you know who this man is? Of course. It's Johnny Blackwell from Newport. He and his wife are up here visiting Adam Worcester. Rick, what is it? You're... You're all turning blue. All day long, I... When you were in my office, you could... Oh, if I'd only asked Helen... Yes, Rick? Get me some cyanide, no water. Oh, but you must be mistaken about the sketch. Johnny Blackwell can't be a murderer. Well, I'm getting out of here. Where can I find him? If you'll just sit still, he'll come to you. Adam Wister's bringing him and his wife to the benefit tonight. <laughs> Well, that's the way the screwy world works sometimes. One minute you're on your uppers, with a stick of bologna, you're trying to hold off three guys with swords, then Kismet makes a switch and tags your side for a gain and you're living. I called Walt to pass on the good news, and in eight and a half minutes by the clock, he joined me with Sergeant Otis in the kitchen from where we could peek out at the growing crowd. Let me take a look, Rick. Has Blackwell come in yet? Oh, stay back. I'll let you know. Otis. Get out of that ice box. Oh, I'm hungry. You heard me. Oh, there's fried chicken, Lieutenant. Fried chicken? Oh, I haven't had... Oh, this. Oh. Walt, Walt, come take a look. There's Blackwell. Where? Over there, just sitting down. The man with the sandy hair. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Who are those people with him? Well, the woman must be his wife. Oh, but get a load of the little weasel. That's Big Man, the guy who got away from me this morning. Oh, and the other man? Must be Adam Wister. Helen said he was bringing the Blackwells. Well, he did, so now we wait for the play. Well, we waited and watched the Blackwell party settle down to enjoy itself. Big Man acted like he hadn't eaten for a week and made hors d'oeuvres vanish in his mouth like marbles down a manhole. 
After what seemed like weeks, the situation grew, suddenly took shape. On Blackwell's urging, Big Man rose to dance with Mrs. Blackwell. Mrs. Blackwell was a dark-haired honey with curves right out of one of my better dreams. But my mind was on her husband and Worcester. As soon as they had the chance, they got up and headed out of the room. Watch them, Rick. They're headed for the library. Come on, this way. Through this door and down the hall. Well, Adam, it's nice to be visiting you again. Oh, glad to have you, Johnny. We're sorry to hear about your losses in the market last year. The story here was that you were cleaned out. Hey, Diamond, what's he saying? Shut up, old Oh, I still have a little money, Adam. In fact, I'd like to buy back in with you as a partner. <laughs> you don't have that much, Johnny. And your wife won't give it to you. She may, Adam. She may, and quicker than you think. Walt, come on. We picked no, the wrong let's victim. Let's find the big man. Hey, it's nice on the terrace, Mrs. Blackwell. Yeah, real nice out here. I don't like it. It's chilly. Oh, it'll warm up, Mrs. Blackwell. No, I'm going back in. Better not. I don't like the way you're acting, big man. Get out of my way. Get back and shut up. How dare you talk to me like that, you little... Now I'm big, Mrs. Blackwell, real big. <gasps> A gun? What in the world? I'm gonna kill you. Kill me? Yeah. Only it'll look like an accident. Why, this is ridiculous. What kind of a joke is this? <laughs> it's no joke, Mrs. Blackwell. Your husband don't think it's no joke. He wanted me to tell you he was real sorry. Now I'm going to kill you. You mean it. You really mean it. Yeah, sure, Mrs. Blackwell. Mr. <gasps> Blackwell needs your dough. Bad. Back up. He can have it, all of it. Only don't kill me. Don't. Sorry, Mrs. Blackwell. Too no. late. Now start back. Please, please. Over to that wall. You're going to play Humpty Dumpty. Oh. That's right. Now oh, get up no, on the wall. No. I'm a guy who's willing to help you. Me too. Diamond, why you... Catch the girl, Walt. Big right. man's mine. He, he was going to kill me. All right, Mrs. Blackwell. Take her inside, Otis. Rick, you okay? Yeah, getting my hands on this little rat was better than a year's vacation. Well, we sure heard enough to give both him and Blackwell a long vacation on the state. Keep him on ice. I'll collect the other one. I'll be delighted. Uh, oh, my jaw. Oh, waking up... Uh, what a shame. <laughs> what a lovely party. I do love these informal get-togethers, don't you, big man? Oh. It was short but very sweet, the wind-up of the no-one-was-murdered case. The score was the kind to make you forget you didn't get a fee. Two killers caught, no victims. When I saw Walt take the little big man, not so big without his gun, and his boss Blackwell off to the Bastille, my worries melted like a snowman in a blast furnace. And speaking of melting, the lovely Mrs. Blackwell showed signs of being upset. So, what could I do but console the pretty little thing? Oh, Mr. Diamond, I think you were so wonderful and brave. Oh, you show a few nice points yourself, Mrs. Blackwell, and call me Rick. You saved my life, Rick. And call me Rita. You can get to the point quick. Why, Rita? Oh, there you are, Mrs. Blackwell. I know you must be terribly upset. Well, Rick has been a great comfort to me. I'll bet he has. But I've arranged for Francis to take you home. Uh, now. Now? Oh, well, thank you, Miss Asher. And Rick. Yes? Don't worry about the name calling. Just say, hey, you. I'll know what you mean. I think I know what you mean. By you. Well? So help me, I'm innocent. With lipstick on your collar? That Otis. I've warned him to be careful with my shirts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, time for my yo-yo act? Your act. I... Oh, Rick, uh, about that... No, no, no. Look, I've worked my finger to the bone practicing. Don't tell me. Why, well, you specifically asked me to be here tonight. I, I know. And come on with me over to the bandstand. Oh, no. No, you don't. I'm an artist tonight, not a singer. No sing, no yo-yo. You mean if I sing, I can do my yo-yo act? If you make it pretty. Uh, it's blackmail, but I'll do it. Well, you stay right here. I want to talk to the orchestra leader. Okay, I'll practice. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Richard Diamond, his piano, and his yo-yo. <laughs> Sing good, Rick. Like a robin with a sponsor. Are the stars out tonight? I don't know if it's cloudy or bright 
Cause I only have eyes for you, dear. The moon may be high, but I can't see a thing in the sky. Cause I only have eyes for you. I don't know if we're in a garden Or on a crowded avenue You are here, so am I Maybe millions of people go by But they all disappear from view And I only have eyes for you. And now Mr. Diamond will present an exhibition of dexterity. Now? Now. Oh, no, Shamus, no. You're doing it all wrong. You gotta use my wrist action. Oh, the start of the act. Oh, come on, let me show you. Here, give it to me. Now you you start it down like this. <laughs> Ellen. Yes, Rick. He's better. Uh, let's go home and Nick. Wait till I get my hat. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Hans Conried, Grace Albertson, Sidney Miller, and High Everback. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions of the program were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. <coughs> now this is Tal Avery inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday night is packed with entertainment when you stay tuned for NBC's star lineup of shows. There's always a program of interest on NBC. Now stay tuned for Edward G. Robinson and the Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. Well, it's Christmas Eve. And every year about this time, my business takes a big nosedive. People usually pack up their troubles and start unpacking colored lights and Christmas tree ornaments. So tonight, instead of telling you about one of my hair-raising exploits, we're going to tell you a Christmas story. So with apologies to Mr. Charles Dickens... We'd like to bring you an adaptation of one of his most famous stories, The Christmas Carol. Now, I'd uh, better explain something first. This version isn't exactly the way you've heard it many times before, because the particular type of characters I usually get mixed up with, this story is written to fit their talents and characteristics. Different from the Dickens original, certainly, but we feel that this story could easily happen today, anywhere. Like maybe right here in New York, on a little side street just off the Bowery. So now I'd like to introduce our characters. Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge will be played by my good friend and guiding hand of the 5th Precinct Homicide Division. Lieutenant Walter Levinson. Walter? Oh, yes. The character of Jacob Marley will be played by one of my dearest friends and constant companions. 
Otis, that's you. Yeah. Oh, uh, Sergeant Otis Loveloon. Loveloon. <laughs> Watch. Oh, uh, sorry, Helen. <laughs> uh, Tiny Tim will be played by our corner newsboy. Johnny Rollins. Uh, Tiny Tim's mother will be played by my red-headed gal friend. Helen Asher. The rest of the characters will be played by members of the 5th Precinct Police Station. Officer O'Reilly. Officer Lund. Officer Lefkowitz. Sergeant Miller. Oh. <laughs> the music will be furnished by the 5th Precinct Police Band, directed by Patrolman Worth. And now, our version of the Christmas classic, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Once upon a time, there was a nasty old guy named Ebenezer Scrooge. He was nasty, all right. He didn't like anything, except maybe all the dough he could get his hands on. Scrooge had a little business that he started with his partner, Jacob Marley. The outfit was known as Scrooge and Marley Loan Company. But one day, poor old Marley just up and keeled over. So the boys along the big street gave him a nice funeral, and old Scrooge took over the business. Well, Marley had been dead for seven years, and Scrooge lived alone in his little room over the office. And for a hobby, he hated everybody. He had a young guy working for him by the name of Bob Cratchit. Bob had a wife and four kids and made just enough to make ends meet. Scrooge used to ride him all the time. When it got so cold the polar bears complained, Cratchit would turn on the little heater. And Scrooge would say, Cratchit, what do you think you're doing? Turn on the heat, that's what I'm doing. My fingers look like popsicles. Well, I don't care if they come in six delicious flavors. Every time you turn on that heater, it costs me money. Business is not good, so get back to your work and turn off the heat. Oh, now look, Mr. Scrooge, I'm freezing. Now, this pen ain't guaranteed to write under ice. I tell you once more, get back to your work. Okay, Mr. Scrooge. I don't know why you worry about business. Why not just put up a sign, turn the joint into a skating rink? Well, this was no time for any decent guy to act like that. It was Christmas Eve. Along about five o'clock into the office came Scrooge's nephew, Fred. Well, Merry Christmas, Bob. Oh, Merry Christmas, Fred. You get back to your work, Cratchit. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Oh, swell. Merry Christmas. Uh, humbug. Humbug? Yeah, humbug. My old man didn't like Christmas, and that's what he used to say. Humbug. Okay, humbug. But it's still Christmas, and I don't see where you get off not liking it. This is supposed to be the time everybody gets with it. Everything stops. That ain't much good, and you put your arm around the next guy, you tell him Merry Christmas. I'll put my arm around you with a hammer on the end of it if you don't lay off that goodwill stuff. Look, what's with you? What have you got against Christmas? You show me a way to make a hundred bucks every Christmas, and I'll fall in love with it. Every time the holidays roll around, nobody pays their bills, and they all run around like they own the Chrysler building. Look at you. Sixty bucks a week and you're coming on like Rockefeller. Well, sure, I make a lousy sixty bucks, but it ain't easy. But once a year, something happens with everybody in this big world. Well, nearly everybody. <sighs> because this is a day that somebody else started to make things right for us. And he had a really tough time doing it. It's more than just remembering. It, it, it's feeling. It, it's all around you. Christmas has got to be merry. Don't you get it? You want me to be merry? Well, sure. Then go get some of these joyous clients of mine to pay off their loans. The missus asked me to invite you over for dinner tomorrow. Now, don't hold your breath. Okay. Merry Christmas, Bob. Merry Christmas, Fred. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Uh, humbug. Late that evening, Scrooge went upstairs to his room, the room where Jacob Marley used to stay. It was dark in the little hall, and when Scrooge reached for the door... He looked up at the big brass knocker and saw... <gasps> Holy cow! I could have sworn that was old Jake's face in the knocker. I must be working too hard. So in he went. A little shaky after seeing Jake Marley's face, but he just passed it off his nerves. He closed the door and locked it, then went over and sat down in front of the fireplace. He got a fire going and started to relax. But every tile around the fireplace started looking like Jake Marley's face. Oh. Now, come on, Abe, old boy. You've got to get hold of yourself. This is ridiculous. And I haven't touched a drop in weeks. He got up and walked around the room a few times and went back and sat on again. He stretched, rested his head on the back of the chair. 
From somewhere, a bell started chiming, and Scrooge sat straight up in his chair. He heard something else, too. Something from downstairs. What the... Oh, now, what is that? What's going on? Who's that? Come on, who's out there? Then all of a sudden, it came right through the wall. Marley! Jake, Marley. Oh, no, no. I I got to stop eating lobster. Oh, it couldn't be. Hey, what's with you? Who are you? Jake Marley. Who else? You're dead. The deadest. But nevertheless, Jake Marley. His ghost. You are very sharp today, Scrooge, old boy. I don't believe it. You got eyes, ain't you? Yeah, and I got a bad stomach, too. That's who you are. Nothing but a bad case of indigestion. You don't think I'm a ghost, huh? Okay, maybe a good scare will change your mind. Oh, no, 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 no. Stay away from me, I believe you. Sold on the idea? Yeah, yeah, but why do you got to come to see me? Regulations. Every man is supposed to live his life and help his buddies. If he don't do it while he's alive, then he's got to do it after he kicks off. Oh. Now, stop that. Hey, what's with all those chains and things you got wrapped around you? Oh, these? Well, this here chain is like my life. Each one of these links is something I did wrong. But why do you have to hold it around with you? Why don't you check it someplace? Screw Joe boy. When we was in business together, I never took time out to do any good. I just kept making a buck and figured that was enough. Well, now I got to pay for it. I got to haul this chain around and try to make up for all the things I didn't do when I was alive. But why come to me? Because you're going to end up just like me unless we do something in a hurry. Now, I haven't got much time, so you better listen. No, I don't want to be like you. I'll listen. Okay. You're going to have three visitors. You're going to be haunted by three spirits. Oh, no. It's the only way you can keep from being like me. When you hear that bell strike one, the first one will be here. Well, I got to be going. You won't see me again, but you remember what I told you. So long, Scrooge, old boy. Your goosebumps can relax now. After the ghost took off, Scrooge just refused to believe it. Ah, nuts. It's ridiculous. Humbug. Then he climbed into the sack and was soon snoring up a storm. When Scrooge awoke, it was still dark, and the bell from the church on 53rd Street was striking 12. He laid awake listening and thinking to himself. Just a dream. Ghosts. Bah. Finally, he dropped off again and slept for about an hour. Then the big bell struck one. One o'clock and I don't see no ghost. I knew it was something I ate. All of a sudden, a big light flashed in the room. The first of the spirits stood before him. Oh, Jake was right. Are you the first spirit that Jake said would come to haunt me? Yeah, you know it. Well, who are you? Me? I'm the ghost of Christmas past. Yeah? How long past? Your past. Come on, we're going to take a walk. Where are we going? Just relax. I'm running this tour. Oh, well, let me get my pants. Uh, you got them. Hey, they're on me. With that, the ghost of Christmas past grabbed Scrooge by the hand and they both flew out of the window. Scrooge nearly lost his upper plate. But before he could yell for help, he was standing in front of a dirty, ramshackle old tenement building. You uh, know where you are? Sure, I know where I am. This is where I was brought up. Even the garbage cans are the same. You had a pretty tough time when you were a kid, didn't you? The toughest. I wasn't very big, and the rest of the kids in the neighborhood were. I had more black eyes than a crow. You want to go in? What for? To see your folks. My folks died a long time ago. They're in there now. Come on. Well, the ghost took old Scrooge into the building and showed him a Christmas years past when he was a child with his family. Sure, it was tough living in two little rooms like that, but Scrooge remembered how wonderful it really was. (laughs) What's the matter, Scrooge? Huh? Oh, I got something in my eye. You were pretty lonely when your folks... uh, When they... Yeah. 
You know, there was a young kid that came around earlier this evening and sang some carols. I wish... Yeah, uh, what do you wish? Oh, nothing. Come on. I want to show you another Christmas. The spirit showed him another Christmas and still another. And you know, no matter how tough Scrooge remembered his childhood had been, it always seemed that Christmas was wonderful. Then the spirit took him to a building down to the river where Scrooge got his first job. He went inside and seated behind a desk, Scrooge spotted Fezziwig. Well, I'll be darned. It's old Fezziwig alive again. And there's Dick Wilkins. He was a good boy. We got along great. He liked me. Okay, everybody, it's Christmas Eve. You can knock off and have yourself a good time. You better lock up, Dick. Sure, right away, Mr. Fezziwig. Yeah, and don't look so unhappy, Ebenezer. It's Christmas. Come on home with me and tear into a big turkey. All locked up, Dick? Yes, sir. Ready, Ebenezer? Yes, sir. Okay, let's go and have Merry Christmas, you two. Yeah. Merry Christmas, Merry Mr. Christmas, Fezziwig. Mr. Fezziwig. Merry Christmas. Then the spirit took Scrooge over to Fezziwig's house and they saw the wonderful party that Mrs. Fezziwig had gotten together. Scrooge watched and remembered and the spirit said, Wasn't Fezziwig a stupid, sentimental old goat? Oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you something. He was a great guy, he was. You know... What, Scrooge? I was just thinking about Bob Cratchit, who works for me. I think I'd like to do something for him. You know he's got a wife and four kids... Is that right? Yeah, four kids. Come on, I've seen enough. Okay, but you've got to see these things if you want to get squared away. And believe me, brother, you need squaring away. Let's go home, Scrooge. Before he knew it, Scrooge was back in his little room and the spirit was gone. Scrooge was pretty beat and he climbed into bed and dropped into a heavy sleep. <laughs> What's that? It's two o'clock. Hey, that light in the other room. I got burglars. Hey, Scrooge. Scrooge, come on in. Who's that? What are you doing in the other room? Come on in. Take a look. It's pretty nifty. Hey, what is this? What have you done to the room? It looks like Macy's window. Where'd you get all the holly and the mistletoe? And how'd you get it in here? You like it? Oh, for Pete's sake, a Christmas tree. Who are you? The ghost of Christmas present. Now, don't tell me you don't like the way I fix things up. I work pretty hard. Oh, the second ghost. Okay, take me wherever you want to go, but believe me, the next time I try the train. Come on, let's go. Now, what do you see? Oh, I see bright colored lights. People having a lot of fun. Kids on sleighs. See that building over there? The one with the big wreath on the front door? I got 2020. That's where Bob Cratchit lives. He works for me. Hey, look. There's Bob now. Yes, going into the house. Up all those stairs to the fifth floor. And he's got his little boy on his back. Tiny Tim. Yeah. Got polio last summer. Pretty sick little boy. I know. Bob said he'd need a lot of care if he was ever going to walk again. Let's take a peek. Hi. Hello, honey. You and Tim have a good time? Best. Didn't we, Tim? Yeah, Dad. We watched all the kids on the block on their sleds. Mom, will I ever be able to ride a sled? Of course, Tim. Won't he, dear? Sure thing, Roughneck. Next Christmas, you'll be out there doing belly whoppers with the rest of them. Dad, what's the matter? Your eyes are all wet. Oh, nothing, Tim. I just got some snow in them. Want some dinner, Tim? Oh, Mom, stew for Christmas. I'm sorry, Tim. Oh, that's okay, Mom. I like stew. Bob, will you please say grace? Can I say something first, Mom? Of course, Tim. What would you like to say? God bless us. Everyone. What's the matter, Scrooge, old boy? Got some snow in your eyes, too? Tell me something. Well, sure, if I can. What about Tiny Tim? Oh, can't say for sure. But if his old man makes enough money next year to get the right doctors, little Tim will get along just fine. But times are tough. 
Aren't they Scrooge? Yeah. Now the spirit of Christmas present took Scrooge to many places and showed him a lot of happiness and a lot of misery. And finally, back to his little room, and the spirit was gone. Oh, I don't know whether I can take much more of this. Then the new ghost drifted in. This was the worst yet. He was really done up for haunting. He was all dressed in black with one arm sticking out and pointing right at poor old Scrooge. This was the last one of the spirits. Scrooge's knees sounded like castanets on a reducing machine. Okay, okay, you don't have to tell me. You're the ghost of the Christmas that hasn't come yet. You I'm really scared of. The ghost took off of Scrooge right after him. The city disappeared and Scrooge found himself in the outskirts of town standing in the graveyard. The night was howling like it was mad. And as Scrooge looked down, he saw... Hey, what's this? What's this stone? The black spirit stood still and pointed, so Scrooge leaned down and pulled away the bushes and saw it was a tombstone. Now, there's a name here. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, no, no. Look, not this. Believe me, I don't want this. I know I've done wrong, but I'm not kidding. I really know what Christmas means. It doesn't mean just today or tomorrow. It's every day, every day of your life. I swear I'll do better. Only take me away from this. Let me try. Let me try to make Christmas right for me and everybody else. Please don't let this happen. Give me another chance. Well, don't just stand there. Put your arm back in. You'll catch cold. Well, say something. Suddenly, Scrooge dropped to his knees and reached out for the spirit. But something happened. The spirit started to shrink. Then it collapsed. And when Scrooge looked up... What the... Uh, my bedpost. My own bedpost. I'm home. Oh, thank goodness. I lived the past and the present and the future, and now I'm home. Hallelujah. Spirits, wherever you are, believe me. From now on, things are going to be different. Oh, yeah. And thanks. Paper! Hey, boy. Yeah? What day is this? It's Christmas. What's with you? Christmas? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I haven't missed it. The spooks did it all in one night. Boy. Yeah? Oh, it's you, Mr. Scrooge. How many papers have you got? I don't know. One. Well, here's five bucks. Throw them away and go have yourself a Merry Christmas. Gee, thanks, Mr. Scrooge. And a Merry Christmas to you. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, boy, say that again. Thanks? No, 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 the other. Yeah, that's it. Merry Christmas. Okay, okay, I'm coming. What's the matter with you? Can't you see the store's closed? Look, mister, this is... Eb. Ebenezer Scrooge. Merry Christmas, Barney. Huh? Hey, you been drinking? Not a drop. Well, what's the matter with you? Ain't you gonna wish me a Merry Christmas? Oh, oh, sure, sure. Come on in. Uh, wife's upstairs with her mother, but I got a bottle in the back. I think maybe you better have some, something, something strong. Uh, look, your grocery store's closed, but you could still sell me a turkey, couldn't you? Well, I don't know. Well, you got a couple? They'll just go to waste. Uh, what do you want a turkey for? You've been eating at the automat every Christmas for the last seven years. Oh, it's not for me. But nevertheless, I have been invited to my nephew Fred's house for a Christmas dinner. Well, then who's the bird for? Bob Cratchit. You know, the young guy that works for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. How much are you going to charge him? Here's 20 bucks. That ought to be enough for the bird. No, no, no. It ain't worth that much. Are you sure you ain't been into something? Well, if it's too much, give the rest to your kid and have him deliver the turkey to Cratchit's house. Huh? Here's the address, and don't tell Cratchit who sent the thing. Okay? Okay. Merry Christmas, Barney. Y- yeah. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Well, old Scrooge went back to his rooms and took, an out, took out an old blue suit out of the mothball. He shook it out, put a few creases in it, and went out into the street. The old boy was really with it. Everybody he passed, he greeted them with, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Eh? Oh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Scrooge went to church and gave a large donation, and Father McCarthy nearly forgot his sermon. 
And then Scrooge went out on the street again and down into the Bowery. Oh, God bless you, sir, and a Merry Christmas. Isn't it, though? He kept walking and having a great time. Later that afternoon, he arrived at his nephew's house. Well, what the... Merry Christmas, Fred. I've come to dinner. Oh, my gosh. Here, I brought you some presents. Oh, my gosh. Now, don't thank me. It's Christmas, remember? Oh, my gosh! Next morning, Scrooge was early at the office. If he could just catch Cratchit coming in late. And he did. Bob was a good 21 minutes late. Cratchit? Oh, no. You're 21 minutes late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Scrooge. I had a big evening last night. You did, huh? You know what I told you if I caught you fancy footing it in here late again. Okay, so I'm canned. You think you got it coming? Oh, I'm too tired to argue, Mr. Scrooge. Jobs are tough enough, and I hate to lose this one, but I'm just too tired. A uh, raise would help, huh? That's the silliest question of the year. Then you got it. It's in that envelope. What? what? Yeah. And maybe after we see how the funds are, we can do something about Tiny Tim. I I don't get it. A a raise? You want to do something about Tim? I I don't get it. Sure you do, Bob. Haven't you heard? It's Christmas. Now, go on home. Take the day off. Take the week off. Come back when you feel like it. Merry Christmas. Uh, Mr. Scrooge? Yeah? Merry Christmas. And Scrooge really did it. He was as good as his word, better even. He made it the merriest Christmas ever. And later, things got better, and he took care of Tiny Tim. And sure enough, Tim was out on his sled the next Christmas, doing belly whoppers with the best of them. Every Christmas thereafter, all along the big street, it was said, if anyone knew how to make Christmas merry, old Ebenezer Scrooge was that one. And I hope that can really be said about all of us, just like Tiny Tim said. God bless us. Everyone. That's right, Tim. God bless us. Everyone. Merry Christmas. God bless everyone. Oh, Rick. Yes, Helen? That was wonderful. Not quite the way Dickens wrote it, but it meant the same thing. Oh, you really like it, baby? Oh, I loved it. No reason in the world why old Scrooge couldn't have been living right here today. You've got the spirit, and that's what counts. How did you like it, Walt? Rick, I got to hand it to you. It was really great. Uh, Lieutenant. Yeah, what is it, Otis? Uh, how'd I do in the play? You were magnificent, Sergeant. Y- you know, I bet if I studied for a couple of weeks, I'd get me a part on Broadway. To be or not to be? That's the question. Oh, no. Now, Walt, leave him alone. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, Monsieur Otis. Huh? Wouldst thou accompany me over to the punch bowl for a short flagon of nectar? Sure, I wouldst. See you later, Helen. Rick? Yeah. Come on, Barrymore. Let's see if the punch bowl fits your head. <laughs> oh, aren't they lovely? You want something to eat? Uh, hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Listen. They're out here by this window. Come on, let's go listen. Oh, wasn't that wonderful, Rick? Oh, it sure was. Rick, sing something with them. Oh, no, honey. I don't want to loss up the air. Please, oh, Rick. Come on. Come on. All right, all right. I, I tell you what I'll do. Everybody usually sings Christmas songs about snow. I'm going to sing one about sunshine. It's called Melikalikimaka. Melikalikimaka? Well, it means Merry Christmas in Hawaiian. In Hawaiian? Sure. It's a brand new song. They love it over there, and we'll love it here. Melikalikimaka is the thing to say. And how holy maka hee ho That's our Christmas greeting in a vahine And a happy new year too With the hope 
that Christmas may be green and bright The sun to shine by day and all the stars that night Meli Kaliki Maka is Hawaii's way To say Merry Christmas to you Christmas to everybody. Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, radio station WBRE today is celebrating its silver anniversary of serving the people of the coal country with better programming. From all of us in Hollywood, congratulations to NBC affiliate WBRE on 25 years of broadcasting and best wishes for another 25. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective, will return to the air at a new day and time, Sunday, January 15th. Till then, this is Eddie King relaying our best wishes for the holiday season. Now hear Home for Christmas and Hop Along Cassidy on NBC. Portions of the following program are transcribed. As Richard Diamond, private detective. Is uh, this the Diamond Detective Agency? Well, what does the sign on the door say? Yeah, uh, Diamond Detective Agency. And take a guess. Uh, are you Mr. Richard Diamond? It depends. How much does he owe you? Uh, uh, nothing. You just want to speak to him? I do. You come as a client? Yes, I do. You have a hundred a day in expenses? Yeah, I do. Then I now pronounce this man and client. Your name, please? Uh, my, my name is Thomas Jason. The stockbroker? Well, you better pay cash. Oh, I, I'm retired now, Mr. Diamond. And to end this uh, nonsense, here's your hundred dollars. Oh, thank you. Now, what's your trouble? Uh, it's Carol, uh, my adopted daughter. We adopted her when she was 12, but my wife died shortly after. Frankly... Carol has been trouble ever since. And now? Uh, now, I- I'm afraid it is no longer a matter of delinquency. I, uh, well, there have been several incidents that make me suspect that she's trying to do away with me. Oh, sweet girl. What's her reason? Uh, my money. In my will, she is my only heir. Why not change the will? Uh, I said I suspected her, but I'm not certain, Mr. Diamond. And you understand, it would be terrible to disinherit her if I am wrong about my suspicions. I, I, I simply must be sure before I change my will. Do you have any idea of your suspicion? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. This morning I did speak to her. They mentioned the possibility of cutting her from my will. She flew into a rage, made several terrible threats. Oh, what do you want me to do? Well, sir, I want you to... Oh, excuse me. 
Diamond Detective Agency, we have the only corpse with a lie-down design. Oh, Rick, why don't you answer the phone right? Okay, Helen, baby. Diamond Detective Agency, Mr. Richard Diamond speaking. What? See, it throws you. Uh, uh, Mr. Diamond. Uh, honey, I'll see you tonight. I got a client. She? He. Good. Bye. Uh, you were saying, Mr. Jason, before I was so nicely interrupted... Yes, I, I want you to either prove my fears to be true or groundless. If I am right, I will change my will, of course. Where do I start? Uh, come to my house at three this afternoon. Here's the address. I'll introduce you to my stepdaughter, Carol, as a business acquaintance. After you've met and talked with her, I'll give you what details I have about her threats and actions. Okay, Mr. Jason, I'll be at your place at three this afternoon. Uh, good day, Mr. Diamond. I checked the time and found it to be nearly 12, so I beat it out to grab a bite of food before the noon rush began. Cafes in downtown Manhattan at lunchtime can only be compared to a can of sardines after all their relatives move in. When I had downed my daily bread, I went back to the office, did a little washing, and found myself with still time to kill. So being interested in my new client's problems and always liking a clear view of a new case, I dropped in at the 5th Precinct to see what Lieutenant Levison had on the Jason family. When I walked into the squad room, I found Sergeant Otis tilted back in his chair with his number 14s crossed on the desk in front of him. From the sounds he was making, he was either sleeping or gargling with molasses. Sergeant Otis. Oh, boy. Sergeant Otis. Some time. Otis, wake up. Oh, I... Oh, oh. Oh, it's you, Silence. Patrol leader Diamond with his stout-hearted brownies who were shocked by your dreams. Shame on you. Hey, how'd you know I was dreaming about a dame? I peeked. You know, I think I'll tell the lieutenant that you were sleeping on the job. Well, oh, oh, no, please don't do that, Shamus. You start me pounding the beat again. Please don't tell him. Well, maybe I'll let you off the hook, but only if you tell Walt we're pals. That might stop him from giving me the devil about ribbing you. Pals? You mean Friends? But he's... Oh, no, I couldn't stand it. Hello, Walt. Okay, so where's the body? Nobody. You lost one? Now you stop that. Well, get you. All bad because I can't find a body for you. Oh, please, Rick. What do you want? I just wanted any dope you might have on the Thomas Jason family. Jason? Yeah, the broker. Oh, oh nothing on him, but plenty on his stepdaughter, Carol. Like what? Oh, she's a regular. Usually D&D, drunk driving, disturbing the peace. You want to see the file? Yeah, I might be worth a look. Uh, have my pal Otis bring it in. Sure, up. I... You what? My pal. What did you know? Otis and I are friends. <laughs> Is that why he tries to hide under the desk every time he sees you coming? Call him in. See for yourself. You think I won't? Otis, get the file on Carol Jason. Bring it in here. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. <laughs> now we'll see. Friend, <laughs> that's a laugh. <laughs> that's a laugh yourself. You better be feeling good. Yeah, what do you mean by that? You'll see. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant, here's the file. I'll take uh, it, Otis. Thank you very much. Sergeant Otis, you have an opportunity to do me a great favor. Please, and without profanity, tell me what you think of Rick. Oh, he's nice. What? You're turning blue, Walt. I'll turn blue if I want to. What did you do to Otis? Dope him? You heard him. He thinks I'm nice. We're pals, buddies. I heard him all right, but I wouldn't believe it on the stack of police manuals. Otis... I'll give you one chance. What's this all about? The shamus told you, Lieutenant. I think he's a swell egg. A great guy. Thank you, Otis, my uh, friend. Always kidding, but a good pal. Otis, do your feet ache? My feet? Why, no, Lieutenant. Well, they will. I'm sending you to a beat. A beat? Yes, and Yonkers. Oh, no! <laughs> I went through the file on Carol Jason and found out Walt hadn't been kidding. She'd been picked up for everything from kicking dogs to slugging her boyfriend with a champagne bottle. Real nice girl. I left Walt trying to third degree the truth out of Otis and headed for what I hoped would be a nice easy case. In a few minutes, I was in front of my client, Jason's house on East 66th Street. It turned out to be a modest little shack of some 30 rooms with a brownstone cover. I was ushered in to wait in the library for Thomas Jason. But I got a surprise. Mr. Diamond? Well, now I'll bet you're Carol. Your stepfather's told me so much about you. You're a friend of my stepfather's? Well, uh, you might say we have things in common. Where is he? 
I'm afraid you can't see him, Mr. Diamond. You see, he's become quite ill. Oh, ill so quickly? I talked to him a few hours ago. He's about as sickly as Paul Bunyan. Mr. Diamond, will you please leave? Not until you tell me what happened to Jason, where he is, and why I can't see him. Get out. Do you hear me? Get out. Oh, put a cork in it, honey. Your father suspected trouble. Apparently, it came quicker than he thought. Me, I want to know all your little secrets. Just who are you? Policeman? Private policeman, dear. Your father hired me this morning. Well, I'm firing you this afternoon. Father's ill, and I will not allow him to be disturbed. He paid me for a day's work. Tomorrow you can fire me. Is he here? No. Now, will you get out, or do I call the real police? No, oh, maybe you'd better, dear. There's a smell around here that isn't a room full of roses. Oh, all right. If it's going to save trouble, I will tell you this much. Father had a serious mental condition. This afternoon, a couple of hours ago, he had an attack. And I was forced to have him taken to a place where he could be treated properly. With what? Embalming fluid? Why, you insulting... Where was he taken? Who's the doctor? I think I've answered all the questions I need to, Mr. Diamond. My actions are entirely legal. If you persist in your insinuations, I shall see that your license is revoked and that you are charged with defamation of character. Oh, get you. You've been reading up on the law, and I bet I know why. All right, dear. I'll leave now. Go on, and don't come back. Temper, temper, temper. I'm going, but we'll see each other again. Uh, hello, Pop. Got a minute? Yeah. You reckon so, Misty? What's on your mind? Oh, questions. Like how long you've been out here mowing the lawn? Uh, most of the day. Why? Did you, uh, see Mr. Jason leave? Oh, sure. Left in an ambulance, he did. He was wearing a funny white coat with the arms tied in back. Oh, my fashion certainly changed. You didn't notice any name on the ambulance, did you? Well, as a matter of fact, I did, mister. Oh, my, it was a silly name. About the silliest I've ever heard of. Oh, the name, Pop. What was it? Oh, don't be in such a dang rush. It was uh, Home Sweet Home Rest Home. Oh, no. Ain't that silly? I don't think my client agrees with you. If he was taken there for a rest, it may be a permanent one. Next stop, a drugstore with a phone book. Said book gave me the address, and I was soon in Baychester, looking at something pretty swank in the way of nuthouses. Home Sweet Home was two acres of lawn, trees, and a square white blockhouse, and all surrounded by 15 feet of spiked steel fencing. By this time, the setup was really beginning to smell, and I decided that maybe a shamus might not be welcome. So for a moment, I stood by the big gate debating how I could get in. The answer was fairly simple. I rang the bell. It caused a huge character wearing a white jacket with arms like hairy telephone poles to appear. Yeah... What can I do for you, mister? Now, let me in. Why? This is a rest home, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I want to rest. Oh, funny. Beat it. I want to speak to the doctor, King Kong. Is he in? Maybe, maybe not. Who wants him? I do. Who are you? Uh, let's just say I'm a patient. You going to keep me out here dying of schizophrenia? Dr. Thorne is busy now. Come back later. Look, in one minute I start throwing fits. Think how that'll ruin your trade. Yeah, the doc wouldn't like that. Maybe you had better come in. Now, that's right neighborly of your friend. Wow. Nice place. For nuts? Please. I'm a patient, remember? So, if you're a nut, I should care. If you ain't, why should you? Now, that's a homely bit of philosophy. Tell me, what do you do here, break skulls? I don't think I like you. And I'm a nurse. What a shock this will be to Dr. Kildare. I don't know him. Now, you wouldn't. His nurses are pretty. If he had to have you as a nurse, he'd quit medicine and take up playing the glockenspiel. Well, you're nuts. Wait here. I'll get the doctor. Yes, nurse. Dr. Thorne, you got a patient, I think. All right, Brasso. I am Dr. Thorne, sir. What can I do for you? He's nuts, Doc. Be quiet, Brasso. Oh, he's right, Doc. I, I'm nuttier than a squirrel's hideout. Well, I'm afraid I can be of no assistance, uh, Mr. Promise you won't tell? Is I promise? I am Sherlock Holmes. What? H O L. I can spell. 
I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place, Mr. Holmes. This is a private sanitarium, and certain procedures must be followed. I have money, I can pay, and I want to stay here. But, Mr. Holmes, you must be examined by a doctor and committed by a relative. You're a doctor? Examine me. But your relatives, you, you can't commit yourself. Why not? I demand my rights. Oh, this is preposterous. This is not a hotel. You can't just come in and register. Tell me, you know, who's your doctor? Where is your home? Well, look, look. I'll tell you what. You let me stay here for the day, and I'll tell you who my doctor is. And if you don't let me stay, I'll tell everyone what a bad place you have. Uh, you, uh, you said something about having um, money. Just how much money? I've got a mattress full. Can I stay? Well, perhaps it can be arranged. Though, of course, I must examine you. Of course. And there will be a certain um, fee, you understand? Mm, I'm beginning to. Tell me, Mr... Um, H-O-L. Uh, stop! Mm, you certainly are most annoying. Tell me, why do you want to stay here anyway? Well, I, I've got to stop the plot. The, the plot? You know about that? Sure. You plan to rub out fearless Fosdick, but I'm not going to let you. Oh, I see. Tell me, do you, uh, do you have any dreams? Well, of course. I have dreams about eating ice cream cones, and oh, what a mess they are. What's so messy about eating an ice cream cone? My mouth is always filled with BBs. BBs? For my air rifle, stupid. How else could I stand off the Indians? Well, what Indians? Well, the Indians who want to steal my ice cream cones. Now, why would Indians want your ice cream cones? Oh, they're mad about pistachio. You are crazy, aren't you? Brazo, take Mr... Um... H-O-L. Oh, never mind. Take him to observation room B, Brazo. I don't have time for the examination now. Uh, wait, uh, can't I be with the other patients? I get lonely. Later, later. Come on, Sherlock. This way. <laughs> Well, I was in, thanks to the good doctor not being able to pass up a possible easy buck. The big ape Brazo led me to a small room with bars on the window and a spring lock on the door. When he left, I made like a smart gum shoe and went after the lock with my penknife. Due to my early training in picking locks at the automat, I was out like Alabama. I found myself in a long hall with seven rooms, three on each side and one at the end. I knocked on every door. Nothing. Not even Bogart. The last one had to be Jason. Are you in there, Mr. Jason? Diamond. Oh, oh I am glad to hear your voice. Please, get, get me out of here. Uh, just take it easy. I don't have a key, and this door has a padlock on it. But you must get me out. Sure, sure, but give me time. First, tell me what's the score. Why did they lock you up? Carol had it planned. She has paid Dr. Thorne to keep me here until I go crazy. She wants to have me judged legally insane so she can take the estate. Yeah. Well, maybe I can put a few kinks in her plan. Wait, wait Diamond. Where are you going? Uh, there's a phone in the doctor's office. If no one's there, I'll use it to get help. Yes, but what if you can't get to the phone? And I go out and get the Marines. If I can get by that ape man, that locked gate. Don't go away. Oh, there you are, Sherlock. Oh, don't pick on me. I was only three and a half years old. I'm upset with you, Sherlock. You oughtn't to be running around the halls like this. Well, huh? That guy's got to have his constitutional, Brazo. Yeah, well, you're true with yours. The doc wants to examine you now. I've, I've, I've changed my mind. I, I don't think I'd I like it I said the doc wants you what the doc wants he gets. Well, bully for him, but this is one time you won't. I'm bleeding. I don't want to break your arm, Sherlock. No? So you don't leave until the doc says so. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint him, but certain things are necessary, like this. Oh. Now, you shouldn't act like oh. that. I might get mad. Oh, my knuckles. What is your jaw made of, concrete? Uh, come on, Sherlock. Or do you want to try again? Uh, no, thanks. One busted hand is enough. And don't try to run. The gate's locked. And if I have to catch you, <laughs> I'll fix your leg so you can't run again. Oh, friendly little butcher, aren't you? Uh, right in here, Sherlock. The doc is waiting. <laughs> here he is, Doc. Good. <clears throat> you can go back to the office, Brazo. I won't need you. Well... You seem to be well-trained as a detective, Mr. Holmes. Do you always pick locks so easily? I do better with my erector set. Uh, but you needn't examine me further. I've changed my mind. You've changed your... This is odd. First you demand in, now you want out. I just remembered I forgot to pick up my station wagon. But the Indians, you want me to help you keep them from stealing your ice cream cones, don't you? Uh, they already got them, and all my money, too. They're both gone. Your money? And you don't have any money? Not a boulevard. 
Now, may I go, Doctor? You're going to stay right here, Mr. Holmes. There's something peculiar about the way you've recovered from your illusions. Uh, Doc, uh, Miss Jason to see you. She's in your office. Very well, Brazo. Stay here and guard this man, whoever he is. Uh, Holmes, H O. Will you shut up? And make sure he stays put this time, Brazo. I have some questions I want to ask him. He won't go in the place, Doc. You go ahead to the office. Well, Carol, this is a pleasant surprise. Come to visit Jason. So, and our plans will have to be changed. Changed? Something has come up that may cause an investigation of stepfather's illness. We can't afford to take a chance of that. But we can't let Jason go now. I had no such intentions. He must be taken care of tonight. Taken care of? But that's impossible. How could he I... He must be gotten rid of. What? Oh, no. No, I didn't bargain for murder. Look, Thorne, you're in and you stay in. I've paid you $10,000. Don't forget it. But why all this sudden rush to change our plan? Why can't we A private it? detective came to see me this morning. He was hired by stepfather. I knew he had suspicions, but I didn't know they'd gone so far. A detective? Oh, he can't act legally, but he's a sort to cause trouble. Detective. Private detective. Sherlock Holmes. He's rambling about. I'm afraid we're in serious trouble. Come with me. What? Your private detective. I think he's already found Jason. Come on. You wouldn't like to earn a hundred bucks, would you, Brazo? No. It is you, Diamond. Uh Uh-oh, fun's over. Thorn, you fool. How'd he get in here? He said he was a patient, Carol, and I swear he seemed crazy enough. He probably said he had money. Uh, You seem to understand each other, honey, but do you mind? I'd like to take Mr. Jason home now. For a couple of extra dollars, you let him walk right in. Oh, Thorn, you're an idiot. I suppose he's found Jason and talked to him. Well, he did get out of his room and wander about. Oh, that's great. So now I know the whole works. Uh, too bad, baby. Your plan is kaput. Not quite, Diamond. You've just talked yourself into real trouble. This gun says for you not to get any bright ideas. My IQ just dropped 30 points. Shut him up, Rizzo. Sure. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh! Now, stay with him while Thorne and I make arrangements. We won't be long. <laughs> Do I get the... Yes, Rizzo, <laughs> when we're ready. Yeah. Come on, Thorne. I want to talk to Stepfather. <laughs> Brazo's fist was made of the same stuff as his jaw. By the time I came around, darkness had painted the window, and the room was full of shadow and Brazo. The big hulk was squatting a few feet away, paying no attention to me. So I waited till my mind was clear while I eased off my right shoe. The heel was leather with a steel plate in it. I could only hope it was harder than Brazo's skull. With the shoe in my hand behind me, I was ready. Only to have him catch me stirring. <laughs> Coming to, eh, Shamus? Yeah, oh, yeah. Hand me my cigarettes, will you, Brazo? You need a smoke, eh? Oh. <laughs> sure. Uh, where, where are they? Uh, fell out of my pocket, uh, over there behind you. Oh, where, where? I don't see you. <laughs> I say, that's not... Need another? <laughs> Stop that. Oh, come on, Buster, fall. <laughs> well, is little old Brazo finally getting sleepy? Happy New Year, Buster. Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick, if you don't want me to be a customer of yours, get out to the home sweet home rest home fast. What? Hey, what kind of a gag is this now? It's no gag, believe me. My client and I are the blue plate specials and dinner is about to be served. The home sweet... Oh, it still sounds like a gag. Who'd call anything that? Now, don't argue, Walt. It's no joke. Okay, Rick. What's the address? 1820 Allerton Avenue, Baychester. And bring a blowtorch to cut an iron gauge. You may have to. All right. I'll be there in 30 minutes. Uh, quicker, if you can. Stand right there, Diamond. Or I'll use this gun. Uh, good afternoon. I represent the sleep Looks like I more... came just in time. Only now that you've fixed Brazo, you have to dig your own grave. Dig my own grave? Oh, honey, is this trip really necessary? Keep moving or I'll kill you right here. I I, I move. Keep going. Over there behind those trees where Thorne and Jason are. Well, is Jason... He's alive, but not for long. Where's Brazo? I thought he was going to... Diamond knocked him out. I can dig their own graves. There, the shovels. Get busy. Carol, please, you may have the money. I swear... Shut up and dig. Carol, this is... Just work the shovel. Can you imagine Richard Diamond, private detective, letting a sawed-off female make him dig his own grave? You can't? 
Well, she did. And for a good half hour. I stalled as long as I could to give Walt Levinson the chance to get there. That's enough. I said that's deep enough. Oh, please. I, I, I'm just started. You're finished. Jason, get into that hole with him. Uh, very well. I, I guess this is it, Diamond. I'm sorry to have dragged you in. Well, that's a horrible way to say it. Don't we get time for a last cigarette? No. Thorn, take this gun. What? Oh, no, I'm not going to kill them. Shut up and take this gun. Oh, don't do it, Thorn. Be a man about it. Here, Thorn. Don't be such a weakling. Two shots and it's over. No, it was your idea. I'm no murderer. Shut up, boy. Stick up for your rights. You shut up. Thorn, do you do the job or do I make you number three in that grave? You wouldn't dare. You, you need me. Shut up, boy, Thorn. Tell her. Go on, Thorn. Take the gun. No, I can't. I just can't. Not like this. You weakling. I'll do it myself. Now, turn around, Diamond. Oh, now, look, baby, this thing's getting out of hand. You shoot me and the law will be all over the place. Not until I've filled that grave in over you. I called him, baby. Oh, you're lying. Am I? Well, just turn around and take a look at that lovely, big, fat policeman standing over there by that tree. Oh, you really don't expect me to fall for an old stunt like that. Well, if you don't, you'll fall for something. It's your funeral. No, it isn't. It's yours. All right, lady, drop it. What? Why, you... Smarty. I'll kill you anyway. <laughs> Carol. Rick, Rick, what the devil's going on here? What are you doing down there? I'm looking at the girl. I, I think you shot her pretty bad. Who are these two guys? Well, the guy with the cast in that knees is Doc Thorne. Better put the cuffs on him as an accessory. But you can't do this. I was the one that re refused to shoot you. Oh, stop licking my hand. You can tell it to the precinct judge. Otis, snap the cuffs on him and take him out the car. Sure. Come on, you. Now, what about this other guy? The girl's stepfather. How do you feel, Mr. Jason? Sick, Mr. Diamond. How about the girl, Rick? Shall I call the ambulance? I don't know. Carol. Carol. Well, Rick? Ah, take your time, Walt. She's not with us. I gave Walt the story, then took Jason to his house. Stayed there long enough to brush the dirt off my clothes, wash my hands, and then I headed for a delayed date. At 975 Park Avenue, I found a big fireplace and a lovely redhead waiting for me. A redhead wearing a dress that was part green silk and part... Well... I'm the library, darling. Come on in. Oh, uh, hello, Helen, baby. You sound like you found oil in the basement. What's with the cheer? Me? Isn't it always? I like you. Hmm, I like the way you say that. Looking up at me with those big green eyes. They're not green. They're hazel. Oh, are they? Hmm... Let me look closer. Uh, not until you sing for me. Sing? Oh, honey, I'm tired. I want to rest. No, you don't. No, over to the piano. No, Rick, not here. But, Helen, all I wanted to do was... I know, Rick. Oh, you've been using that Ouija board again. I don't want to sing. Now, look in my eyes. Close range? Contact. I'll sing. That's better. Like, uh, you must have been a beautiful baby. I love it. You must have been a beautiful baby You must have been a wonderful child When you were only starting to go to kindergarten I bet you drove the little boys wild And when it came to winning blue ribbons must have shown the other kids how I can see the judge's eyes as they handed you the prize. I bet you made the cutest bow. Oh, you must have been a beautiful baby. Cause, baby, look at you now. Like that? That was wonderful, Rick. Come here. Mm, about time. Mm. Oh, Rick. Do you think you can do that and sing, too? Honey, when you look at me like that, I could kiss you, sing, and knit a whole sweater at the same time. Rick, could you? Want to try? A sweater will take years. I'll buy that. Come here, we'll start with a neck. Rick. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm, you know something? Mm, what? I may even knit you a whole suit.
You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Averback, Betty Moran, Howard McNear, Edwin Max, and Jay Novello. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. (coughs) Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. How much is your life worth? Think about that for a minute. Is it worth a little care? Well, that's all that's needed to protect it on America's streets and highways. Only your careful driving and your acceptance of personal responsibility for your own life can guard you from the dangers of the road. The price that you may pay for carelessness is a high one, and it's a price that thousands upon thousands of accident victims have already paid. Their gamble with death behind the wheel is a stark warning. A warning that an accident can happen to you. Last year alone, some 32,000 persons were killed in traffic accidents, and well over a million others were injured. Smash-ups have averaged more than one a minute, every minute of the day and night. These are the facts of traffic dangers. As for the facts of traffic safety, well, they all boil down to just two facts. Careful driving by automobile owners, careful walking by pedestrians. So drive carefully, walk carefully. The care you take may save a life, and that life may be your own. Saturday night is packed with entertainment when you stay tuned to NBC's star lineup of shows. Each Saturday, make it a point to listen to NBC. You'll hear Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, Grand Old Opry, and Songs by Morton Downey. Now, stay tuned for Lionel Barrymore and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Portions of the following program are transcribed. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Yep, door's open. Mr. Diamond. Well, Angelino, come in. I didn't know whether you were busy or not. If you didn't hear the drums, you'd know I'm not busy. Drums, Mr. Diamond? Well, it's a sort of a ritual, Angie. Every time I get a paying client, my landlord offers up his thanks to the goddess of joy. Plays an old bongo and turns on the heat as a kind of sacrifice. I see. Oh, no, no, you don't. You're too normal. What's the trouble, Angelino? The pig's knuckles in your butcher shop got arthritis? <laughs> you always with the kidding, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, that's the kind of a hairpin I am. Hairpin? Uh, Angie, you got something on your mind. Forget my little asides and let's have it. Uh, I got the big problem, Mr. Diamond. Oh, you mean something's wrong and you can't pay me to take care of it? Oh, no, no, I can pay. Oh, well, then you haven't got a problem. You slip me the cash and I'll move in on your worries. Well, you see, it's like this. I come to you as a sort of representative for all the other butcher shops, the independent ones. I ain't the only one that's worried. So all the butchers got together last night and decided to do something about it. I, uh, I hate to be uh, a nag, but do something about what? We all been paying money to a protective association. Oh? Yeah, every week a couple of guys come around and collect. If we don't pay, we get our shops busted up. And if that ain't enough, we get our heads busted too. See, I still got three stitches right here on the top of my head. Oh. Nice job. What the doctor use? A loom? I got it this last week when those two guys come for the money. I couldn't pay, so one of them hit me with a blackjack. You're lucky he didn't use one of your salamis. Might have been a job for homicide. He knocked me out when I when I come to. My shop was a mess. There was a note saying that they'd be back. Well, you better go to the law, Angelino. They'll give you good protection and won't cost you a thing. 
We discussed that at the meeting. But we decided it was too dangerous. We've been warned that if we go to the police, we'll get hurt bad. We got the families, Mr. Diamond. We can't take the chance. Yeah. Now, uh, tell me, have these two Garnifs been back to see you? Garnifs? Oh, Angie, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Garnifs, hoods. Hoods? Gangsters, bad little boys. Oh, no, they ain't been back. Not yet. Well, for you or Rockefeller, my fee's the same, Angelino. One hundred clams uh, dollars a day in expenses. We took up a collection. I uh, only got a hundred dollars. Oh, why does this always happen to me? I'm going to end up making Simon Legree look like Snow White. You only got a hundred. Huh? Yeah, mm-hmm. but we thought of something. If it costs more, you can take it out in trade at any of the butcher shops. Well, it's liable to run into a lot of ham hocks. <laughs> it's the only way we can pay you. So I'll throw a barbecue. Let's go, Angelino. Where do we go? Well, you and the rest of the butchers have not only hired yourselves a private detective, but you've got a new addition in the butcher's union. You mean you... Yeah. Come on. I want you to show me how to carve a lox. Well, that's what happens when your reputation gets around to the butcher shops. I'd been buying cold cuts from Giuseppe Angelino for the past two years and telling him what a great detective I was. I should have known he'd never take my word for it, so now I had to prove it. His shop was over on 10th Avenue, so we walked over and went in. He took me around behind the counter and handed me a white apron. I don't get it. Why you want to be a butcher? Angie, you want me to get a line on these two guys who do the collecting, don't you? Sure. Well, I can only think of two ways I could watch them and not look suspicious. Make like a butcher or crawl in with the ground round. Huh? Think what would happen if someone looked down for the price of ground round and caught it staring back at them. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a good one. That's pretty good. Oh, now, come on, <laughs> Angie. It wasn't that funny. Oh, you got my hundred bucks, ain't you? It's a riot. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, come on. Let's uh, show me what happens with this butcher racket. Uh, oh, customer. I'll show you later. Oh, nothing like learning fast. Let me handle the sale. Think you can? Yes, he comes. Uh, oh, good morning, Mrs. Hennessy. Oh, good morning, Mr. Angelino. Business must be good. I see you have a new butcher. Oh, uh, y- yes. Uh, this is a Mr. Uh, Hangtooth. Hangtooth? Hangtooth. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Hennessy. Something I can do for you? Oh. Uh, yes. How much is the lamb shoulder today? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, which one? What? Look, uh, maybe you better let me take... Uh, relax, Angie. I'll make it. Uh, which shoulder would you like, Mrs. Hennessy? Well, is there any difference, young man? Oh, yes, yes. You see, this lamb is really a ram. A ram? Oh, sure, yeah. Hurt his shoulder playing against the eagles two weeks ago. We're also selling his shoulder pads at 21 cents a pound. Mr. Angelino... Uh, you'll find him hanging in the back with the spare ribs. Now, if you can tell me which shoulder you want, I'll wrap it up and send it off tackle between the liver and the knishes. What? Well, I never... Well, of course you haven't. That's the trouble with you people. Now, here's a nice little ram that played his heart out. Oh, by the way, the heart is a special today, 11 cents a pound. Hmm. Angie. Is she gone? Like laundry in a tornado. What for do you want to do that, Mr. Diamond? She was one of my best customers. I wanted to get her out of here, and I wanted to get her out in a hurry. But why do you have to do it like that? Not a lamb, a ram. Which shoulder do you want, Miss Hennessy? Look, Angie, I'm sorry, but you can explain it to her later. Just as she came in, I spotted two guys heading this way. When they saw her, they backed off. They're standing across the street right now. Where? Right over there, in front of the cigar store. Hey, one of them has got a hatchet. No, no, not that one. You're looking at the Indian. Over there. Oh, oh, yeah. Hey. That's them. That's the two guys who hit me on the head. They're the ones who come around to do the collecting. Well, they're coming again. You better duck. I'll take care of it. You be careful. They're pretty rough monkeys. Go on, I'll beat it. They're almost here. Yeah, yeah. I'll be in the back. One meatball. I got you under my skin. I got... Well, well, well. Good morning, gentlemen. What can I do for you? Where's Angelino? Oh. Well, uh, he's out buying some old buffalo. I'm the new assistant. Buffalo? Red, shut up. And get your hand out of the pickles. All right, now tell me, new assistant, when will he be back? Well, that's hard to say. These buffalo are in Wyoming. Oh, yeah. Carl, you know, I think this guy's trying to be funny. You win yourself a lamb chop. All you have it, with or without the bloomers. You know something, Red? I think you're right. What's your name, laughing boy? Hangtooth. Hangtooth? Oh, I'm going to have more fun with that. It throws everybody. Well, look, Hangtooth. You know who we are. Uh, how many guesses? 
You won't even need one. We're in a hurry. We're collectors. Uh, we put all the scraps out in the back in a can. You can't miss it. I don't like you. Well, I have a friend. Maybe we could double date. Look, let's stop the clowning. If Angelina didn't tell you about us, it's going to be too bad for you. We're here for some money. We get it every week. Twenty-five bucks. Yeah. Last week, Angelino didn't have it, so he accidentally hit his head. We figured that all that blood would make him remember it this week. Well, I'm sorry, friend, but Angie didn't say anything about it. Tell me, what does he pay you boys for? Oh, little things. Protection, mostly. You see, if he paid us last week, he wouldn't have hit his head. You know something? I know a big, fat cop who would just love to hear all about this protection Angie's paying you for. You do, huh? Yeah, I do, huh? Well, uh, look, seeing as how you're a new boy around here, maybe we ought to tell you first. Why don't you do that? Let's go on the back. I like it here. I listen better. You do, huh? Is that all you guys can say? Now, get out from behind that counter. Oh, I want to explain the thing to you. Yeah, go on, Red. Explain it to Mr. Hagtooth. Hangtooth. You'll have to pardon him. He don't hear so well. How's your hearing, Hangtooth? Depends on what I'm listening to. If it's dull, I might end up with an ear trumpet. You might end up with one whether it's dull or not. Now, seeing as how you're working for Angelino, you're going to need protection, too. So let's have the 25 bucks. I want to know what I'm buying. Sure. Here. Oh, now, don't you know it is nice to go around breaking up showcases, and especially with that nasty old sap? Well, you never know when things are going to get busted, see? Now, uh, don't you think you need protection, Mr. Hangtooth? i uh, tell you what I'll do. I'll pay you for protection if you'll pay me. Pay you? For what? Well, you never know when things are going to get busted. Like your jaw, maybe. Why, you... Hey, Carl, help me. Yeah, sure I'll help. This looks like my head-breaking day. Uh, got his legs. Oh. All right, hold him. I'll tap him good. Oh. Give it to him again. Oh. oh, he's a rough one, ain't he? Yeah, kick me in the mouth, will you? Hey, right. Red. Let me try that, huh? Hang to turn such a pretty color when you kick him like that. He's out. You think he gets the idea? Maybe not right now, but when he wakes up, he's going to have a sore head to remind him. Come on, we'll come back for Angelino later. Well, you can't really blame brave little old me for going to sleep at that point. One, I could have handled, but in that cramped space behind the counter with both of them coming from different directions, I had to give up sooner or later. And I did for about 20 minutes. When I finally snapped out of it, I looked up and saw three heads staring down at me. Two herring with Angelino in the middle. You all right, Mr. Diamond? Oh, Angie, do you always ask people that right after they've lost their blood? Here, let <sighs> me help you get up. Oh, oh swell. <laughs> now, uh, look for my eyes, will you? I didn't know what to do. I guess I should have called the police. Oh, why, Angie, you're really beginning to think for a change. Oh, let me sit down. Uh, but when I thought about calling the police, I also thought about my family. Those two men might have beat up my family just like this. Yeah, 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 I guess you're right. You take the hundred dollars, Mr. Diamond, and forget about this. It's too dangerous. When they come back, I'll pay them the money and nobody gets hurt. Look, uh, look, I can understand why you're scared, Angie. Those, those two headhunters aren't kidding, but you can't let them get away with it. I can, and I will. I need taking no more chances. First, they bust up my shop, then they bust... No, thanks. I've had enough. Okay. Okay, Angie. Here's the hundred. No, no. That's yours. And then say it's a present. Buy yourself some new glass for the counter. What are you going to do? Well, now I got no obligation, Angelino. Just a sore face and a nasty disposition. I won't get back to normal until I find those two guys and tie their necks in a bow. I left Angelino's shop and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. I wanted to look up two sure bets for the police gallery. One named Carl, the other Red. Two guys who went around scaring poor little businessmen like Angelino. By the time I reached the station, the aches from the beating were making me very unhappy, and when I walked into the squad room, I spotted something that didn't make things any better. Yeah, what are you... 
Holy cow, diamond. Well, Otis, I'm glad you noticed. It means I put myself together all right. What's the matter with your voice? I got a cold. Sound like you swallowed a rattlesnake. Yeah? Well, what happened to you? Oh, don't be silly. I always bleed just before lunch. Yeah, how'd it happen? It wasn't easy. Is the lieutenant in? Sure, go ahead. Thanks. Say, Otis, when are you going to start shaving in the morning? Why? What's wrong? Your five o'clock shadow is four hours fast. Oh. Hello, Walt. Now you listen to me. Wow! You like it? What hit you? Well, the bruises show up. I come on in Technicolor. Someone sure did a good job. That someone is two guys. One named Red and the other Carl. Red, then Carl. Yeah. I got closest to Red. Name matches the hair, busted nose, about 190, and very nasty with a sap. And Carl? Dark greasy. Well-dressed, if you like the type. Big boy with a scar under his uh, right eye. Uh, you sure pick them. You know them? Yeah, I think so. Uh, here. Here's one of them. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, you are so right. This is sweet little Carl, all right. Carl Tate, sort of a new boy, import from Chicago. Yeah, here's the other one. Yeah? Yeah, that's Red. Yeah, they work together, a couple of muscle men. Mm, Red Dillon. <laughs> Arrests all over the place. One conviction, assault with a deadly weapon. What'd they go after you for? Yeah, they've been pulling a protection racket on some of the independent butcher shops. Who do they work for? They used to work for Jack Arnold before he got sent up. Well, I know they're not working this setup alone. It's too big. No, they wouldn't be. Hey, Tiny Easter's in town. Tiny Easter? Oh, used to be Arno's right-hand boy. That's right. Came in about a month ago. I'd love to get something on him. Nobody has ever been able to nail him. Well, it adds up. He used to work for Arno, so did Carl Tate and Red Dillon. Now, if we can't pick him up just because two of his boys worked you over, I'd just say they weren't his boys. I don't want him picked up. I want Carl and Red. If Easter goes along with the deal, you can have him. What are you going to do? Get cleaned up and pay Mr. Tiny Easter a visit. What's his address? Well, he's got an office on East 48th Street, uh, 804. Thanks, Walt. Uh, Tiny's a bad boy. Well, I'll take along my 38 just in case I have to spank him. Bye. I left Walt and went back to my office. Took a clean shirt out of the closet and washed up. I locked up again, went down to the street, grabbed a cab. Twenty minutes later, I was standing in the reception room of Tiny Easter's office. A big guy with a bulge under his arm was trying to be as unreceptive as possible. So you want to see Easter? You got an appointment? No, I haven't got an appointment. Now tell Easter I'm out here. What's your name? You're going to get hung up on this. What do you mean? The name's Hangtooth. Huh? Yeah, you see? Now make like an office boy and tell Easter I got a message for him from Carl and Red. You're a pretty fresh guy, ain't you? Yeah, and I'm going to spoil if I have to stand around much longer. You can spoil rotten for all I care. You ain't going to see Easter. He's busy. Okay. You know, you get so excited, you'll ruin your stomach someday. I don't think so. You don't, huh? <laughs> Skeptic. What are you, Wong? I'm collecting scalps. Well, good for you. How'd you get by Lefty? He's tied up with a stomach ache. Swallowed a fist. All right, so you got muscles. Also, you got a pushed-in face. Lefty do that? Carl Tate and his blood brother, Red. Oh? What'd you come to me for? They're working for you, Auntie. You smell like a cop. Name's Hangtooth. I doubt it. Good for you. I'd hate to go through that again. I'm a private cop. Why not good for you? I was in a butcher shop when your two boys wandered in and started playing squash with me. I don't like to get pushed around Easter. And I don't like your racket. I want Carl and Red. And if I get you along with them, the state will hang a medal on me. <laughs> Looks like you kind of got nothing to lose. Look at it any way you like. Now, what about your two playmates? Well, I don't know what you're talking about, Seamus. I never heard of those two guys. I don't think you understand, Tiny. I'm pretty mad. I'm going to find these two guys, and I'm going to do it even if I have to be unpleasant with you. Why, Mr. Hangtooth, what do you mean by unpleasant? You break a leg, that's unpleasant. Oh? Well, uh, I got something in this drawer might change your mind. Yeah? Oh, oh my hand. Okay, a busted hand. Unpleasant enough? <laughs> Take your foot away. You're breaking it in two. Drop the gun in the drawer. Okay. Howie. Now, uh... Let me explain it again. 
If you go out and shoot 12 people tomorrow, I'm going to be sore about it. But when you start intimidating a bunch of hard-working little guys and their families, I go off like a skyrocket. Then when a couple of your cheap gunsels push me around, I explode. Look, friend, I tell you, I don't know these guys. <laughs> Look, Easter, please believe me. I don't know. You worked with them in Chicago. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, Easter. I'll work you over like an eggplant in a subway. Look, whatever your name is, I got boys. They'll take care of you. Who's going to tell them to do it? I am. With your mouth swollen shut? <laughs> now, where do I find Carl and Red? <laughs> Golly, you knocked one of my teeth loose. Then I got 31 to go. I guess you really don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, friend, I understand. Ah. Now, now, where are they? You still need some encouragement? No, no. No, that's all right. They're in a warehouse. By the 14th Street docks. What warehouse? Rogers and Sons. Big sign on the top. Mind if I use your phone? Yeah, go ahead. By all means. Don't you know it's not polite to listen, Easter? Well, what do you want me to do? Go to sleep. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, Rick, I'm up at Easter's. He let you use the phone? Yeah, he's asleep. I'm going down to Roger's warehouse near the 14th Street docks. Carl and Red are down there. I may need some help. I'll be right down. You better hop down here to Easter's and pick him up first. On what charge? I'll give you a charge after I see Red and Carl. Now step on it. But, 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 but... Contact. <laughs> I left Easter's office looking like a second-class rest home and headed for the warehouse on 14th Street. It was getting late in the afternoon when my cab pulled up near the river and I got out. A cold breeze was kicking up little patches of white on the water and a light fog was moving in from the Atlantic as I started toward a big building with a sign on the top that read, Rogers and Sons, importing. The place was boarded up, but a window in the basement showed signs of recent use, so I jimmied it open and dropped down on the dark, cold pavement. I held my breath and listened. There was a radio playing from somewhere in the front of the building, so I started moving toward it. I went up a flight of stairs and onto the first floor. The radio was louder now, and I could make out an office door with a small light shining under the crack at the bottom. I moved up close and listened. Hey, Carl. Yeah? Shut off the radio. Okay. What do we have to hide out in here for? Because Easter said to. Besides, we don't know who that guy was we worked over this morning. He might have been a cop. So he was a cop. We worked cops over before. Look, Easter said we should stay undercover for a few days, so we stay undercover. Why not deal the cards? Oh. Off that top. Get it? That's probably Easter. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What? He did, huh? Hey, what's the matter? Boss! What's going on? I don't know. That was Easter. The guy we worked over was in his office. Pushed him around and now that guy's headed down here. Uh, we can handle him. Sure, but something's wrong. Just as Easter was going to say what to do, it sounded like he got into a fight. I had some guy tell him to drop the phone. Hey, the cops. Yeah. Come on, let's get out of here. Yeah. Good afternoon, boys. Hangtooth. Hangtooth. Come back here, Carl. Uh, help me. You shouldn't have pulled a gun, Red. Since when do you butchers carry rods? Since we get pushed around by guys like you. I'm going to go get your friend. You can't leave me. I'm shot bad. I can't take it back. The law will be here in a minute. You're a lousy butcher. I hope Carl pays you good. I'll see he gets a chance to try. I left Red lying on his face and ran toward the front of the building. The only way out was that window in the back, and Carl was sure to be hiding somewhere in the dark, hoping to get around me and head for the basement. There were a dozen places to hide in that warehouse, but I had one advantage. He couldn't see me any better than I could see him. I backed up against the wall. Come on, Carl. Red's hurt pretty bad, and the law's on the way. You gotta get me to get out of here. 
He was behind a pile of packing cases and had a big gun just to make things tougher. I eased along the wall, trying to get behind him when I suddenly bumped into something. I turned around and felt to see what it was. A ladder, straight up to the steel beams overhead. I put my gun under my arm and started up the rungs. It was tough climbing like that, trying not to make a sound and knowing all the time if he spotted me, I was an easy target. About halfway up, I stopped, held on with one hand, took off my shoe with the other. The idea was to drop the shoe, draw his fire, and nail him before he found out where I was. I dropped the shoe. Okay, only take it easy. I can't see nothing, Lieutenant. You can't say nothing either. Shut up. You sound awful. Oh. Rick. Rick. Walt. I hear him, Lieutenant. Rick. Huh? Here's some guy that's been shot. Now, Diamond's been around here all right. Rick. Here, Walt. Up here. What? Where the devil are you? Up here on this ladder. There he is, Lieutenant. See, where my flash is. Now, what are you doing up there? I had to get Carl Tate. He's over there behind those crates. Now, get me down. Well, why don't you climb down? Whoa! Not in front of Otis. Oh, I forgot. Otis, go outside and call the fire department. Fire department? Yes, and tell him to bring a net. What? Will you get a move on? It's... Oh, Okay. Rick. Yeah? <laughs> now you stop that! Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's so seldom that I ever get a good laugh at your expense. Okay. But you know this is a serious thing with me. How far up am I? I'd say about 40 feet. Oh. Now, now, take it easy. Just don't look down. Walt. Yeah? Promise me something? I won't tell Otis. I'll say you got stuck up there. Thanks. <laughs> what did you go up there for, anyway? I told you. I had to get Carl Tate. <laughs> I just didn't think until I was up. Imagine the guy who shoots it out with two of the toughest torpedoes in town having a horrible fear of heights. Boy, if that isn't one for the books. You know, I'll never forget the time that that little blonde trapeze artist got stuck. What? Yeah? I hate you. Rick. Hmm? How's your face? Fine. How's yours? Now you stop that. Oh, nice and soft. Rick. What's the matter? I'm just nuzzling a little. You're just nuzzling a lot. You want to nuzzle? You got to sing. Oh, no. No nuzzling? Oh, yeah. No sing, no nuzzle. Fiend. Piker. Just a real nuzzle? I think you're after my earrings. No. If I sing? Yes. I was ready. I was listening. I will remember you In the silent and lonely night And the memory of your smile Will bring me back the light I will remember you when the leaves lie upon the ground With the memory of a kiss A kiss in summer fire When the winds of winter come crying through the darkness Your lovely voice will come to me even though in spirit across the miles that part us, crying I love you, I will remember you. Till the spring of another year, till I hold you close again, I will remember. Oh, 
wait a minute. Oh, now what? I just remembered. I got a surprise for you. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Got a new television set. Now you can watch the fights. Well, uh, great, great. Where is it? In the den. But first you've got to do one thing for me. What's that? Well, the reception isn't very good yet. I called the repairman, but he said to check the aerial. You can't come over until tomorrow. I'll fix it. Where is it? On the roof. The roof? But be careful. You've got to climb a ladder to get to it. What's the matter? Look, uh, Helen, wouldn't you rather... Fix the aerial first. First? First. Oh. Whom are you calling? Hello, operator. Give me the fire department. You've just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Nestor Piva, Paul Fries, and David Ellis. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King with an important reminder. Richard Diamond will next be heard on Sundays, one week from tomorrow. Remember, Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, will next be heard on Sundays, beginning January 15th. Consult your local paper for time of broadcast. What's on NBC tomorrow? The hilarious Phil Harris, Alice Faye show. And for mystery, Sam Spade, directly following Phil and Alice. Next, Hollywood Star Theater with Dorothy L'Amour on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Oh, uh, may I do something for you, sir? I'll repeat the offer while I think of something. Uh, I beg your pardon? That's not the way I heard it first. Uh, did you want to see... Uh, Mr. George Victor... Uh, may I have your name? Well, let's, uh, let's trade. Mine's Diamond, Richard Diamond. Oh, of course. Mr. Victor's expecting you. Well, it's too much to hope that you were... Uh, uh, he's waiting for you, Mr. Diamond. Thanks. Any door? Huh? Oh, oh, straight ahead. Go right in. Mm-hmm. Yes? Mr. Victor? Yes. Oh, you're Diamond. Uh-huh. Come in and sit down. Thank you. You said you'd come immediately, and that was over an hour ago when I phoned you. Well, I didn't want to come to my bare feet. What? I was washing out a pair of socks. You're you're sure you're Richard Diamond? Uh, reasonably sure, yes. Uh, my uh, my credentials. Oh, all right. You were recommended to me by Lieutenant Levinson of the police department. I want to hire you. Uh, my fee is one hundred dollars a day in expenses. Unless we settle that first, I couldn't solve the case if it was tagged a hundred proof. Here are two checks. One for a hundred, the other for five. Oh. You get the hundred if you take the job, and the other one if you do the job satisfactorily. Ah, tell me all about it. You may have heard that I bought the controlling interest in one of the biggest newspapers in the city. That I heard. All right. I'm going to expose the numbers racket. Eh, that's been tried before. I know, but this time it's different. I have all the evidence I need to expose one of the biggest operators. Aaron Ziegler. Oh, well, you do pick them big. You know him? We did some spitting at each other when I was on the force. Well, then you know what he is. Yeah. But you said you had all the evidence. Where do I come in? Ziegler's my affair. Yours will be my daughter. Here's her picture. Well, you can have Ziegler. I'm happy with this arrangement. This is no joke, Mr. Diamond. My daughter works for Ziegler. Oh? You got a million bucks for every Mongolian in Asia and your daughter works? Hobby, perhaps? She uh, became infatuated with a man named Doug Saxon. And went to work to support Will him. Will you listen to me? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Victor. Saxon has some connection with Ziegler. 
I objected to her seeing Saxon, and there, there was an argument. And being 21, she walked out? Yes. Hmm. Ziegler gave her a job singing in the Nocturne Club. I know the place. Now, what I want you to do is... I think I know, Mr. Victor. You've got evidence on Ziegler. That makes him an unhappy boy, and being unhappy, he wants to smile again. So he sets glamour lad Saxon loose. Your daughter falls for him, and the frame's begun, right? Ziegler told me he was going to stop me from printing the expose of his racket. I, I know he'll use my daughter, Kathy. What does she have to say about it? She won't see me. Mm. And you've got no idea what the frame will be? No, that's your job. Find my daughter, stay with her until the paper goes to press. And when will that be? Ten tonight. Hmm. Oh, all right, Mr. Victor, you hired yourself a boy. I'll pick up that $500 check after I pick up the late edition. Good day, sir. Oh, uh... Yes? Uh, if you will excuse the expression, uh, the retainer, $100. Oh, here you are. Oh, well, thank you. I'd bow from the waist, but my empty money belt might choke me. I'll keep in touch. A couple of phone calls to old acquaintances who still kept in touch with the shady side of our city, and I had Saxon's address. A half hour after I left George Victor, I was punching the buzzer to Saxon's apartment. Good afternoon, Mr. Saxton. Who are you? What do you want? I'm Mother Hubbard, and I've come to look at your cupboard. Ask me in. What's the idea? Who... Uh, this won't take long, Mr. Saxton. Listen, you... I was just going to ask you to listen. But since you ask first, go ahead and give me something to listen to. I... Uh... Did Ziegler send you? Well, maybe. Maybe not. It's a nice place here. All the scenery. Phonograph, big overstuffed chair. I'm glad you like it, but don't make yourself comfortable. What's in the other room? Look here, I don't know who you are or what you want, but... Maybe Ziegler did send me. Uh, uh, did he? No. You a cop? Used to be. Always enjoyed my work. And I never enjoyed it more than when I was up against a character like you. Get out of here. Oh, now somehow getting tough doesn't look well on you. You're not the type, Saxon. From a quick but thorough study, I'd say you were more used to soft lights, sweet music, and setting up pigeons to be knocked over by your boss. I don't know what you're talking about. Kathy Victor. Know her? What if I do? You know her. And, uh, Saxon. Keep away from her. <laughs> oh, now you're scaring me. Sure. Hey, 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 what do you want from me? Why are you doing this? I'm hired to do it. The name's Diamond, Richard Diamond, occupation private detective. Private detective? Yeah. You're going to make a phone call now. I won't. You're calling Ziegler to tell him you quit. I can't do that. Unless you want this floor lamp on your head. Uh, 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 Diamond, please. Please don't. Now. That's better. Now, go ahead. What will I tell him? Uh, your health is bad. You're going to take a boat trip. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, then you think of something, but think. But I... Hello? This is Saxon. I'd like to talk to Aaron. Oh. Well, I'll call back. It's important. Oh, it's important. I've got to talk to him. All right. Get him. They're putting me through him. Hello. Hello, Aaron. Listen, I, I, I can't go through with the deal. Uh, uh, something came up. I mentioned my name. A man named Diamond. Richard Di Yeah, yeah, that's right. I don't know, Aaron, but please, don't blame me. I, I, I did... Hello? Hello, Aaron? Aaron? He, he hung up. Good. You do the same. You don't know what he'll do, Diamond. You don't know him. Oh, but I do. Well, happy landings, Glamour Boy. You can't leave me like this. You know, after a long look at you, I don't think I'd like to stay. Bye, Saxon. Twenty feet of the East River will look good on you. Okay, so it was a bluff. I knew Ziegler wouldn't be scared off that easily, but when you go hunting ducks, you put out a decoy. I did. The decoy was me. It was an hour later that I got back to my office building and walked into the lobby. The elevator door there was open, but the jockey was missing. I was about to take the hard way up, the stairs, when... Diamond. Uh, oh, hello. Where'd you come from? I'm under a cabbage leaf. I don't believe it. Get in the elevator. Uh, I'll walk. Hey, Mac. Mr. Diamond don't want to get in the elevator. Uh, maybe he gets car sick. Get in, Diamond. <clears throat> uh, what's the big idea? Close the door, Mac. Sure. You know how to run this thing, Diamond? No. Start it up. Go on. Okay. Floors, please. I'll tell you when. This is far enough. Stop it. 
And keep your hands away from that door. What are you going to do, eat your way out? He's a card, ain't he? Oh, now, come on. Fun's fun, but I got business. So have we. We told you to take your hands off those doors. Oh, you did, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, he won't go down. Sure he will. He's just stubborn. Yeah. Give me that sap. <laughs> you see? Yeah. Think he's still tuned in? Let's see. Diamond. Hey, Diamond. Oh, he should know better than that. It ain't polite not to listen. Kick him in the ribs. <coughs> now, how about it, Diamond? You want to listen? He's shaking his head. He says yes. Okay. Now, stay away from the dame you're supposed to take care of. Go back to Victor and tell him you don't want the job. Tell him it's too rough, and if he don't understand, show him your bruises. Hey, uh, give him a bruise where it shows. <laughs> Look at that. I, I don't think he likes you kicking him in the chops. What does he want? Bedroom slippers? Okay, open the doors and let's get out of here. Hey, uh, think I ought to give him another boot? Just to make sure? Ain't you ever satisfied? Go ahead. <coughs> okay, let's go. You know something? You got an awful disposition. <laughs> You don't come out of a beating like that right away. A professional working over is like spending a weekend in a taffy machine. I reached out and tried to touch things, but it was like trying to paint the inside of a balloon with a hammer. I was numb, and when the little jabs of feeling started pinching my cheeks, I found out that I was warm and sticky. Finally, I pulled myself up, stood there for a minute, decided my legs weren't macaroni, and went to the washroom to clean up. Then I headed for the Nocturne Club. It was too early for customers, but there was a bartender and a girl with blonde hair playing the piano. Uh, we ain't open yet, Mac. Oh, you ain't? Well, give me a bib. I may cry all over the place. You look awful. Truck hit you or something? I was blowing a tube in a high wind. Yeah? Yeah. Screwed me eight feet into the ground. Ain't that terrible? Yeah, ain't it? Hey, uh... Who's the dame with the fingers? Oh, entertains here. Name's Victor, Kathy Victor. Got a swell set of pipes. Mm. If you're looking for a job, we don't need no tuba players. Look, uh, here's for a drink and here's something for you because uh, you ain't open yet. Fix me something that will turn me all one color. Sure. <laughs> will it be black or blue? Uh, anything that goes in my tie. Bring it to the piano. I thought you wanted it. Oh, I'll laugh later. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. to that? Yeah. Time in my hand. Hmm? From your looks, I'd say you needed time. Oh, don't let the bruises fool you, honey. When the swelling goes down, my face is fairly normal. Hey, uh, blue and yellow make green, don't they? Yeah, why? I wasn't sure, but here's a drink anyway. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe you'll turn plaid. Sure. Here, put this in your pocket and go back in the bottle. Sure, thanks. Uh, yellow when you want another one. Hey. What's the matter? Why'd you stop? I need a drink, too. You get the jumps early, huh? I work late. Catches up with me. Oh, I try out running them for a day. It does wonders. <laughs> oh, I know you. You're a spy from Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm. Go ahead, play some more. All right. Kathy. Hmm? Your father sent me. What? Remember him? Why don't you leave now? Before we're really acquainted? I don't know who you are or what you want, but if my father sent you, I'm not buying. Okay, so you're having a good time now, but there's always the next morning. Thought of that? I don't need anyone to take care of me. Miss Victor, I'm not trying to take care of you. I'm doing a job. Maybe you don't know this, but you're being measured for a patsy. And your father's going to fit the same frame Saxon and Ziegler are working up for you. <laughs> you're crazy. But I like you, so I'll forgive you. Now cut it out. I thought you wanted me to play. Look, you're spoiled. You had a mouthful of silver spoons and a handful of gold pieces for building blocks when you were a kid. But you're not a kid anymore. You're playing with bad boys. Maybe that's the way I like them. What do I have to say to make you realize, She's young lady... what, Diamond? Doug. Oh, well, 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 Mr. Saxon. I thought you weren't going to be around here anymore. I changed my mind. 
<laughs> you are changed, too, since I last saw you. Well, only my looks. They'll heal. But tomorrow, you'll still be a greasy little gigolo. You can't talk that way to me. Oh, shut up. I... Uh, never mind. Mr. Ziegler would like to see you. He saw you come in. And where is Mr. Ziegler? In his office, right back that way. Okay, okay. I haven't seen Ziegler for a long time. Maybe he wants me to set his broken arm. His arm's all right. Well, stick around. You may find out you're a chronic liar. Uh, keep playing, baby. I'll be right back. Like I said, I knew my bluff with Saxon wouldn't work, but I had what I wanted. A look in on Ziegler. And maybe a hint on what the frame was going to be. I walked to and into his office. Well, <laughs> Diamond. Hello, Ziegler. Oh, what happened to your face? Oh, got it caught in an elevator. Oh. What do you want with me? Diamond, here's a grand. Go out and have fun tonight, huh? All night. Oh, that money won't do me any good. Why not? That ain't counterfeit. Well, it's yours. That makes it so lousy it's liable to crawl right out of my pocket. Well, then get rid of it in a hurry. You get rid of it. You know, it's better waking up with a headache than not being able to find your head at all. Oh, look, Ziegler, you don't scare me. Now, let's level. You know why I'm here. Let Kathy Victor alone. You want to see me, boss? Well, look who's here. Oh, you know Tony Diamond? Yeah, we met, yes. Mm -hmm. He stubbed his toe on my chin. I don't know what you're talking about. When was this, Diamond? Uh, you know what it was, about an hour ago. You're crazy. Yes, Diamond. Tony was right here with me all morning. Okay. Mm-hmm. Are you leaving them? Yeah, yeah. Got any other ideas? Yes. I think you should consider my proposition. I'll let you know. About what? Things in general. Oh, no. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're happy. You make me that way, Diamond. You're working the dark, aren't you? I'll feel my way around. Believe me, Diamond, there ain't a thing wrong. Why, we love Miss Victor here. Just because her old man gets excited and hires you to bend an eye over her don't mean anything is wrong, does it? Since you ask me, I'll tell you. The answer's yes. You think so? Yeah. Otherwise, why beat me up? Why offer me a grand to look the other way? I don't know nothing about the beating. And as for the grand, I like you. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, okay, Zegger. I think I'll go now. And just to make you happier, I'll probably stick with the case. So long, Diamond. Oh, uh, by the way, Ziegler. What now? Did you say this, uh, this gentleman's name was Tony? That's his name. Okay, uh, Tony. What? I wouldn't do this for everyone, but, uh, your shoelace is untied and you're allowed to trip over it. Eh, uh, what are you talking about, it? <coughs> Bombs away. Oh, that ain't nice, Diamond. When you do that to a man, you're liable to bust all his teeth. So what? You probably had your eye on the gold ones anyway. Be good, Ziegler. Oh, hi there. You looking for another drink? Now, I got one here that I just fixed. You know, you kind of got me started on that color uh, business. Where's the and girl I, go? I... Huh? Uh, what girl? You know, Ann Saxon. Where's he? Never heard of him. Have you ever been to Hamilton? Huh? Has his picture on all $10 bills. This one's suitable for framing. In your pocket. Can't do it, mister. Two pictures of Hamilton? Well, they sure would look nice on me, but... Uh... I work here, mister. I got a wife and kids, see? Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, fella, forget it. Well, I fell for the oldest gag in the world. Kept busy someplace else while Saxon walked out with the girl. Now I had to find her. But where? I had until ten that night to stop a frame-up I didn't know anything about. But I played a hunch and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station and Lieutenant Walt Levinson. I walked in on him. Diamond, oh no. Hiya, hiya, Walt. No, please go home. Nothing good can come of this. Why, Walt, I'm surprised at you. Well, I'm not. You've got some horrible joke up your sleeve. I don't want any part of it. I can only stay a few minutes. I, uh, I want to know about a guy named Saxon. Douglas Saxon? That's it. What's the matter? Can't you find things out for yourself? Right now, Lieutenant, I'm a citizen asking about a guy. Now, what have you got on Saxon, Walt? Not a thing. He was clean when we picked him up a couple of times. Why was he picked up? Why are you so interested in him? Oh, it goes with my business. Oh. And if I tell you? Well, I'll tell you something sometime. Now, come on, Walt. Give. Okay, okay. He was picked up on suspicion of handling narcotics. But that's a job for the vice squad. Why is he so dear to you? He's working for Aaron Ziegler. 
This, Mr. Diamond, is not new. He'd be just the boy to work a frame for Aaron, wouldn't he? If it involved a gal, yeah. Well, this does. How? Don't know. Yet. But, uh, if she was picked up with narcotics on her, it'd be a nice frame, wouldn't it? What makes you think it would be a frame? This gal looks too healthy. Yeah, but you could be wrong. Why? Because for some stupid reason I like you, and I don't want to see you make a fool of yourself. Oh, well, why would I do that? For this dame. What dame? The one that Saxon's going to frame. Is he going to frame her? Of course he is. i better get her out of it. Certainly, that's just what I was saying. Bye, Walt. Uh, Rick. Yeah? Thanks. What for? For not dragging out that who's on first routine. I don't think my stomach could have stood it today. Oh, Walt, you're an idiot. Yeah. Be a good boy. <laughs> When you pound a police beat in New York, you make a lot of unusual friends. And if you ever get in plain clothes, those friends come in handy sometimes. I grabbed a cab in front of the precinct station and headed for Chinatown. Walt and I had known an old Chinese named Wu Li who had been around a long time. He knew everyone and everything that went on in Chinatown. And if anyone knew where we could find Saxon, he did. Saxon, Saxon... It's possible I do not know him. Oh, I think you do. <laughs> Just so. He said this man Saxon deals in sweet dreams. However, his rumor not proved. Does he ever come to Chinatown? You like perhaps a cup of tea? I ask this as a favor, will we? Uh, enemies are made to do evil. Friends to ask favors. Sometimes is no difference. Will you tell me, Wooly? You ask in name of friendship? I do. Very well. In Chinatown is establishment owned by a man named Fu Shen. Perhaps, I say perhaps, this man Saxon is there. He's been there before, hmm? My eyes are old, perhaps mistaken. <laughs> Not your eyes. I shall give you address, then make call to Fu Shen. You will be allowed to enter his establishment. May you live 10,000 years. And may you live to mourn at my funeral. The old boy gave the address and I left his shop. Five minutes later, I walked through the back door of the old frame building and Fu Shen bowed from the waist to let me upstairs to a private room that fronted the long hall. I noticed there were three other closed doors in the floor aside from the big room downstairs. If Kathy Victor was in the building... She had to be in one of those rooms. I walked into my room, closed the door behind me. There was a bed in one corner and a chair near it. A low table was near the bed and a dim light threw diagonal shadows like fingers across the walls. I waited until the proprietor had time to get downstairs, then I opened the door and looked out in the hall. It was empty, so I started throwing open doors. I had to be quick before I had a dozen hopped-up thugs on my back. The first was a cold turkey. This room's in use. Uh, Diamond. Well, Mr. Saxon, I presume. L l look, Diamond, lay off me, will you? Where's the kid? I don't know who you mean. You will. No. Diamond, my arm, you're, you're hurting. So here's another twist for Sal. Oh. Now sing, Saxon, and loud. Uh, look, you got it wrong. I... Oh. How wrong can I be? Oh. Okay, okay, but it wasn't my idea. I can believe that. Ziegler oh. thought it up. You pulled it off for a couple of grand. Listen, if I tell you, will you let me go? The girl's all you want. Let me go, will you? Where is she? In the next room. Walk ahead of me. And in case you get any ideas... No! Now walk ahead of me. No. Open the door. You got my arm! You got another one, but not for long if you try anything. Open it. There. There she is. Oh. Out cold. She's all right. Just... She's just knocked out, huh? Let me go now, Diamond. Sure, sure. So this was the game, huh? Bring her here, knock her out, plant narcotics on her, and then push her into the street to get picked Look, up. Look, I showed you where she is. Now give me a break. You know, I was just thinking of that. How would you like it, in the arm or in the jaw? Crumb. Now, oh, come on. Come on, Mr. Victor. Let's, let's wake up now. Come on. Come on. Mr. Diamond, uh, you got bad habits. Yeah. Yeah, Tony, and one of them is running into you. Okay, Diamond, keep your hands where I can see them. Right on the ends of my arms. Oh, what a sense of humor. All right, Diamond. All right, what? I think you're going to get a hole in the face. Oh, just a minute, Tony. You hear anything? Yeah. Those are police cars, Tony, coming here. You're crazy. Yeah? You don't think I'd come here alone, do you? Get over there by the door. Look, Tony, 
You got yourself all dirtied up for Ziegler. Is he here? No, he let you and Saxon walk around in the mud. Those cars are almost here, Tony. Shut up, I got orders. Don't rub me out, I know. But what did you do? How are you going to get out? Got an answer for that? Uh, they ain't coming here. Now, they didn't go past, Tony. Now, listen. I got nothing against you. Make a break for it. Out the back door. All I want is the girl. Go on, fast, before it's too late. Yeah. I ain't going to take the rap for nobody. Diamond. Rick. Diamond, you in here? Diamond. Up, up here, Walt. Come on. Are you all right? Uh, sure, but I sent a package, special delivery, out the back door. Uh, we've got that covered. Otis will sign for it. Oh, okay, wonderful. And now... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What are you doing here? Why'd you come? Why? My ulcers told me you were up to some stupid business. I know when you left me, you had some dizzy idea in your thick skull. I'm a cop, you know. I checked with Wu Lee, too. Hey, that the girl? Yeah, yeah. She'll be all right. Coming around okay. Uh-huh. Oh, and Saxon. Mm-hmm. Hey. What did you hit him with? Stop. Limp. Yeah, Walt. Walt, listen. If the papers get word of this... This kid's father will be ruined. If she's in the clear, you've got my word no one will hear about it. Well, I know she's in the clear, but I can't leave her here. I got a job to do. I was hired. Oh, you want to take her, huh? Yeah. I, I think she'd like to go home. Okay, I'll take your word she's all right. Now, beat it fast before the narcotics boys get here. Thanks, Walt. Come on, baby. Snap out of it. Come on. Come on. Get her out of here before we're all booked for obstructing justice. I'm going. Uh, hey, hey, Walt. Yeah? How are you going to explain knocking over this joint before the vice squad? Why, didn't you know I got a reported homicide here? I'll let you know what happens. Where'll you be? Oh, silly boy. Where else but Helen's? Now, come on, Cassie, oh. baby. On your feet. On your feet. Uh, uh, Walt. Now what? Uh, I love you. I'll marry you later. Now take off. Oh, my stomach. <laughs> Oh. Hello, Rick. You're late. Hey, get a load of those silk slacks. They're lounging pajamas, darling. I've been in a lot of lounges, dear. Never saw anything like those. You like them? Yeah, yeah, they're all right. It's the stuffing that gets me. Rick. Be proud of what you got, baby. I knew a guy who had 16 toes on each foot. What good did that do him? He used to tell everybody he was a duck. Made a fortune selling his hair for pillow stuffing. You look awful. Hmm. Could have been worse. Oh, was she pretty, Rick? Who? The girl in the case. What case? Why were you late getting here? Oh, well, I, uh, I had to take a girl home and introduce her to a man, her father. I see. How long did that take? Uh, how'd you know about the girl? Hmm? Lieutenant Levinson phoned, asking for you. Oh. I took the message. He said, she's all right. And a man named Saxon did a lot of talking. Oh, wonderful. Who's she? Who's Saxon? Oh, read all about it in the papers, dear. Is she blonde or brunette? Both. Blonde with a brunette disposition. Hmm. Got the piano too, huh? She's pretty as I am. Oh, honey, nobody is. Oh, well, nothing to do until the office opens again tomorrow. Time on my hands. You in my arms. Nothing but love in view. And then if you fall, once and for all, I'll see my dreams come true. Moments to spare for someone you care for, one love affair, just the two. Mm-hmm. With time on my hands and you in my arms. And love in my heart All for you How long did it take you to take her home? Oh, let's forget her, Helen. I'm willing. But are you? Mm-hmm. Look. Oh, what nice big checks. 
Yeah, another day, another 600 bucks. Are we going out for dinner? With what? Well, you've got a handful of checks. Baby, i got news for you. The banks are closed. Oh, come on. I know the bartender at the Nocturne Club. Oh, no. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell with Virginia Gregg as Helen and Ed Begley as Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Larry Dobkin, Gene Bates, Stanley Waxman, Paul DeBob, and High Averback. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC today? Great shows for Sunday on NBC include The Adventures of Sam Spade and Theater Guild on the Air. Helen Hayes and Walter Abel co-star on Theater Guild today. And for his caper, Sam Spade turns to television for help. You'll enjoy both these stellar shows. Sam Spade, then Theater Guild, today on NBC. Now stay tuned for James Melton and Harvest of Stars on NBC. Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Are you Mr. Diamond? Yeah, unless there's a warrant out. Mr. Diamond, I'd like to talk to you about a man. Oh, don't look so unhappy. Can't talk about girls all the time. Mr. Diamond, this is pretty serious. I'm scared stiff of him. Why? Because he's dead. And here's another exciting case from the files of Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, homicides with class. Ah. Uh-huh. Ah. Uh-huh. Well, that's a pretty good answer. What kind of a slogan was that, Chalmers? Oh, my goodness. Sergeant Otis. That's right. Well, don't take any bets. I know a dozen people who would swear you were something else. Oh, now stop the gags. I got something important to talk to you about. I know what it is. You do? I bet you've lost your shoes. Oh, what makes you think that, wise guy? Well, I drove by the docks this morning and spotted two landing barges with laces. Oh, I give up. Here, you better talk to the lieutenant. Rick? Hello, Walt. Why don't you lay off, Otis? He was just calling to ask you to do a favor for us. What kind of a favor? The 5th Precinct is having its annual dance next week. Oh, now, Walt. Well, what's the matter? Just a couple of songs, and then you can go home. Oh, sure, sure. Just like last time. I was just going to be a couple of songs last time, too. But before those lovely cops let me go, I had a crack in my voice like the Liberty Bell. Now, this time, I promise. Only two songs. All right, all right, all right. If one of them's Mule Train. Sure, but why Mule Train? I want to whip Otis for sound effects. Mr. Diamond? Oh, wait a minute, Walt. I think I spotted a client. Okay, Rick. I'll tell the committee you'll be there. Bye. Are you Mr. Diamond? Yeah, unless there's a warrant out. Mr. Diamond, I'd like to talk to you about a man. Oh, don't look so unhappy. Can't talk about girls all the time. Mr. Diamond, this is pretty serious. I'm scared stiff of him. Why? Because he's dead. Hmm. That's right. He's supposed to be dead. Well, bring him over. We can make a fortune from Barnum and Bailey. I guess I better go. No, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe you better tell me about it. Okay. I'm Martin White. I go to Barrett College. I'm an ex-GI. I'm a senior now because I couldn't start until I was released from the hospital three years ago. Hospital, huh? What was the trouble? I got hit at casino. How long were you in the hospital? Two and a half years. Two and a half years? 
Yeah, I... Okay, I fell apart up there. Oh, oh. psychosis? Yeah. Mm, go on. The other day I was on my way to class when I saw this man I was telling you about. The one who's supposed to be dead? Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. He used to be in the same outfit with me. I saw him killed at Casino. Oh, well, so you made a mistake. So he looks like the guy. No, no, it's not like that. Maybe I better tell you and then you'll understand. Uh, go ahead. Well, his name was Jarvis, Paul Jarvis. I was a captain with the Fifth Army when we went into Casino. And Jarvis? Private. He'd been with us since we pushed Rommel out of the desert. Everybody hated him. Why? Gold brick. Never missed a chance to dog it. But he was smart, plenty smart. There wasn't anything we could pin on him. Yeah, I know the type. He was great in a street fight because he was big. And I mean really big. Big and nasty. But up on the line, he went to pieces. Okay, go ahead. And one night, we got a report that a man answering Jarvis's description had killed a corporal in a fight. By the time the details got to me, the Germans had opened up with everything they had. I was ordered out on patrol, so I took Jarvis with me. You took a big chance. You know it. But there was one witness to the killing, an old man in the town. If Jarvis knew he might be identified, he'd have gone over the hill shore. So I figured I'd watch him, keep him with me until the Germans slowed up and we could show, show him to the old man. Oh, he moved up. The crowds had the main body zeroed in with their 88s. Our job was to move up, try to spot a path through the enemy artillery pattern. We had to belly down, and Jarvis and I ended up in a hole together. They'll spot us, sure. They'll correct and drop those things all over us in a minute. Keep your head down, Jarvis. I tell you, they'll spot us. Now, you listen to me. You raise your skull one inch out of this hole before I tell you, and so help me, I'll drill you myself. Okay. You hate my guts, don't you? Knock it off. (laughs) This is real funny, this is. Two guys this close hating each other. Next time, I'll pick a bigger hole. Captain White. What? About that murder. Can it. You think I killed the guy, don't you? I don't think anything right now. Just those cops down there. You're thinking about it all right. You and everybody else. You all hate me because I'm not a tin soldier like you with ideals sticking out all over your fat face. I told you to knock it off, but you wanted it laid on the line, so I'll tell you. Yeah, I hate your guts. Okay? That's good enough. I kill that corporal, Captain White. You're out of your mind. I am, huh? Well, this is as good a place as any to go over the hill. You're crazy. Get down. Relax. I got a bayonet pointed right at your belly. Jarvis, don't. Go on. Cry. Whine. <laughs> I'm going to put you in for a purple heart. Only you'll have to pin it on your blanket. Jarvis. Jarvis, for the love of... <laughs> now you're only a number on the record. Jarvis, you dirty... You're going to take a little while to die, Captain, so you can think about me getting out. I'm taking off, and I'm leaving the rest of the saps with all the honor and glory they want. So long, Captain. It's all yours. Jarvis! Come back here! Jarvis! Well, it was one of those lucky things, Mr. Diamond. I got out. Spent a day and a night in that hole until the medics found me. What about Jarvis? I'd swear he got the 88 right on top of him. But now you think you've seen him and you're not sure. I'm not sure of anything right now. But I saw that 88 hit and I saw Jarvis go down. Okay, okay. Let's say you did see Jarvis. He got out some way. Looks pretty simple to me. Call out the authorities and tell them you spotted a man wanted for murder. There certainly should be a lot of guys from your outfit who could identify him. No. He's done something to his face. Maybe the shell did it for him, but I know it's him. You can't miss a guy that size. A lot of big boys. Sure, but he's got the same rotten eyes. That didn't change, and that nasty smile he gets. I'd know him anywhere. In a dark room, I'd know him. No, but you, uh, you said you were scared. Why not go to another school? I can't. I've got a job up there, and I've got a wife and a kid. That's why I came to you. I can't go to the police. They might put me back in that hospital. They'll think I'm slipping again. Up here. Uh-huh. Well, let's, let's say it is, Jarvis. What in the world would a guy like that be doing in a college? Don't you think I've asked myself those questions? I'll just forget the whole thing. No, uh, no, 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 wait, Martin. Look, if I prove to you one way or another about this Jarvis, will you forget about Casino? Yeah. What name is he using? Blackwell. John Blackwell. Okay, let's go. Don't you, uh, don't you get a fee or something? Your wife a good cook? The best. Well, I'm staying for dinner, and after you see what I put away, you'll probably wish you'd paid the hundred a day in expenses. Usually I'm pretty hard about my fee, because the trouble I get into has to be balanced on the book some way. But a young guy comes in with a real problem, 
And old hard-headed Diamond gets a fast softening of the skull. Well, two hours later, Martin White, me, and my rural soft skull were on the campus of Barrett College and in the converted Quonset hut the Whites called home. <laughs> He's hungry, Mr. Diamond. Hi, you fella. Wow. Nice looking boy. Yeah. Takes after his mother. Uh, Martin, uh, Martin, if we're going to do something about this thing, we'd better get a move on. Hmm? All right, where do we start? Well, I think I'd like to look at this... Uh, what's the name this guy's using, you say? Uh, Blackwell. Oh. Uh, well, I'd like to look at Blackwell's school record. How about it? Well, I think I can fix it. Let's go. Oh, dinner's at six, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, we eat early because I'm night watchman on campus. I go on duty at seven. I'll be on time, Mrs. White. It's Nan. Oh, huh? well, love corned beef and cabbage, Nan. <laughs> well, I'll walk out with you. I have to go to the store. Come on, Mr. Diamond. We'll walk Nan out across the street. Martin, look out! Ah! Oh, that idiot! Uh, he must have been drunk. Nan, are you all right? Oh, sure, but <sighs> you, Martin, he came right at you. Yeah, I know. Mr. Diamond, that guy wasn't drunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Nan, uh, you think you can go to the store alone? Oh, certainly. I, I'm fine now. But that car... Now, uh, come on, Martin. We've got to check those records. Well, I uh, see you at dinner. And, Martin, you listen to what Mr. Diamond has to say. That man was probably drunk. Good girl. Yeah. What about that car? Could have been an accident. Let's think it was for a while, anyway. <laughs> Well, this is where they keep the records. Hello, Susie. Hi, Martin. Well, hello. Hello, Susie. Uh, this is Mr. Diamond, Susie. Mr. Diamond, Susie Wirt. It's really a pleasure, believe me. We'd like to look at the file, Susie. You a new professor, Mr. Diamond? No, no, just a friend of Martin's. Married? Not a bit. Why? Pretty square, huh? Mm, sometimes, but I can learn. Yeah? Well, I might just start some night classes of my own. That sounds like fun. In about five years, you let me know how your education is progressing. Oh. Age is a problem with you, huh? My dear, when I stumbled over 30, everything got to be a problem. Now, uh, do you think we can, uh... Yes? The records, Susie. Remember? Yes, yeah, Susie. The records. Oh. Okay, which ones? We want to see the file Everything on... from B to C. Okay. But if I get in trouble for this, you uh, may have to make it up to me in some way. I'll buy you a soda. And I'll let you... Here they are. B to C. Ah, thanks, Susie. I'll let you know when we're finished. Okay, be a recluse. Only I got some ideas about that, too. I'll be in the next room. Ah, youth. Well, let's take a look. How come you asked for everything from B to C? No sense in letting everybody know what we're doing. If we just asked for Blackwell's file, Susie might have said something to him. Oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Yeah, it says you're, uh... John Blackwell, 28, resident of McAllister, Oklahoma. Hey, get a load of this. Height, 6 feet 6, weight 240. Like I said, he's a big one. Hmm. If he fell down, he'd be halfway home. Look, Martin, where where can I find this Blackwell? Now, let's see. What does it say about his classes here? Hmm? It's 2.30 now. Yeah, he should be in English lit. Well, take me over there. You want to see him? I want to meet him. You want to meet him? Oh, now relax. Sooner or later, you've got to talk to him. Oh, Susie. Susie. Yes? Oh, Susie, we're finished. I'm not. How about that soda? I'll take a rain check. Lots of rain up here. <laughs> Susie? Yes? Bye. Well, we left Susie in the middle of a pout. Martin took me across the campus to another building. We went up a long hall and stopped at the door marked English Let. Martin looked in for a minute and then pointed. That's him. That's him right there. Now, relax, relax. Hey, he must get a bloody nose from the altitude. He's head and shoulders over the whole room. I'm sure of it. I tell you, when I get around to that guy, I'm sure of it. That's Jarvis. Get back from the door. The class is breaking up. Let's get out of here, Mr. Diamond. Uh, no, 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 no. I want you to introduce me to I him. I can't. I tell you, I got the shakes. Oh, you're going to have to face it sooner or later, Martin. Yeah, you, you have to come. Okay, I'll try. Uh, there he is. Uh, uh, Blackwell. He sees you. Over here. Now, what do I say? Just introduce me. I'll do the rest. Yes? You call me? Uh, uh yeah. Uh, you don't know me, but uh, 
I understand you're a new student. I'd like you to drop by the fraternity house and meet some of the boys. Oh, well, thank you. I'd be glad to. S.A.E., uh, this is Mr. Diamond, Mr. Blackwell. How do you do? Fine, thank you. You a professor here, Mr. Diamond? No, just a friend of Martin's. This uh, your first year at college? Yeah. A little late, aren't you? What held you up? Service? That's right. Oh, well, I was in the Army myself. What outfit were you in? I didn't say I was in the Army, Mr. Diamond. Matter of fact, I was in the Navy. Oh. Well, Mr. White, I have to be going now. When would you like me to stop by the house? Oh, any time. Around six. Most of the boys are in then. See you then. Nice meeting you, Mr. Diamond. Yeah. Well, you've never met him before. I mean, here on the campus? No, why? When he left, he called you Mr. White. Yeah, and I didn't introduce myself. Well, I, I do know one way to clear this whole thing up. How? Fingerprints. Washington's got a record of Jarvis. If I can get black bulls, we can compare them. It's a swell idea, but about as easy as going after a mountain lion's molar. Oh, I'll think of something. And you go on home and stay with the wife and baby. All right. <laughs> I left Martin and cut across the street to the college malt shop. When I went in, a bunch of kids were having a time playing records and making dates, so I slipped by them and eased into a phone booth and put in a fast call to the 5th Precinct Police Station and Walt Levinson. Uh, 5th Precinct, Sergeant Otis. Oh, good grief, I got the zoo. Oh, you just call up to make white crack, Shamus? No, I put the lieutenant on. But don't growl at him. He's close enough to snap a collar on you. Oh. Yeah, what do you want, Diamond? Oh, that's a pleasant way to answer the phone. What have you noticed been doing, setting fire to the commissioner? Oh, I give up. Where are you? I'm up at Barrett College. A college? Sure, sure, sure. I'm trying to talk to the science department and the bidding on your sergeant's brain. They've got gargantuas and they need a match set. Now, will you please be serious? Okay, okay, Walt. Now, look. I've run into something that has a good chance to end up looking like homicide. I can use some help. Well, you know that's out of my district. Look, I just want you to do some checking for me. Find out about a John Blackwell who's supposed to come from McAllister, Oklahoma. He's a student here. Uh, what do you want to know about him? Oh, how long he lived in McAllister. Family, friends, the usual things. And then do some checking on a boy named Jarvis, Paul Jarvis. Check his fingerprints with the military authorities. See if he was ever in McAllister and if he knew Blackwell. Okay, where can I call you and how fast do you need it? Uh, wait a minute. What's the matter? I just spotted someone in this malt shop. Are you in a malt shop? Yeah, 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 and I gotta hang up. I don't want to lose this boy. Well, where can I reach you? Call the local law and tell him I'm on the campus. Wearing a beanie? Funny. Pretty funny. <laughs> well, Mr. Blackwell, isn't it? Huh? Oh, yeah. Mr. Diamond. That's right. Mind if I sit down? Not at all. Just finishing my malt. Looks good. I think I'll have one. It is good. Good for you. Makes you healthy. Live a long time. Well, I guess that's what we're all after. I guess so. How long have you known Martin? Martin White? Yeah. Not long. How long have you known him? Just met him today with you. Why? Oh, nothing. What did I you knew his name? Oh, he was pointed out. Mm-hmm. Well, I gotta be going, Mr. Diamond. This little chat has been very enlightening. Goodbye. Goodbye. And now. Hey, uh, waiter. Huh? Oh, you want something, mister? Yeah, the small glass. Just the glass? Don't touch it. Well, what's wrong with it? Is it contagious or something? Yeah. It's five bucks. Huh? Give me a napkin to wrap it up in. Oh, a collector, huh? Yeah, something like that. Okay, take it. I had a girlfriend used to collect beer cans, but this is a new wrinkle. Thanks. Oh, it ain't nothing. Come back again and get a load of our ice cream dishes. You'll lose your mind. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't look where I was going. Yeah. I hope I didn't break anything of value, Mr. Diamond. You're going to hog a sidewalk, that's for sure. Uh, let me help you. I can make it. Uh, it's a mess, isn't it? Taking one of our famous malls back home? It might be, Jarvis. I beg your pardon. I said it might be, Jarvis. The name's Blackwell, remember? Oh, well, yeah, I forgot. You see, Martin White says he thinks he was in the service with you. I told you I was in the Navy. I didn't say Martin wasn't. Well, you're mistaken. My name's not Jarvis. Oh, well, isn't that funny? Martin's so sure. 
He was even going into New York in the morning to see if he couldn't find some of his old buddies who might have remembered you. I hope he has a nice trip. I'll tell him when I see him. But I don't get it, Mr. Diamond. Why did you tip him? Oh, you knew it before I tipped him, Martin. I don't want him to skip before I can get the information on him. But now he's sure to take off. Not until he gets you. Oh, Mr. Diamond, do you think that... I know, uh, I know you'll try, Nan. Martin is the only one here at Barrett who can actually identify him. He knows I'm suspicious of him, so he'll go after Martin first and then me. He's got to make his play. But you said that he... Martin, uh, give me your hat and coat. Well, why? What are you going to do? Take your place as night watchman. Whatever he's going to do, he'll try it tonight. I want him to try it on me. No, I won't let you do it. Look, I've pushed it this far. It's all set up. Oh, honey, don't let him do it. Yeah, Mr. Diamond, I... Now, you two lock yourself in and I'll come back. Oh, please, Mr. Diamond. Hey, hey, the hat fits pretty good. I'll have a look. But there must be something we can do. Sure. Sure, Nan, there is. What? Save me some corned beef and cabbage, huh? It was dark when I walked out with Martin's hat and coat started to cross the campus. I had a flashlight. The night was black, solid black. But I had a feeling that sat on my shoulder and raised goosebumps. When you've been in this business as long as I have, that feeling is an alarm ringing inside, telling you the trouble is creeping up. Halfway across the campus, I stopped. I heard nothing but the usual sounds that come with night. Dampened, muffled sounds. I walked on. And I heard it. The sound of someone walking well behind me. I stopped again. Maybe it was Jarvis. Maybe it wasn't. There was one way to find out. Keep going. If it was anyone with no business with me, okay, he'd stop following. I cut to my left, away from the main walk and toward the shadowy bulk of the college buildings. I kept going until I reached the gymnasium building. I was leading my pigeon to me. But who was the pigeon? My toes were beginning to turn in, so I figured I was. Then the bulk of a big building popped up in front of me. I tried the door. It was open. I went in, closed the door behind me. There was no light at all. Only a funny sound that I couldn't identify. A peculiar humming, and there was a smell. Chlorine. Yeah, chlorine. Now I knew where I was, an indoor pool. The hum was the filtering machinery. I wanted to turn on the flashlight, but in a place like this, I couldn't give Jarvis the tip on where I was. I had to get out, so I felt my way carefully along the tile floor. I kept what I guessed was the middle of the walk around the pool, and then... was in with me. I stopped, but he didn't. Why? Why? I know you're in here. <laughs> this couldn't be better. You're a sap, White. Coming in here. <laughs> Don't be silly, White. You know that door leads to the filtering machinery? Come on, this way. It's the only way out, and I'll be waiting for you. Okay. It's all the same whether you come to me or I go to you. Stay where you are, Jarvis. Who's that? We met before. You're not white. No, I'm not. Diamond? Yeah. Not white, and you're not black. You're Jarvis. Surprise, Buster? <laughs> What's the difference? None, I guess. Where's the real black hole? Where you're gonna be, Diamond. Stay right there, Jarvis. Sure, and let you shoot off your mouth. All right, Diamond. It's all the same to me whether I get you first or white. I gotta do both. Now we'll see just how tough you are, Diamond. Ha, ha, ha! Well, the boy's got a gun. You missed, Diamond. And too bad the flash gave you away. Now I gotta do this fast. This is it, Diamond! Diamond! Diamond, put the wall! I 
can't swim. Uh, well, Buster, I got news for you. I'm not going to teach you. This won't take long. Just enough to get you a little water log. Hold your nose, Jarvis. It helps. Simon. Simon. Martin. Lights, Martin. Get them on. Yeah. I have to come. <coughs> I'll let you do it alone. I heard the shot and I... Where's Jarvis? Jarvis? No, I... I think we can take him out now. He's done. Here, grab him. Yeah. Is he dead? No. Here, give me a hand, Mr. Diamond. Wait. Hey, hey, I'll get my breath. You know, uh, Martin, Jarvis was a bad soldier, but in the Navy, he had just been plain lousy. We've got to pay you something. Okay, okay. Mail the recipe for your wife's corned beef to a gal named Helen, huh? But, Mr. Diamond... Don't forget I... it. Uh, Jarvis won't... I mean, he won't... Get... Oh, come back? Oh, no, no, no. The Army picked him up. They've got first crack at him. Then come the uh, McAllister authorities who'd like to talk with him about the murder of John Blackwell. So that's how he got Blackwell's papers. Sure, sure. Blackwell was alone in the world. He was going to come here to school, but Jarvis hitched a ride and... Well, once the guy kills... He'll do it again to beat the rap. And Blackwell and Jarvis were both from McAllister. Yeah, yeah. Jarvis figured this college would be a great hideout under a different name, papers all in order, but uh, <laughs> you saw him and he saw you, and that put a crimp in his plans. From there on, you you know the rest. Now, I guess... Oh, I'll get it. Be back in a minute. I'll send your clothes to you when I get back to the city, Martin. Uh, no hurry, Mr. Diamond. Oh, Mr. Diamond, the phone's for you. Me? Hmm. But no one knows I'm here but the McAllister Police Force, Levinson, Otis, Jarvis, Susie, the campus, and you. Well, he asked for you. Oh, thank you. Hello? Diamond? Uh, Levinson? Yeah. Well, what's on your mind? Are you all right? Never better. Why? Because we got the report on Jarvis. He's a bad boy. You watch yourself. Don't get caught alone with him. Oh, sure, sure, Walt. I'll be real careful. The only place I'll be seen with him is in a swimming pool. Huh? And I'll cut the wise crack. Wow! What's that? Did you say something? Uh, hold it a minute, Walt. Oh, Bill, shh, please. Sorry, Mr. Diamond. I guess the phone awakened him. Diamond. Diamond, what are you doing? You got asthma? Quiet, Walt. Uh, hold it. Uh, Nan, uh, Martin, uh, bring the baby here. But he's never done this at this time. Oh, never mind. Bring him here. Okay, you asked for it. Now, 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 baby, baby. Shh, shh. Stop calling me baby. It's twilight on the prairie, and the moon will soon be high. She'll be herding every star up in the sky. We'll lope along to dreamland, and we'll bid each care goodbye, while the wind blows through the sagebrush with a sigh. So hush, little darling. Little dear, go to sleep, little darling, I'm right here, let my shoulder be your pillow, you'll be safe as you can be, little darling, you mean all the world to me. We'll always be together, and I promise faithfully that your dreams will all come true. Just wait and see. So hush, little darling. Little dear, go to sleep, little darling. I'm right here. Hello? Hello. 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 Say, what's going on over there? Oh, now, hold it a second, Walt. I got somebody who wants to say hello to you. That's a good boy now. Now, say hello to the lieutenant. <laughs> oh, this. Get off the line. Walt. Yeah? Bye.
You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Paul Dubob, Sammy Hill, Jerry Hausner, Jane Webb, and Dave Ellis. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC? Phil Harris celebrates his birthday this evening by getting into just a little more trouble than usual on the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. Theater Guild on the Air presents Jane Wyman, Beatrice Pearson, and Mel Ferrer in the psychological melodrama The Willow and I. It's the best entertainment on the air, and it's yours for the listening today on NBC. Now stay tuned for James Melton and the Harvest of Stars on NBC. Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond, this is Walt. Where the devil are you? Where I started out to be, down on River Street, looking for well, the you guy... you stay right there and wait for me, but you might as well stop looking. Why stop looking? Take my word for it, he's not there. Well, if you're so smart, where is he? The city morgue. We fished him out of the river ten minutes ago. Here's another exciting case from the files of Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, first over the bars. That's nice. Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Busy? No, why? I'm lonesome. Can't you come over? Honey, I'd love to, but you can never tell when... So- Mr. Diamond. Oh, see what I mean? Oh, a customer. Well, let's see. What can I do for you? Uh, I want to hire you. Helen, the man wants to hire me. Oh, I'll call you back. Bye. Bye. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, uh... Uh, Wellington, Mr. Diamond. Hmm. Casper Wellington. Oh, well, pull up a couch and tell me the details, Mr. Wellington. I need a bodyguard, Mr. Diamond. Why? Oh, it's not for myself. It's for Timothy. Well, why does Timothy need a bodyguard? Someone's trying to kill him. Oh, you've been to the police? Oh, yes, yes. But they feel it's not quite important enough for them. You mean this Timothy's life is in danger and the police won't handle it? Yes. Isn't it ridiculous? I don't know. Has anybody tried to kill Timothy before? Well, no one has exactly tried to kill him, but I very definitely expect an attempt. Hmm. Well, now, look, uh, this uh, Timothy, is he a friend of yours? Oh, yes. A very good friend. So what makes you think that someone is going to try to kill him? Mr. Diamond, I came here to hire you to protect Timothy. I'm perfectly willing to pay you your fee, but for the moment, the rest of your questions must go unanswered. Well, uh, my fee's $100 a day in expenses, Mr. Wellington. Still perfectly willing to pay it? Here's the cash. Mm-hmm. And there'll be another 100 if you protect Timothy long enough for me to get him on a train tomorrow. Where's he going? Out of town, where he can be safe. What's Timothy's last name? That will also have to go unanswered. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. Supposing I do take the job, where do I meet this Timothy? How will I know him? If you take the job, he'll be in your office in a matter of minutes. Well, something sure doesn't ring up right, but the 200 fish and expenses, I'd play footsies with a cobra. Good. Now, I'm going down to the train station to pick up Timothy's ticket. When he arrives, I expect you to remain with him constantly. Until tomorrow? Oh, I got a small apartment. I hate the bundle. Don't let him out of your sight for a moment. I want him alive and well when he gets on that train in the morning. Does he play Pachisi? Well, I doubt it, but you never can tell. He might like it. Hmm, dandy. Have him at Grand Central at 8 o'clock. I'll meet you. Do you know of any way I could possibly learn to hate money? If I did, I would never have come to you. Uh, good day, Mr. Diamond. Oh. Hmm. Atlantic Bone and Fertilizer. Oh, that's a pit. Just wondering how a new business would work out? 
Now what's wrong? Uh, I have a very unhealthy feeling that I've just let myself in for something I won't like. Oh, the client? Well, kind of. I've got a guard, a friend of his. What's the matter with that? Oh, I'm not going all through that again. The client just came on like secret service. I got the name of the guy he wants guarded, and I know that someone's going to try and kill him. And that's it. Rick, you be careful. Honey, honey, the client shoved 200 bucks in my rural hot hand. Oh, good. What do you want me to do? I'm trying for capitalists this year. Didn't your client go to the police first? Sure. He went to the police with the... Hey, you. Me? What? Yeah, you. Rick, are you listening? Yeah, I'm listening. Put down the phone, friend. We want to talk to you. Well, if you're listening, why don't you answer my question? If your client went to the police... That's better. Well, now, I'm a sport... Especially when someone's got a gun pointed at me. Oh, the gun ain't gonna hurt you, chum, if you answer a couple of questions. Where's Casper Wellington? Who? You gonna be difficult? Look, you got a gun on me. Who wants to be difficult? You don't know Casper Wellington, friend? Uh, never heard of him. Well, you seen him come into the building. No, so you figured he came to see me. It's such a small building, only about a hundred offices. Oh, that's pretty funny. Glad you liked it. No, but we didn't. You're the only private detective in the building. We figure maybe Casper wanted to hire you. What would he want to hire me for? What did this guy do? How do you like that, George? Now he's a nosy comic. Mm. Durante gets away with it. Friend, I have just decided your humor bores me. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty bad, ain't it, Tony? Suppose we push his face around, huh? Maybe he don't feel like no more Joe. Oh, now, wait a minute. I don't know anything about this Casper or whatever his name is. What good is it going to do to work me over? Well, now, you see, Tony and me got real nasty dispositions. We've been crossed, and then you make with the jokes. We don't like being the only ones unhappy, so we think maybe you ought to join. Now, 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 look. Now, hold it a second, George. What for? It's a setup. Oh, wait. We mess him up, the law comes. We got to find cast, but we ain't got no time to play patty cake with the cops. Uh, I just want to cross the mouth. Forget it. Look, friend, you sure Casper Wellington didn't come in here? I couldn't be more positive. Okay. Put down the rod, George. Yeah. That don't look so unhappy. Maybe the shamus is lying. We catch him telling a fib. Just think of the fun you can have later on, huh? Come on. We'll leave him? Yeah. So long, friend. And uh, for your sake, I hope you've been leveling. Yeah. See you around. Yeah, bye. Hmm. There's a fool's fancy shop for you, Palmer. Now, you listen to me, Richard Diamond. The next time you hang up on me, but I'll how... never speak to you again. But, but, but you but... better have a pretty good excuse for doing it this time. But ha... You know I take a lot of things from you, Rick, but never, never once have you hung up on me. Helen, please. And I think it was rude and inconsiderate. Helen. And I want to know right now, this minute, just what kind of a poor, lame brain excuse you're going to come up with. Helen! Well? No. Look, baby, I don't know what's going on. This is like doing business in a roundhouse. The only reason I hung up on you was because two guys stole in here and shoved guns in my face. Rick! And they were looking for the guy who came in earlier and hired me to look after someone named Timothy that I haven't even seen yet. It sounds awfully confusing. It is. Oh, hold the phone. Here's somebody else. Come in with your hands up. You Richard Diamond? Yep. You got a crate here addressed to you. Oh, well, that figures. Bring it in. Helen. Yes? You sent me maybe a present? No. You want me to? Yeah, but someone's beaten you to it. Where do you want it? Good grief. Put it down right there. What's the matter? The present. The biggest crate you ever saw. A crate? What's in it? How do I know? Well, open it. Okay, Mr. Diamond. Stand right here. Yeah. There you are. I hope you still be very happy. Hmm. Helen. Yes? Hold the phone. I'm going to open this thing. All right. Oh, no. Oh, get away. Get away. Now, get on. Get on. Don't come up here. Don't, don't, don't. Oh, Helen. Rick, what in the world's the matter? Helen, if this is your idea of a joke... What, can't you hear it? Well, I heard something, but I thought you must have eaten your lunch too fast. Well, I'm standing on my desk trying to fight off a monster. What? Call up Charles Adams right away. A monster? Yes. 
I'd swear it was a seal, but I know, my friends, better than that. This thing has got to be poisonous. A seal? Yes, a seal. Hey, he's not so bad. He's applauding. <laughs> you must have liked that remark about Adams. Now you stop it. Do you expect me to believe all this? Uh, she doubts you, fella. Say a few words. Rick, who in the world would send you a seal? I don't even need the look. This has got to be Timothy. Oh, it is Timothy. When he heard his name, he made like a curtain call. Sounds like one Richard Diamond. Hey, that's pretty... nothing. I'll call you back. Where are you going? I'm going to take Timothy right back to Mr. Casper Wellington and tell him that... Yes? Oh, for the love of... I don't know where to find Mr. Casper Wellington. Well, there it was. It was pretty silly. The smart, shrewd, level-headed Richard Diamond, for the sake of a couple of hundred fast bucks winds up playing nursemaid and companion to a honking seal. Just to make sure it was, Timothy, I took a look at the crate, and there on top was a small printed card. It read, This is Timothy. If you want him to do something, throw him a fish. Herring. Signed, Casper Wellington. Well, that tore it. My temper was already pushing my hair up to attention, so I went out to the nearest delicatessen and came back with a bag of fish. With this, I lured Timothy out of the building and down in the street. I had to find Casper Wellington, so 60 pedestrians and one unhappy cabbie later, Timothy and I stole casually into the 5th Precinct Police Station. Well, well, hello, Sergeant Otis. Oh, oh, how are you, Shamus? Huh? How what? What'd you just say? I said, hello, Sergeant Otis. No, after that. Yeah, 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 that was it. Something wrong, Sergeant? Yep! Hello, this. Otis, say hello to Timothy. Timothy, this is Sergeant Otis. Lieutenant! Lieutenant! Go on over and kiss the Sergeant Timothy. Go on. Oh, no, no, no. Get him away from me. Get him away. Oh, Otis, he's not so bad. Lieutenant! Help! Now, Otis, come down off that desk. You look sillier than I did. He's trying to eat me. Oh, be quiet. You too, Timothy. You'll wake up the lieutenant. Here's a fish. Throw it to Timothy. Enough for you, Diamond. You'll probably take my arm along with it. Get away, get away. Help! What the devil is going on out here? Otis, what are you doing up there? Hey, hello, Walt. What are you doing to my sergeant? And you shut up, Otis. That wasn't me. What do you mean it wasn't you? Of course it was you. Walt, meet Timothy. How do you... I'd hate to think what would happen if someone wandered in here with a walrus. Come on, Timothy, let's go see the brave old head of homicide. Yeah, 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 get him out of here. Oh, relax, Otis. Timothy's as scared as you are. Oh, yeah? What makes you say that? He's probably thinking there's more like you. That would be a horrible shock to anyone, even a seal. Oh. Come on, Timothy. Hey, you get that thing out of here right now, Diamond. Everybody's standing on something. You'd think it was a steam bath. Up till now, I've had two reported homicides and a couple of fat robberies. And if you think you're going to wander in here with that thing and confuse the whole department, you're mistaken. Now get it out of here. Oh. Walt, it's only a seal. Have a fish. I'm not hungry. No, no, Walt. It's for Timothy. Feed it to him. He'll he'll love you. Yeah? Do you think so? Sure, sure, Walt. Go ahead. Try it. Okay. Here, Timothy. Hey, he's applauding. Sure, he's a nice little fella. Now, climb down and help me. Uh, Give me another fish. Oh, won't come down without it, huh? Okay, Walt. Speak. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I want to feed it to Timothy. He likes me. See? Oh, lovely. Why don't you two get engaged? Oh. Well, after everybody got used to him, Timothy made the rounds of the whole department with the commissioner being the only exception, of course. I told Walt the story about Casper Wellington and the two Gonniffs who had come into my office looking for him. So Walt put Otis to work checking on the whereabouts of my missing client. Along about three in the afternoon, Otis pounced in with some news. Uh, hey, Diamond. You find something? Oh, hi, Timothy. Yeah. Uh, say, I check with the Humane Society, and they report some guy who lives down by the docks. The name's Wellington, all right. He's been turned in a couple of times because he raises seals, and they make a lot of noise. Oh, uh, and Lieutenant, we just got a report on another homicide. Well... Thanks, Sporty. You tell the lieutenant all about it, Otis. I'm going after Casper Wellington. What's the address? Uh, here it is. 918 River Street. Come on, Tim. <coughs> Goodbye, Timothy. Otis. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. What was I saying? Homicide, remember? 
Just a little old homicide. I left Walton Otis climbing over the furniture and headed for the address of Casper Wellington. Timothy and I grabbed the first cabbie who didn't believe what he was seeing, and 20 minutes later, we pulled up in front of a building on River Street. Thanks, cabbie. Yeah, sure. Thank the man, Timothy. Uh, mister? Yeah? I didn't ask you nothing when you got in the cab because I just didn't believe it. Is that a seal you got with you? You're expecting maybe a raccoon? Do you always take him around with you like that? Sure, we're brothers. Right by the house sometime for dinner when Mom isn't taking a swim. Hmm. She's not a very good driver, is he, Timothy? <laughs> you know it. Come on, you're going home. Hold it right here, friend. Hmm? You hide him. This is a gun in your back. Oh. Yeah. Oh. You lied to me, friend. I'll go stand in the corner. Nah, don't move. Okay. George, grab the seal. Oh, yeah. now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you can't do that. I want to bet. Come here, you. Take your hands off that seal. Shut your mouth, friend. <clears throat> Next time you don't get it across the neck, I'll give you the rod on the skull. Okay, friend. I got him. All right, get him in a car. And you, stay put. One bad move, you're going to get shot up very bad. Come on, George, you got that thing in the car? Yeah, you saying let's get out of here. All right, friend. Yeah. You, uh... See this? I got pointed at you. I see. Good. Forget about today, you won't see it again. Open that big yap of yours and it goes boom. Now turn around, because when we leave, I don't want you looking back for no license number. Well, I stood there while they drove off with poor little Timothy. Then I made a quick dash across the street and to a store with a phone booth. Seconds later, I was hearing one of the most beautiful sounds in the world. Diamond, this is Walt. Where the devil are you? Where I started out to be, down on River Street, looking for my client. Well, you stay right there and wait for me, but you might as well stop looking. Well, why stop looking? His house is just down at the end of the block. Well, take my word for it, he isn't there. Well, if you're so smart, where is he? The city morgue. We fished him out of the river ten minutes ago. What? He was suffering from a hole in his chest. Dead before he was tossed in. Oh. Walt, Walt, remember those two guys who came into my office earlier? Yeah? Well, they just put the snatch on Timothy and belted me across the neck for my trouble. Swipe the seal? Yeah, so get on here. I'll meet you at Casper Wellington's house. Anybody in the house, Rick? No. Hmm. Well, no answer. Well, let's case the place. I've got a skeleton key. To Alt. To Alt. It's open. See? Now, if you'll notice as I walk in, at no time do my feet leave my legs. Very funny. Whew. Yeah, smells like somebody's been cooking up a fish stew. Crummy joint. Ooh, get a load of that kitchen. What a mess. Oh, uh, weren't cooking fish, Wall, just cleaning it. There's still a mess of them left in the sink. Well, Casper Ray seals. Where are the rest of them? Wall. Yeah? Come here. What is it? Get a look at this backyard. Holy cow bunch of dead seals. Who in the world would do anything like that? Maybe your uh, two friends. Hey, what's this? What's what? This bag on the floor, leather bag. What's in it? Ah, nothing. Wait a minute. There's some kind of dust at the bottom. I'll save it. We'll have it analyzed when we get down to the station. We've got to check up on those two guys who kidnapped Timothy. This is the craziest case. I got a hunch. Sure, it's crazy, but if I'm right, it's also pretty smart. Let's go to the station. <laughs> Hey, Lieutenant. Yeah, Otis? Uh, we just got something else on that Casper Wellington guy. Oh? What did he steal? Hey, how'd you know? Just a guess. Well, what is it, Hammerhead? Well, uh, it uh, seems this Wellington guy works at, uh, I mean, used to work for David and Sons. David and Sons? Uh, diamond importers. Oh, that ties it. Would somebody mind telling me what the devil this is all about? And Rick, you stay out of it. Now, Otis, what about Wellington? Wellington? Oh, he ran off with a load of diamonds. Yeah, 50,000 bucks worth. Hey, but you don't... Rick, will you please, for the sake of my sour stomach, tell me exactly what it is you know? I'd be glad to, Lieutenant. It's very simple. Wellington comes to me and asks me to guard Timothy. Two guys kidnap Timothy. That we heard. Then we find a bunch of dead seals in Wellington's backyard and the remains of a pile of clean fish. So? So, the two guys who kidnapped Timothy were obviously after something, and the seal was part of it. Hey, maybe Timothy wasn't the seal after all. Now, what would he be, Otis? Well, if those guys wanted him that bad... 
Maybe he was a mink. Oh. Oh, that bag you picked up, Walt. Have that powder in the bottom analyzed. I'll lay six to an even that it's diamond dust. Well, you think... Yeah, yeah. I think Timothy's got a stomach full of diamonds. What? I think Casper was mixed up with the two guys who grabbed the seal, but in some way crossed them. Why? He had to hide the loot, so he stuck it in some fish and fed it to Timothy. Then he left Timothy with me for protection until he could get him shipped out on the train. And in the meantime, the two guys who found Casper killed him and went back to his house to find the loot. Mm -hmm. They figured out the fish like you did and killed the seals in the backyard trying to find the stuff. You, my friend, went a herring. Otis, have the powder in the bottom of this bag analyzed. Put out a 108 on Timothy. Yes, sir. Diamond here will give you the description of the guys who grabbed him. We'll never find him that way. Uh, You got a better idea? Maybe, yeah. Look, you said those two guys killed Casper and then went right over to the house to look for the missing diamonds. Yeah. All right, they knew where to look, but they didn't find anything. So they waited for me and Timothy. So? So Casper Wellington probably told them all about it before they killed him, trying to save his own life. All right, I'll buy that. So what? So by now they must know how hot those diamonds are. They're certainly not going to try to get rid of them here in town. And then they leave town. Yeah. And with that much loot, it would be a little risky if they tried by car. All right, all right. How do they do it? The same way Casper thought of. Ship Timothy out on a train. Wait a minute, Rick. Otis. Yeah? Put in a call to all units. Tell them to cover the airports, train, and bus stations. Be on the lookout for a seal that's about to be shipped. Come on, Walt. Where to? Well, as long as Casper Wellington already made the arrangements by train, let's get on to Grand Central. Maybe our two seal nappers will keep the reservation. Well, Walt and I piled in the squad car again, and 20 minutes later, we were standing in the middle of Grand Central Station with a bag of fish and a weather eye out for the missing seal and his two abductors. Now, where do we start? Well, Walt, why don't you just go ask information? Just say, I'm looking for two men and a seal. The seal is hiding $50,000 worth of diamonds. Now, you stop that. This was plenty silly before a jewel robbery and a homicide get into the picture, but now it's gotten ridiculous. Well, if I was a seal, where would I go? They have to crate him, the shipping department. And so, with their trusty bag of fish, the two brave detectives oh, walked non Shut up and let's go. Oh, no, come on, let's go get something. Well, smile, Walt. This kind of case doesn't happen but once every 10,000 years. Think of your report to the commissioner. If you don't stop kidding with me, so help me hey. out. Hey, Walt. Oh, well, now what? Look, those two guys. Where? Going down the ramp. Oh, they got a big box. That's it. Let's take them. Well, you said they got guns. They were pointing things at shot bullets. Could be guns. Take it easy. They're going up to that counter. Yeah. Hold it. Hold it here. No sense in starting a shooting match. Too many people. Well, what do we do? Maybe the seal's not in the box. And if I pick them up without the loot, we may never find it. I got an idea. Go ahead, genius. Timothy likes fish, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. He likes well, fish. take this bag. They know me, so you walk down there and move in close to the box. Timothy's bound to get a whiff, and if I know Timothy, he'll raise a few flippers. You want me to... You want to get those diamonds, don't you? Oh, give me the bag. Don't snap. People will just think you ran out of cologne. I'll get going. Yeah. Uh, pardon me, but I'd like to find out about sending something. Oh, yeah? Well, what's the idea, Buster? We was here first. Shut up, stupid. You boys must be really sending something big. You're too nosy. I told you to shut up. Yeah, yeah, some, uh, some furs. Oh, live ones? Hey, Tiny, what's with the seal? Will you shut up? What? I hate to mention it, but your furs are throwing a fit. Uh, uh, he's busting all. Okay, boys, that's all I wanted to know. Let's take a seal. He's going after the sack. This guy lays down. It's a sack full of fish. Hey, what's the idea? Hello, stay right there. Hey, Rick. Cop, who are you? All first? right, bud, drop it. Huh? I said drop it. <laughs> okay, okay. You ain't taking me. Look out, Rick, this guy's got a gun. <laughs> Let go. Let go of my hand. Will you get the seal off? He's chewing my hand off. And drop the gun. All right, all right. Get him off. Come on. Get him off. <laughs> oh, how do you like that? Oh. Timothy grabbed this gun up by the gun hand and made him drop it. I'll be uh, done. Crazy seal nearly killed me. You and your bright idea. Ship the seal, you say. Ah, okay, boys. Here's a bracelet for you. Let's go outside. Uh, Walt, Walt, wait a minute. We got to get the jewels. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, I'll take care of these two guys, and I'll take Timothy to a good veterinary. Okay. Uh, uh, Walt. Yeah? If it means surgery, keep in touch. Sure. Bye, Timothy. Don't be unhappy. Oh, how can I help it, honey? I, he's been in surgery for nearly an hour. Oh, but he'll be all right. They got a good vet. Oh, I hope so. I was getting attached to that seal. Oh, I got it. Yeah? Rick? Yeah, Walt. Yeah. 
How's Timothy? He had the diamonds in him, all right. Oh, but how is he? Well... Uh, go ahead, Walt. You can tell me. I, I, I can stand it. He's very weak. The doctor says he thinks he doesn't want to live. No will. Oh, well, what's the matter? He was such a happy seal. I think he misses you, Rick. Every time someone mentions your name, he kind of honks and raises a weak flipper. I better come right down. He's sinking fast. Oh, you think maybe if he heard my voice... Uh, uh, can you get a phone near him? Yeah, yeah, wait a minute. Okay, I got it next to his ear. Say something. Hello, Timothy. Oh, Walt. Yeah? Walt, ask him if he's seen a picture called Mrs. Mike. He says he saw it. Didn't like the leading man. Oh. Loved Evelyn Keys. Oh. Ask him if he liked the music. Yeah, he liked that. Well, put the receiver next to his ear and I'll sing him the theme song. Well, go ahead and try. Anything in case of an emergency. If her name is Kathy, she's mine alone. When I walk with Kathy, proud am I. She's the girl I'll marry, and cross the threshold I'll carry. And I love but Kathy till I die. She's the only angel I've ever known. She's a maid no man is worthy of. Although girls are many compared to her, there isn't any. Only Kathy. better? Listen. Good old Timothy, that a boy. I guess the singing did it. What do you mean you guess? When I sang with the Peter Pan Five, we played two weeks at the Carl Gables Hotel in Florida. So what? So what? I'll have you know five minutes after I opened my mouth, every seal in the Biscayne Keys came in and sat ringside. That sounds like a pretty good act. Well, what'd you give it up for? Well, I got a sore throat one night and the place was up to its ears in alligators. Rick. Yes, Wall? Bye. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Faye Baker, Junius Matthews, Billy Bletcher, Tony Barrett, and Larry Dodkin. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Isn't that right, Dick? Yeah, 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 that's right, Eddie. Oh, by the way, Ed Begley, who plays Lieutenant Levinson on our show, would like to say a few words to his old friends in Hartford, Connecticut. Well, I just want to say, on behalf of all of us here on Richard Diamond, congratulations to radio station WTIC in Hartford, Connecticut, where I got my start in radio, and which this week celebrates its 25th anniversary of service to the people of southern New England. Thank you, Ed Begley. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> Governing a country is a pretty hard-headed business, and we don't usually think of our government as a dealer in dreams. But in one respect, it is, because it's a dealer in savings bonds. Your particular dream for the future can come true through the judicious purchase of United States savings bonds today. As for buying United States savings bonds, the process is simplicity itself. 
If you're employed by others, use the payroll savings plan where you work. Your employer will set aside a specific sum from each paycheck for the purchase of bonds. If you're self-employed, use the bond-a-month plan where you bank. Either way, you'll be saving with regularity, with certainty, and with profit through the purchase of United States savings bonds. What's on NBC today? You'll hear Charles Boyer and Dorothy McGuire today on Theater Guild on the Air in Autumn Crocus. And there's the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show to add to your Sunday listening pleasure. Be sure to hear Charles Boyer and Dorothy McGuire on Theater Guild on the Air and the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show today on NBC. NBC.